and Muzz got mad at me, the coach said, he goes, Jesus Christ, why don't you just wear two nines? And I went, okay. Please, please, please never do that. Yep. So. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 464 of Spit and Chicklets, presented by Pink Whitney from our friends at New Amsterdam Vodka. Here in the Barstool Sports Podcast family, what is up, gang? October is here, which means the NHL is back. It opens one week from tonight. We cannot wait, but we do have some huge news over in Sweden. Congratulations to Mr. and Mrs. Murley on the birth of Ted Thomas Murley. He got his first shift on September 24th at 5.51. I'm sorry, 5.41 a.m. Merles, congrats, buddy. Oh, thank you, boys. Thank you. Eddie Thomas. I I didn't do much. I was basically a water boy in (laughs) there. A couple of clicks for my wife. Like you talked about before, Witt. It's the craziest thing ever. They go through that. It was a battle. We were actually on our way up to the Tim Ramoto game. And I had my whole spiel ready, boots on the ground, EBR, home team, <laughs> over. And she started getting a lot of kicks. And we said, all right, we're going to shoot in, and they're going to just check on her. And we got in there. They're like, oh, let's, we'll wait 40 more minutes and see. So I'm, I'm holding on. Like, we're going to get to the game. We're going to get to the game. <laughs> nope. They put on the, the sound things, 40 more minutes. I gave away the tickets. Didn't make the game. So this was 12 hours later. The big guy finally popped out. She's got an epidural. Merle's is outside the hospital trying to scalp his tickets, make a couple extra bucks. <laughs> Run, running a pool with the orderlies for what time he's going to come out. Yeah, and it's it's like it's like so cliche to say, like, you just want a happy kid. You don't care about the sex. Yeah. Like, it, it got to that point when it was that long in there. It was having trouble coming out. There was there. It was like, oh, my God. I'm like, I just wanted to be healthy. And um, all of a sudden I came out. I see. I think I see a pair of nuts on it. But I'm not sure because it's like there's everything going on. The cords, there's your placentas around. It's oh, just a mess. It's just like, and, get it. And uh, they take them. They put them on my wife. And she's like, I think I feel I feel some balls. And I'm like, oh, maybe, maybe. Next thing you know, they raised them up. And it was a boy, which was really cool. And uh, so we got a boy and a girl now. That's awesome. So you're, are you guys done, you think, Merles? I, <laughs> we were you're talking so forever. Done, we, were done, we were done, but all of a sudden you get that little guy in your hands. And it's like, oh, should we get another one? And I'm like, <laughs> Let's wait. It's only been a week. Let's pump the brakes here. Did, but did did you lock eyes or did you have to watch it come out? Like what was the how did it all work out inside so, the so room? Actually, this is funny. I almost I can't believe I forgot to tell this. So they're talking all Swedish in there, and it's going. It's chaotic, and it it starts with just the two barn morskas, like the 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 what do you call them in midwives? The US? Midwives, yeah. So barn morska is child mother, and the two are helping her. Next, you know, there's the doctors in there. Then there's another born Marska. Then there's another doctor. There's five people in there all going, talking Swedish, blah, blah, blah. And I don't know what's going on. And I see the head pop out. Oh. And I'm like, go, push, push, push. <laughs> and she's like, shut up. They didn't tell me to say that. Or they didn't, like, they wanted, they were t- taking a break. But I'm like, I saw the head. You got to get them out. And, uh, finish, so it, finish it. Finish it. I'm like, go, go, go. She's like, shut up. I can you still idiot. make the third in Timra. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and last push, he came out, and I, I looked a little more south than I should have, but it was worth it, and it, it was amazing. He's awesome. Mom's doing well. We're sleeping decently. I won't be as sharp as I normally am. A little less sleep, a lot less work getting done around here on the hockey front, but uh, great times here. So there's a lot of history with the name Thomas in your family. I asked. I should have waited to ask. Uh, on the podcast, but they're like pretty much everyone in your family has a Thomas in their name, whether it's first or middle. Yeah. So, uh, my father's obviously Thomas. Funny thing is my mom's dad's name is Thomas and she had a brother, Thomas. So he had <laughs> it's a like son. business sister with Paul. Oh, yes. come on. Fuck <laughs> off. <laughs> oh, my uncle get named his, the baby. Yeah, yeah. So then my uncle made it Thomas Connell. So I have a cousin, Thomas, my brother's Thomas. My middle name is Thomas. My nephew's middle name is Thomas. So now we have another Thomas, a lot of Thomas is going around and, uh, Made me think of a player in Bill Thomas I played with, you know, in uh, yeah, Billy. So, so you can have the first, middle, and last name. Hey, Merle, will he go by Ted or Teddy? I, yeah, I've been I've been calling him Teddy the whole time, and she's like, "It's Ted, it's Ted." But I, I like Teddy. I love I'm thinking Teddy. I'm thinking if he gets some size in him, we can call him Bear. You know, it'd be a great nickname if he's on the ice, if he's playing hockey, Bear. So we'll he's see. He's got your lower half, Mer. Besides, your I hog. know you got like a dumper, dumper on quads. You. Yeah, you're <laughs> thick, man. You're like that. You got the Kylie Jenner special going. 
You getting injections in that hoop of yours? <laughs> I'm trying to get it reduced now. I keep stepping on the scale and it's going the wrong way. Well, yeah, that's Send what it to your me. hammy keeps popping every time you fucking yeah. jack up the treadmill. That's well, you, you just... You just mentioned placenta, and this guy's uh, face lit up like a Christmas tree. Paul Biz Nasty Biz What's Nepic, up, placenta boys? fin. What's going on, buddy? Haven't talked to you in a bit on the oh, show. Oh, just so fired up for Chicklets Cup. Like we oh. we have we have Terry Ryan, El Capitan of the Big Deal Selects coming on a little later. What a riot! I think we got seventy five minutes with him. Oh my God, he is just oh. he he is one of a kind. Let's just put it that way. Uh, looking forward to you guys hearing that. But uh, guys, nothing much here. Staying disciplined. Eyes on the prize, uh, trying to stay focused to bring home my first Chicklets Cup. And of mm-hmm. course, this week, who ends up on NHL Network? Nose face oh. fucking killer winning some other He was ball on hockey. NHL Network? Wow. Oh, you think he wasn't? Chirping us and the big deal selects, telling tell him we're going to take him, telling us we're going to, he's going to take us down. What so, producer uh, there fucking allowed that mug on TV? Oh, for yeah, NHL he's Network. as ugly as ever. He gets ugly by the day, that guy. Oh, he's disgusting. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> really nothing much that exciting here. Just kind of waiting and, and uh, staying disciplined in bed. at like last night I was in bed at like 930 wet lights out, woke up today at eight, almost fucking 12 hours sleep. Just f- chugging along here, buddy. How along. were you so tired? Were you just like, it was just your body talking to you? Buddy, I'm we- doing fucking two-a-day workouts over the weekend, doing weight sessions, then doing like two-hour hikes and stuff, doing sprints at the at the f- soccer fields. I've actually been working out with that uh, Jordan Smaltz, uh, Nick Schmaltz of the Arizona Coyotes brother. I actually, uh, one thing I did this weekend is we went and watched the Canelo fight. It wasn't much of a fight. He had some guy, that Cholo guy, who jumped up a couple weight classes, and it wasn't much. But that 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 Canelo's a G man. His post his post fight press conference was awesome. So he he's always a riot to watch. I don't know if his next fight's going to be against the guy he had his second loss to. I don't know if he's going to end up fighting him again. I try to follow as much boxing as I can, but it seems to be a bit of a dying sport. Other than like him and, and Tyson Fury seem to be the guys on top. I feel like UFC's really taken over. Biz, what a uh, what a trailer for the last dance for you by Pasha oh, as yeah, well. Buddy. That got me fired a little more oh, fired baby. up. For Chick, let's go. Are you going to be on the dance. bench with us? Fuck yeah, dude! I'm co- I'm I, I'm I don't want to call myself coach, but I I open the door and I really fire the guys up. And maybe maybe if you win it, I'm like an assistant coach, like I'd get a ring. But I don't want to say I'm head coach because it's definitely a team coached by the players itself, right? There, you guys don't need a head coach. You just need a verbal support. Guy. We do have a head coach, yeah. Terry Ryan Senior. That's okay, why well, he comes. That's why he gets the drinking budget. He barely talk most of the tournament, so I can help him coach. Let's go with he that. He tells the same stories over and over to motivate us. Uh, a couple actually other things I had written down last week. I think was the first time that we launched our graphics on our YouTube channel throughout the podcast, so people can follow along. It makes it a lot easier. Uh, that was Sean Apuzo's idea, and uh, he's been handling all that. So it's a big hit. A lot of comments in the in the chat after the podcast was released. So shout out to him and really all our guys behind the scenes who make this thing work. And uh, they'll be on the boots on the ground at uh, Chicklets Cup, making sure they capture all the content, all the games, and we're going to be rolling out all those vlogs on our Spit and Chicklets YouTube channel. The one other thing I'll say before I hand it over, RA, I see some tweets and in, in, in Instagram posts sometimes. People not familiar with what exactly is going on with the itinerary of Chicklets Cup. Uh, we're going to we're gonna be talking about all things Chicklets Cup after the Terry Ryan interview, so make sure you listen at- intentively, and we're going to talk about the whole timeline in which you can come to that free concert come Saturday night. All the players involved, we're going to be going and getting free tickets if you are a member of the tournament, going to the Buffalo Sabres-Pittsburgh Penguins game on Friday. So listen up for the Thursday, Friday, and Saturday itinerary. That's coming right after the Terry Ryan interview, 75 minutes with TR. It's going to be a blast. Well said, Biz. And as always, make sure you're following us on Twitter, Instagram. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss any of our shenanigans. Like I said, Sean's doing an awesome job lately. Also, this guy does a great job, too. Mikey Granelli, our producer. What have you been up to, buddy? Uh, Nothing. Actually, nothing at all. I have been alcohol-free for four weeks. I haven't left my couch in three weeks. So I couldn't be more excited to see Chicklets Nation, to watch old Busy Boy bring home his first Chicklets Cup title. But we do have a little update on our front from the Chicklets Cup. There won't be a Barstool team this year. Uh, Unfortunately, we couldn't get all the guys together. So no Barstool team at the Chicklets Cup. But uh, Merles, Colby, and myself will be auctioned off at that Thursday night party to play on anyone's team. And that money will then be donated to charity. So it's actually better. You'll have the chance to play with the Game Notes guys. It could be pretty fun. So very excited to get to Chicklets Cup and uh, play with some of Chicklets Nation. 
The charity I'm surprised is since you're Thomas such a Portnoy. Morley charity. I'm surprised since you're such a Portnoy bag licker. You didn't mention the 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 most expensive sale in in Massachusetts history. Forty two million dollars for the house that he purchased. Now you got underground a, tunnels with underground tunnels. So apparently he wasn't aware of of the underground tunnel before he purchased it, which is kind of bizarre. Wouldn't you <laughs> go walk the property before you're about to drop forty two sheets on something? How are you not aware of a tunnel that connects one of your houses to the other on your estate that you spent forty two million dollars on? That makes absolutely no sense. But the most expensive house ever sold in the state. Is, is him or bought is yeah. him i mean Hilarious. jesus christ you don't think he you don't, you don't think he wanted people to know that i think he oh, had I'm every sure. single person at barstool write a blog about it <laughs> they, they some of those some of those staff members are such bag lickers when it comes to portnoy it's like almost embarrassing yeah it's like buddy you, you got the job you, you're all set you don't have to worry about it anymore that's actually <laughs> the second mo most impressive uh, uh real estate news that last week uh the first one being that sphere have you guys oh. seen the videos coming out of Vegas of that concert that you wow. you two I think they have 25 straight shows there to open it up. Residency, it's one yeah. of the more uh, th th we were there actually during uh, Stanley Cup finals and Hank went on a tour of it before it had opened up and he goes buddy this thing's going to be fucking like this thing's going to make waves and I was like ah, I don't know if I'd want to like go to a concert and be like looking around the whole dome the entire time but after seeing the clips come out of that that is one of the most fascinating things ever built. I think they spent like like a three billion, billion and a half. How much? It was like three billion dollars. James Dolan, the the owner of the Knicks, my MSG three? and the Rangers. Yeah, he it was supposed Holy to be two shit. two and change, and you know, cost overruns, whatever. It cost over three billion dollars to put together. And, I mean, I know that guy's been knocked for a lot of things, but it was actually his idea. He was thinking of a a new way to present the concert, whatever. And yeah, you mentioned you two. They're doing a residency there because they can't have like a band come in and do one or two shows because the setup, the video, it's so much work that they're only going to be doing like residencies there. So like bands that come in, they're going to do you know several shows like you two's doing. And I don't know if you saw the video. PK, I saw the band. video of the numbers, yeah. and then like the the it's almost like the top. It looks like it's coming down and kind of collapsing on you that would definitely freak you out a little bit maybe a, a solid place to um have some uh, ra's mushrooms before you Mim go oh show. yeah right but, but the one the, the, the outdoor off the balcony. version of it the the scene of where you're in the mountains and the clouds that was i mean even watching it on twitter it looked insane so i can't even imagine being there i love you too i would i would i mean I, that's oh, yeah. got to be big dough to go see a show there right now yeah, Those I think the minute be expensive. At least I think it was like five hundred bucks minute minimum to get in because uh, PK was That's there with it. our buddy Chris O'Sullivan there too, and uh, Trunk Finn, our, our business uh, buddy. We haven't known out for a bit. He did a nice little uh, tweet thread about the whole story, history of the place. But we've gone from Sweden to the Southwest to New Jersey, back over the ocean. To the Ryan Whit Dog, Buongiorno, Whitney. How's Italy, <laughs> Ireland, all those places treating you, pal? Oh, guys, what what did I leave? What a what a nine days I've been on. Just an incredible trip to Ireland. We had sixteen guys, like I mentioned, and the captain of Team County Down. Yours truly. Obviously, we got it done. We we took it home, boys. We we got a big W, and it was a great time. I mean. We landed. We played Royal Dublin right when we landed. We flew overnight. Um, we then drove up to Northern Ireland uh, where we played Port Rush, just this beautiful golf course. And I will say, like, the bus rides are kind of hard, right? Like, I can't even imagine the bus drivers. They're driving. Well, it's normal for them. But left side of the road, the roads are tight over there. Merles, you mentioned that Like to West me. Coast Wagon Tour? <laughs> oh, dude. <laughs> Nothing was that bad. Along, Thanks, Along Brett. the Pacific that, Coast. <laughs> <laughs> no, but my, my boy Ned was, oh, he was farting the whole way. The Guinnesses were just <laughs> killing us, dude. I got a picture. Gonna, like, I'm telling you, <laughs> Keith Yando and I were sitting next to him, and Ned is just dying laughing at us. It was, it was something, oh, oh, it was amazing. But So we played Port Rush. Um, then we played Port Stewart the next day. We played 36 there the next day. And then we played this place, Castle Rock. So the wind, we got lucky with weather. Um, just It was blowing 25 to 30 miles an hour every day. That so, sucks. Dude, it, it, I actually played. I, I shot 75 at Port Rush in 25 mile an hour winds. It was probably the best round of my life. But if you hit one offline with any spin, dude, the ball, you would watch this thing go, I'm not kidding, 200 yards right to the gorse. But we ended up playing Castle Rock, which was a cool course. Dude, it was blowing 30 to, I'm, I, I'm not joking, 50 mile an hour gusts. And it was pouring. 
the entire time. And we just had to play. Like, what else are you going to do? Guys are like, let's just go to Belfast and sit at a bar all day. I'm like, that's not a good idea with this crew. We don't need that. We got to just play golf, whatever, deal with it. Nettie would have to I, be wearing a diaper at that point. I was in Yanza's. I was in Keith's group. I had never <laughs> seen a more miserable human in my life. He was standing there like this. You know the picture of P Patrick Cantlay and um, Xander Shoffley from the Ryder Cup when they just looked so miserable that kind of went viral? That was Keith. Keith said that was me. That Patrick Cantlay. Not more me. miserable than Portnoy during our sandbagger. No, way more miserable. What, dude? We're standing on like Keith we're standing really on miserable. the tent tee, and Keith is dead silent. And he just looks at me. He goes, "I got way too many shekels in the fucking bank to be doing this right now." He's <laughs> disgusted. And we're walking up, and then Ned sees him. He's like, "Give me a hug, Keith." He goes, "Get away from me." It was he was just. I mean, I didn't blame him. It was the worst weather I've ever golfed in in my life. But in the end, I mean, I we had basically had to throw away all our clothes. Um, but a fabulous trip. Royal County Downs, like I think it's like the number one course you can play in the world. It, it's it's beautiful and amazing. So it was a hell of a trip with great guys. We had two nights in Dublin. Dublin's a cool city. I'd never been. I'll say this though. The food in Ireland it's is awful. the worst goddamn it's food you could ever awful. imagine. When I played it in is. Cardiff, it's all it's all like meat. The meat's okay because a lot of it's grass fed, but everything comes with fries. It's fries, it's it's well, no, it's yeah, bacon, French fries, bacon. other potatoes. I had I didn't have a, a a vegetable. I still haven't really had a vegetable because now I'm in Italy crushing pasta. I I it is the worst food ever. The people are so nice and friendly. Worst food, need, worst teeth. Oh, teeth are brutes. Uh, <laughs> Guinness Guinnesses are better over there. I don't like Guinnesses at home. The Guinnesses over there are pretty solid. Although, like I mentioned with Ned, they oh, yeah. just crush your dumper. I You're mean, there's absolutely out of your asshole the rest uh, of the trip. It's it's it's. I didn't know though that Guinnesses are like the best beer for you, the lowest yeah. calorie. They have I, a lot I, of I iron in them. I was shocked by that. Shocked. Um, so I had two great nights in Dublin, and then I flew over to Rome. This city is. One of the dirtiest cities I've ever been in. I, that, now that's a dog. That's a dog right off the hop. There's trash everywhere, but I've had a great time. We did right when we got in a tour of the Colosseum at night. Oh, this you did the night was, tour. This guy was so animated. It was it was incredible. This is a way the, the gladiators are walk out to, to get their fate. <laughs> do they die or do they live? And then he's showing us like they showed a video of the gladiators walking out. I didn't know they almost they they had different type of fighters. They had guys who were like grapplers. They had guys who were like strikers, like almost like MMA. And then they showed us that they had they built like a, a water system in there. And at one point they were flooding the Colosseum floor and having like naval battles in there. Same type thing. And and also the thing that blew me away was the the gladiators. They, they lived and trained like it's now underground next door to the Coliseum. So the guys, and this is a way the glad, you know, they live with their families and their friends. Uh, and then the next day uh, you fight your friend at the, the death or who are going to live or who are going <laughs> to die. Uh, are you going to survive or meet your fate? Sounds like I should have went there to prepare for Chicklet's Cup. I it's was going to get whacked I, in the north end next time. I was north. blown no, away <laughs> that the, that they'd all train and live with their families and then just, boom, they'd kill each other the next day. And I also was wondering how often they had the, the gladiator fights. I figured once a month. They had 150 of them a year. And the guy said every, every 10 like shows... Like nine thousand animals would be killed. I I may be getting that number wrong. They had elephants coming in from Africa. They had lions, tigers. They were just it was it just and then standing on the floor and looking around. I thought the place was going to seat about fifteen twenty k, forty five to fifty thousand. Wow. Looking around, that was built two thousand years ago. It really was incredible. I I absolutely loved it. Um, I I, I will say like. The city itself, you can't. It's really hard to figure out where you're going, Merle's. Like it's like everything looks the exact same, but in terms of the size of the buildings and knowing all these, like the Pantheon, that thing's a unit. That thing, it's huge. And then all the stone, I just I couldn't get over the fact that in Boston you have these amazing like historical 
places and sites and things you can see from, I don't know, 200 years ago. This is 2,000 years ago. So I've really loved that. And, and the food's been great. So last night, we go to this dinner. Oh, I got to look at the picture of the name because this place was recommended by everyone. It was the best food I've ever had. I'm not kidding, Biz. This place was Uber like, Eats so, in, a, in a Tupperware. Called, yeah, yeah. The, not as good as Grinelli's orders. Russ, Russ Kilio. Russ Kilioli. Russ Kilioli. So we go there. I <laughs> uh, have a nice table outside. It was a 930 seat- seating. And... Um, I went inside to go to the bathroom and I was walking inside. You could see like into like kind of a back room. I actually noticed this painting. It was like a painting of a guy's face with a red line through his forehead. I noticed that. Wow, that painting kind of grabs your eyes. It was like ugly as shit, but it grabs your eyes. And then the guy sitting beneath the painting. Now, he was the only one I could see in the room. He kind of looked at like looked at me and then looked and like I could tell he recognized me. He didn't say anything, but he was like, whoa. Like and I was and I just was like kind of gave him like one of those or whatever. So I go down to the bathroom and I come back out. Now, when we had sat down, we're sitting outside. There was a guy sitting right next to our table. He was solo, big black guy, and he had a headphone in. He was jacked. I'm like, this guy's a monster. And he's watching his phone and he's laughing at memes and videos on Instagram. I was watching. He was like, one guy was running into a car and the guy's like, (laughs) I'm like, what's this guy doing? Just eating alone. Well, in the middle of dinner. This other guy comes and joins him. He's got a beard. Now, this guy speaks Italian because he was talking to the waiter in Italian, but he was talking to the other guy in English. And I said, this guy looks like a badass, too. Who are these two guys? Now, our, our friends, the, the, the Shaws we were hanging with, his wife said, I know these guys are bodyguards. These guys are bodyguards or something. I said, I have no idea what's going on here. One guy's watching memes. The other guy's pissed off that his food was taken while he kept turning around, kind of looking, where's my food? Where's the waiter? Waiter was great. So all of a sudden, um, the guy who I had originally had seen who recognized me, but we hadn't spoken, he walked out and he walks around kind of right next to our table, leaving the other direction. He said, hey, Wit, love the show. Love the show. Um, I said, oh, thanks a lot, buddy. Appreciate that. And he was walking with two, two other people. He was walking with two other guys and a girl. And, and all of a sudden, my wife and, and my buddy's wife, they were like, that, there's somebody famous in that group because people were waiting there and all of a sudden asking for pictures and stuff like that. And it was a guy in a hat. You couldn't really tell. And my wife's like, oh, that's the guy from Yellowstone. You know, the guy Casey, the actor. I was like, how can you tell? I, was like, I, don't even, I can't even see anything over there. And, and sure as shit, they get a couple pictures and they walk away. Well, of course, those two guys sitting next to us, they were bodyguards. Oh, but I'm yeah. thinking, why does Casey Dutton from Yellowstone have a yeah, bodyguard? That's a I mean, why would that guy have a bodyguard? You should we have a bodyguard if he's got a bodyguard. I was calling him Jamie. I was like, oh, my <laughs> wife's like, no, that's the psycho brother. This is the other hot brother, whatever. So, well, at this point, they leave. And this guy walks over. Another guy. He's younger. And he says, hey, Wit. Hey, Wit. What's up, man? Huge fan of the show. I wanted to say hi, but I had to say hi to Justin first. And I was like, Justin? I go, is that the guy from Yellow Knife? I said Yellow Knife. My wife's like, no, Yellowstone, Casey. And the guy's wife's like, Yellowstone? Just, it was Justin Timberlake. Whoa. With, uh, whoa. with Jessica whoa. Biel. Get the fuck out of here. So the guy who originally saw me and recognized me, he was with Timberlake. I was like, shit, he might end up telling him who I was because Justin was probably like, hey, oh. that guy you just said hi to. We could have got but- him on the fucking podcast. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, and, and, then the, and then I said to the kid, that, so then the kid came over. He was on his honeymoon from Chicago. He was a huge Hawks fan. The kid got up at like 2 in the morning on his honeymoon to do his fantasy hockey draft. But we chatted with them for a little bit, and he's like, my wife and I, we knew he was in there, and we had to wait for him, so they ended up getting him. I was like, shit, because Justin Timberlake had been at the Ryder Cup, as I had been on Sunday. I ended up getting tickets. I ended up getting tickets. I mean, pretty cool experience. Actually, amazing experience. Well, we got to dive into all these antics and the drama. And I I don't even follow golf that closely. And I was so invested. And I was dying at your Instagram post at the fact that the captain of the Ryder Cup has you blocked on Twitter. How the fuck? How the fuck? That was years ago. That was years. I've always been. uh, um, He tweeted. (laughs) He tweeted years ago, I love my wife so much, and I retweeted it, wrote, what a loser. I was just kidding around. I was just kidding around. Oh, no. But, oh, but no. I've always, oh, no. I, I can't don't, don't stand tell Zach Bree. Johnson. Don't tell Bree. I should laugh at that. 
<laughs> she wants me tweeting out, I love my wife so much. Like, settle down. Tell your wife that. <laughs> the, Zach Johnson is, a, is, oh, I've never liked him. His face, he seems like one of those <laughs> cocky nerds. You know there's nerds and then there's cocky nerds? He was just driving me crazy when he used to be like, I mean, the guys won the British Open at St. Andrews and the Masters. Horrible captain. The, one of the worst captains in Ryder Cup history. What, G? I have some breaking news. It's oh. pretty big. Well, okay. um, oh. Trevor oh. Zegris just signed a new deal with the Anaheim Ducks. Three years, $5.75 million. Yeah, that's Ooh. about where I saw him. Wow, Ooh. good for him. Okay. Good okay. for good him. Good for Trevor Zegris. Wow. There we go. Suck on that, Verbeek. <laughs> Well, I think that's well, a that's a that's a fair deal. Go back to the Ryder Cup yeah, though, yeah, yeah. stuff though, and then we're going to talk about Trevor Zegers getting his deal. Can we also talk about my? I mean, the take the Zegers drives still for Dolly. I mean, oh, buddy. I am an absolute joke of a human. You and were Buffalo Sabers. You were ready, ready to go to the depths of hell for that one too. I was you ready. To you were screaming this at me. weekend. <laughs> have have you have I been dethroned? I as didn't the king know Drysdale is like. Brutal. According what do to you everyone. mean? He's not brutal. He just. I want to see what he does. Everyone's saying he's brutal. No, and he's I'm, not brutal. Okay, he's a great we'll skater. We'll see. we'll see. Well, you're the one who said he was brutal. You said he was. No, like a I didn't. You s- yeah, you did. You texted me on the side. Don't lie. What are you talking about? Fucking pull up the text right now. I never fucking. Oh, no, that texted was somebody you. else. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That was somebody no, else. No, what I, I said apologize. on the podcast was is he only played five games last year because I want to say he separated and fucked up his shoulder within the first ten games of the year. So. Pump the brakes there. Now, mind now, you, if Zegris and Dries still go on to completely light it up, I can go back and say correct. that I was 100% correct, correct on that. Okay, thanks. Right. Uh, the Ryder Cup, I said all along that the U.S. was going to lose. Their team, they, the, oh, there was one big problem with the Ryder Cup right now. You, It's like, it's just flipping back and forth. The teams are getting dummied on the road every time. And a lot of it has to do with you can set it up any way you want. Like the home team has to control the setup, but this setup was set up super fair. Like because the European team was kind of similar in terms of long drivers, they didn't make the rough crazy and like they should put it in a neutral site. Like go to North Korea for one, and then <laughs> no? Kim Jong Un. Yeah, and then if you make the a rules, double, yeah. you just get a, you have to Him dodge and a rocket decide launcher. Decide the rules. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, the European team is so like close and invested and proud and look of it it is such an honor and they look back to all these legends of the game who played in the Ryder Cup and the U.S. team half of these guys just want to get paid they don't give a fuck they look at it like an obligation like this Patrick Canley and Xander Shoffley Cantley, I apparently have heard that the reports not weren't necessarily true that he was he wasn't wearing a hat in because he was trying to like protest He was protesting against the fact that they weren't being paid, which when I heard that, I'm like, then don't even fucking go. Exactly. Then why are you going? So I don't, I don't, a lot of the team came out and said that it wasn't true and he didn't wear a hat and whistling straights either, but he wore one for the president's cup. Well, maybe he didn't want that tan line on his forehead because some of them have the worst forehead tan lines. I don't know. That guy looks like somebody who might want to wear a hat. He's not exactly like (laughs) ski mask. Put a, (laughs) put a USA ski mask on him. Next one. (laughs) He came out and said it didn't fit him. That was the problem. Oh yeah. Yes, Big but I'm assuming energy. if you knew it didn't fit, could you not find a hat? But whatever, Rory's not worn a hat in certain Ryder Cups. But the whole aspect of like team and golf, it, it, I, it's like go out and get the job done. You're playing golf now. When you have a when you have a pairs, the the thing with the U.S. is they can't win alternate shot. They suck at alternate shot. They can't beat the Europeans in alternate shot. So apparently, how close knit their team is, it makes a huge difference. But the U.S. team. Cantley and Shoffley didn't even go over on the trip to play the practice rounds. They didn't, like, a couple guys didn't even go to, like, something right before the tournament. It just, it does seem like they really don't give a shit, and they got waxed. It was a pretty cool Sunday, because for a little bit, it looked like they might have a chance to come back. But in the end, just a dominating, dominating display. So there's a couple things I want to ask you about. So what's the deal between Kepka and Rom? I thought Rom handled it pretty good to defuse the situation, but... Like, like, what's Kepka doing? Why is he trying to stir it up with Rom? I have no idea. I don't really understand what he was talking about. Rom has a fiery temper out there, and I think he can get pretty pissed off and maybe pretty vocal and kind of hit. I don't know. I don't want to say hit things, but just like be 
openly upset where I, I don't think Kepka's like that. He's kind of just like stoic as he plays golf. So maybe as they were playing in that match, uh, he kind of thought like, wow, he's acting a little ridiculous and he decided to chirp him. But maybe not the best time to chirp is your team's getting thumped all around Marco Simone. But Rom handled like a veteran. I actually love the line. He said, I'm, I, don't, I don't claim to be the, the, like the, what did he say? The, the best example of how to act on a golf course, but... I, I mean, I'm proud. Am, of am, am I out of line here to say that that Kepka's old lady has the nicest set on tour? Like they're just popping out every time you see her in like an Instagram. Is it? I'm gonna pass on that clubs? one. I'm not a uh, whatever. I mean, like you could say it, but I, I, I see where you're coming from. Oh, you but didn't I'm see not the a video Kepka guy. Okay, well, oh, you, so you don't want to compliment him on the fact that his wife has a, the, an unbelievable <laughs> set. Uh, the other uh, piece of drama that happened was, I want to say after day two, when Rory was going after um, getting into it in the parking lot before he got into his car with a famous caddy. Now, I don't know anything about golf. Who's the famous caddy, and what was he getting into it with? with well, he was yelling at Jim Bones McKay, who is Justin <laughs> Thomas's caddy, but was Phil Mickelson's caddy for like 30 years. But he was actually pissed off at Joe Lacan. Kava, who was Tiger Woods caddy. Now he's Patrick Cantlay's caddy. And before Tiger, he was Freddie Couples. So he's kind of been oh, in this the game guy must forever. know where all the bodies are buried. Oh, this guy must oh my know God, this, he, He's a wait, Giants he, and Rangers he, fan, I believe, actually. So, well, he had he had Mickelson, Tiger, and who? And Couples? Yeah. No, no, no. I Mickelson was McKay. He was oh. the guy that Rory was like yelling at in the car, but I don't okay. think Rory was mad at him. Rory was mad at LaCava because what happened was that lunatic, that vampire, Patrick Cantlay, he actually <laughs> birdied the last three holes to win his match against Rory on Saturday night. And it the, the, it was already pretty much over, but that gave them like a slimmer of yeah. hope to be six points down or five points down instead of seven, whatever it was. And um, after Cantlay made a bomb for birdie on 18, they had been doing the whole thing where because he didn't wear a hat and the report came out that he wasn't wearing a hat out of protest... Well, the fans were waving their hats at him the entire day after this oh, yeah. news had come. Oh, yeah. So what the U.S. team was doing after he was making putts was taking their hats off. It was just like a stupid golf thing, hat yeah. thing. Basically just jokes. That's why, that's why the sport needs fighting. Exactly. <laughs> the sport needs fighting. It would be so much better. I mean, the, the whole, like, it's like, it's like drama that just seems to be just like trying to be created. Oh, it's so fucking petty, all of it. That's, yeah. But I, but I also love it. But it made it more interesting. It's good for the ratings. So LaCava is waving his hat around, right? For a while, there was a video that came out. It shows like a wide view angle. The guy was walking around where R Rory still had a putt to tie the match for birdie on 18. He's standing like right near Rory where he's trying to line up his putt. And it, he goes on for a while shaking his hat, not giving a <laughs> shit. And Rory says something to him. And then I think he says something back to Rory. And then all of a sudden, Shane Lowry from Team Europe of the drunk Irishman, he starts screaming at LaCava. And then Rory's pissed off and LaCava's giving it back to him. And it was just kind of a scene on the 18th green. Not like he well, would have made the putt anyway, because it is, isn't his putter brutal? I don't know. Rory was sick this week. I think he was like four and one or something. But uh, LaCava <laughs> saw the last sandbagger and thought he could act like R.A. on the greens. <laughs> <laughs> well, Rory was so heated that <laughs> in the parking lot, he saw, I think he saw McKay and he was so mad that he, he started screaming at him, and then, like, he's getting held back, and then Matthew Fitzpatrick's sitting there drinking, like, a protein shake instead of a beer. You'd think they'd have a beer, but they get game the matches in the morning. And then it was just kind of like a, you don't see that in golf, Rory flipping out. He's just as tall as the car, too. He's just a wee little guy, and, and he was furious at LaCava. <laughs> so it was just kind of some manufactured, it felt like golf drama, but definitely made it a little more exciting. Yeah, trying to sell it for day three, even though it was a little out of hand. I think it was 10 and a half to five and a half, as you mentioned. Now, what are your, like, what are your thoughts on Rory? I feel like over the last like four years, he's kind of became this little dweeb on tour. He was crying about the live shit and then all of a sudden he didn't take the bag and then fucking live ends up joining like what are your thoughts on this guy listen uh, this is I, this is from a guy on the outside looking in and i just try to read the comments and follow along but we'll end it after this 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 question no i love watching him golf i, I love watching him golf i definitely would say in the past year or so it, some of his press conferences are a little annoying like right before the tournament you know they asked about live guys and kepka was there he was the only live player representing either team and he's like, 
you know, they miss being he, they miss being here a lot more than we miss him miss them. He just it seems like he can't really stop talking about the live stuff. And I don't know if he's just still pissed off that it ends up being looking like they might be merging anyways, the tour and live. But for a while, it seems like he's been pretty mouthy about Liv and how much he hates him. Whereas I'm just kind of like, dude, why don't you just give it up? You're one of the best golfers ever. You're lighting up everywhere you go. You're rich as hell. It just seems that he's a little bit petty. But I just love watching him swing a golf club. It's pretty sick. So, I, I mean, in the end, he's not like my favorite golfer. But I respect the hell out of him. And he seems to be, yes, a little bit whiny in press conferences and media. All right. Yeah, well, it's been 30 years since the U.S. has uh, won the Ryder Cup on European soil, right? They yeah. don't well, give a fuck, I don't think. I really don't think they do. I, I think that Europeans care way more about the Ryder Cup than Americans. So I, I don't know where it goes from here, but I wish it could somehow be competitive at, like, at some point with the away team like having a chance to win or getting it done. Because every year you see a five, six point win. It's kind of boring. You just want an exciting Sunday. Exactly. Uh, we want to mention his name. Luke Grimes is who plays uh, Casey on not Yellowknife, Yellowstone. And uh, what, you know Cole Hauser, he plays Rip on Yellowstone. How you know, the he was, fuck do you not recognize Justin Timberlake and mistake buddy, him for a guy on Yellowknife? I was, I wasn't, I was, Yellow he knife. walked out, he's like, and he had his hat down. And then the guy that I had saw said, hey, Whit, big fan of chiclets. I buddied him, too. I was like, thanks a lot, buddy. No, but I, I'm saying I'm not being, I'm not buddying him. I'm just no, I'm I'm a saying buddy, buddy in a real. Up, buddy? But if I say buddy to you, it's a term of endearment. I'm not buddying him. Yeah. But I said buddy. And then, I don't know, like he had his hat pulled down. Jessica Biel looked beautiful. Though. Oh, she's a missile. I was going to say, that's what you should have recognized. I know. I know. Seriously. All right, guys. Whit here. And you know what I'm here to talk about? That's pink wit. And we've talked about the football tailgates and we've we've talked about the summertime when everyone crushed the pink Whitney. And now and now we have Chicklets Cup coming up and we have a very special band playing Saturday night. Dirty Honey and their concert. Their show is sponsored by Pink Whitney. It's going to be a memorable, legendary night with the pink wit flowing all over Buffalo, as I hope it is all over every other city. And if you have a friend that you think is the ultimate life of the party, you can nominate them and you could win a Pink Whitney NYC trip. That's right, a trip to New York City. One lucky winner will receive an epic New York City trip for them and three friends, four of you guys, hanging out, complete with a tour of the Barstool headquarters in New York. 10 secondary prize winners will receive Pink Whitney party packs with everything you and your crew need to take your shot and throw the ultimate house party. We're talking nips, we're talking other size bottles and more Pink Whitney for every party you attend. It's easy to enter. Just go to pinkwhitney.com, enter your info, nominate your life for the party friend and describe how they always make the party next level for a chance to win the ultimate Pink Whitney New York City trip. That would be incredible. I hope everyone gets involved. I hope we see everyone slamming the pink wit at Dirty Honey. And of course, most important, make sure to head on over to your local bar and order some pink Whitney. We appreciate it. All right. Nobody yeah. introed you. I'll say this. Thank you for ending the writer strike. <laughs> Everybody's yeah, trying to play it off like we talked about it afterward, but we recorded the last podcast on the Friday and then the writer strike ended two days later. And even though the podcast hadn't dropped yet, I think your rant and grind my gears was heard around the world and you ended the writer strike. So thank you so much. We'll be getting some new content on these streaming services in no time. All thanks to your grind my gears brought to you by Big Deal Brew. Isn't isn't it just temporary though? Uh, or is it completely this- done? No, the, no that's just the writers. We still got to get SAG, which is the actors' union. They got the writers' union down. We oh, still need that's the, easy. the actors' union down. Yeah, but, that's the easy you know, part. Little pre chicklets bump. Uh, no, what I was just saying, that who? Uh, what's his name? Cole Hauser. He plays Rip on uh, Yellowstone. You know, he's actually he played Billy in Goodwill Hunting as well. Did you know that? Kind of looks like you a little bit with the curly hair. Oh, the redheaded guy. Yeah, that's yeah, the fourth him? guy. That's yep. That's Rip. Rip from uh, Yellow Yellowstone is Billy wow. from Goodwill Hunting. Yeah, how's that blow your mind? Wow. Yeah, right. Holy shit. All Good right. stuff. All right. We just broke through with uh, Trevor Zegers. Three years, $5.75 million. Uh, Drysdale is up next, but I, apparently he wasn't going to take anything less than five per David Pagnotta, friend of the program. Uh, Biz, this is about what we just expected, like we said a few minutes ago. Where we, oh, right, rightfully ahead. so. I agree with the kid. And, you know, as as much as, like, sometimes I I would have, if I'm Verbeek, I would qu- question, like, whether to hand them the, the long-term extension. Like, some of these kids are getting eight times eight out of their entry level. I think that he wants to see 
if Zegras has that other level, but for a guy who led your team in scoring and a guy who is basically going to be your first line center, it was a slap in the face to hear that three times four number. So I think that it ended up in a perfect spot. I would have said three times six would have been fair, but uh, overall, I'm sure they're very happy to get their guy and, and, one of which, like, I know they're not going to be a good team, but he puts asses in the seats and especially the younger generation uh, of, of fan in Southern California. So uh, good for him. Great kid. And and I hope he lights it up and continues to evolve his game. Now, the Drysdale one's hard because he's being he's probably being stubborn about his number two, but it's hard because he didn't play all last year. If I'm him, I just probably take like a one year deal. And then that's more of a prove it situation. Like Zegers has played, what, three years now? And every year over year has accelerated his offensive numbers. So I, I just I it's, I have a hard time comparing the two. Where I think that if if Drysdale is not happy with his number, take a one year deal and at a low low number and fucking prove it, buddy. I I don't understand. Like I under I should say I understand Pat for Beak holding strong and wanting to kind of announce his presence with authority a little bit and that maybe I'm not a huge fan of your game and how you play. But if this ended up being the deal, you got the guy missing like all this time. Agreed. And, and what the fuck are you doing? Is this trying to show how 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 tough it how tough you're going to be as a GM? Well, okay, now the guy's completely behind the eight ball. Probably have a little bit of a slow start to the year when. It's the exact deal everyone thought he would get to begin with. So that 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 I that doesn't make any sense to me. That doesn't. I'm happy for Zegers, though. Good amount of cake. He makes a good living, makes a bunch of dough, and then hopefully after three years, he's exactly what they hoped he'd become and and is a you know maybe 80 point guy, 90 point guy if he really lights it up, and he can get that huge payday. It's just so weird to me that you have a, a holdout like this, and then it ends up being exactly what everyone thought. At least Nylander's back in the day, he got more than everyone thought, right? Like, he kind of won that one, I think, if we rem- if I remember correctly. Uh, no, he- I would I would say that the Leafs ended up winning that one. He got seven a year, didn't he? He got 6.9. Seven years, I believe, at 6.9. And Grinelli, you can t- take a look at that one. But he ended up having to wait till... Uh, about no, late November, maybe early December, close to the cutoff. So he missed a half year salary to eventually get what he probably ended up deserving. I think he was he was that guy where where the fan base in Toronto almost didn't want him to get paid because they'd already given up the Marner contract and they'd already given up the Matthews contract. So they're like, somebody's got to pay the Piper here and not get their huge enormous payday. So of of I guess I, most people would say that Austin Matthews is playing up to what his salary is, and from a regular season season standpoint, probably Marner too. But based on what Nylander's done since he signed it, he's overachieved compared to what he's getting paid. And that's yeah, probably it, it why was he a wants six, it was yeah, a six year, forty five million dollar contract okay, signed so on six December first. Yeah. What year? He signed it on December first, twenty eighteen. Yeah, that's what's weird about this too. A week to the season, like you're, if you're gonna hold strong, like get it yeah. into the season, make him miss some games. Like yeah, instead, but, just, Merles, but weird. to be fair, maybe his camp wanted a long term deal. So in in the, in the grand scheme of things, if I'm Verbeek, I think I've won this side of the deal. You're not giving him some crazy number. You're giving him a bridge deal, which is becoming more and more uncommon. And at a very fair number where he led your team in scoring, yet he's only going to be making 5.7 million. So I just think, yeah, I think I think that Verbeek got it in a good spot. I, I I would imagine that anybody wants security when you're a young guy and you and you've proven yourself the way that Zegers has. So um I think I, I maybe maybe it was a mental fuck, but uh, overall I'm pretty sure Verbeek got it where he wanted. Yeah, he's in the fold and uh Probably time to talk about some hockey here. Biz, I, we're going to lead off with your tweet the other night. Uh, this year's preseason has been extra spicy, I tell you. Chili pepper, chili pepper, chili pepper. Absolutely love the hatred coming into the season, which takes us to uh, Vegas, L.A. I mean, the season hasn't started yet. We got the divisional bad blood already going. Uh, Vegas is Mark Stone. Not happy at all with the hit he took from L.A. King. Hayden Hodgson, uh, he shared his thoughts after the game. G, roll that audio, please. Um, that's probably the last time I'll ever play against that guy. Uh not really much of a player, so uh, leave it at that. I think I scared him a little, didn't I? Uh, <laughs> no, I honestly I was looking around for, you know, some of their talented players and trying to run at them, and he was the only, really the only one. So uh, it's unfortunate you're playing against a, uh, you know, a team like that. They're trying to make a name for themselves, and you know, using preseason. The, Did Brandon Clark respond to you during that little uh, interaction? No. 
It's done. We're done. I mean, you heard it. Not happy. But and then Biz to continue to tweet. If you're the Kings and you don't call this kid up for the first regular season game meeting against the Knights, you've dropped the ball, in my opinion. You so gotta. elaborate on that. You, 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 you got to just to troll uh, uh, what Stone's comments were. Now, keep in mind, I was Hodgson's. I was the guy running around being a donkey in training camp trying to make a name for myself. And what does he do? He goes and takes a run at Vegas captain Stone. And all of a sudden, his name's all over the media. So everybody knows who this guy is now. But going to Stone, everybody was poopy pants and saying, oh, the guy's got an ego on him. If I was if I was Stone and I had to accomplish what he'd accomplished and I had some fucking nobody taking a run at me, I'd be chirping him in the in the media afterward, too. That was a straight run from the from the front of the net. It was kind of a, I don't want to say it was a clean hit. It was okay. it was a clean hit, but he fucking took a run at him. Yeah, but and and I know what you're saying that I actually see total both sides of this. I do understand why 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 Stone's pissed off. I know why the Knights were pissed off. But this kid, dude, he's trying to make a living. Come on, he's trying to make a. This kid's gonna do whatever it takes. He runs around. He fucking tries to hit their best player. If if Vegas. If Vegas doesn't want to risk the, the the fact of their captain getting injured, don't play him in the preseason. And I understand him being disgusted, and I, I think it is pretty funny the chirpy through. That'll never Fucking play hilarious. Him again. But buddy, like you're you're out there, you're the best player on the team. How else is that kid gonna get noticed? He's gonna run you over. If it was a if it was Doughty. I'd be like, fuck, what's he doing? Like two vets, right? You know, like why why would it but in terms of a guy trying to make the team and trying to actually like show what he can bring, that's the that's the number one guy you want to run. Cause then the team knows and, and the Kings know and Rob Blake knows this kid doesn't give a shit. So it was it was really it was a it was a very clean hit though. I do want to say that. Nothing wrong with that hit. And Stone getting up and just looking like a madman trying to find him was hilarious. And a bunch of guys got in, so it shows how close that, Vegas that, is. That's too. what I love about the Golden Knights team is not one guy hesitated to yeah. jump in there and, oh. and come to the aid of their captain. So that just shows what they're built and made of. But yeah, no, overall, I agree with you. Clean hit. But you, I mean, taking a run at a guy like that is a little bit disrespectful. But when you're in his situation, you can't give a fuck. Right, you're, you're you're trying to make it. You're trying to make a name for yourself. Yeah, like oh hey, I got sent down because I was respectful. <laughs> Who cares? I made yeah. the team because I was a piece of shit. That's the goal. Look, look like one of those like gang initiation videos where they jump a guy in and just beat the shit. <laughs> start him, curb stomping like. him. Hey, and 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 I'm totally down with what I said before. Mark Stone has had all these injuries. He's such an amazing player. I I would not play him in preseason. Let him let him struggle if he needs to the first three games of the regular season. I'm not playing. I'm I'm not playing my superstars in preseason hockey. I'm not. You've seen it happen in the NFL now, which is obviously even more injury prone. But I'm not risking that shit. And not against your rival either. Against the yeah. Kings. If, if if you're playing Columbus or somebody, all right, let him out there. You know that game's going to be heated. Merles, I want to ask you in a camp like that where you know you were more probably more of a skilled guy. What, what would you do to get kind of get noticed by the coach if you were sort of on the bubble? If you know that wasn't your game, I actually had the same type of thing kind of happen to me. I was in uh, Pittsburgh. We were in Columbus. It was the last game, and uh, I went in to start a big fun bunch. I was like, I got to get noticed here. I got to get a fight going. I go in. I start grabbing guys, and I was always a good shit talker. I always could have a comeback. And uh, I think it was Tyler Wright. He goes, "Hey, kid." Grab your per diem and get back to Wilkesbury. Nobody's gonna fight you. <laughs> I, I, I was shocked. I didn't know what to do. I had no comeback because he was a hundred percent right. I was going back to Wilkesbury the next day, so he got me good. He shut me right up. But yeah, you're you're trying anything, and I don't blame the kid for doing that, and I don't blame Stone for saying that. And I think you're right, Biz. I think they should call him up. If not in the regular season, can you imagine in a playoff series they call that kid up? He'll be all. They'll have them so rattled. It'll be great. Getting their heads. Uh, Biz, we got a new meme from the hockey world. The, the little double wrister in Pittsburgh yeah. the other day. That's every got time Connor Bedard b breathes. They got that meme coming up of this Pittsburgh kid. <laughs> Have you seen that one on the Jumbotron, Wit? It was it was ridiculous. And my favorite part was the cameraman immediately panics. And then the, and then the, the girl in the crowd's like, oh, shit. Oh, yeah. so like, By the way, what a sicko that kid just a is. Double what wrister. Sicko. Oh, he's, oh, he's, oh. Just, he's just got the gluck gluck going in the crowd watching a preseason game. Yeah, the Lisa <laughs> and Ann special. Sit down and have a drink and enjoy the Penguins. What are you doing? But what is the cameraman panning over to him for? I think he just didn't know he was doing it until he came into his field of vision. I would imagine you're not there. expecting a, a, a yeah. kid of so, that age to be doing a double wrister with the, with the mascara <laughs> dripping in preseason. 
But good, good for the Penguins fans getting engaged early. <laughs> That's what Army meant by a competitive training camp. They got everybody, all hands on deck. Is he saying they suck or they blow, Biz? I, I couldn't figure no, out. No, he's just being a yet. absolute I think he was pervert. signaling to the ref. He wasn't happy with a call. <laughs> I think he was uh, signaling to a girl on the other side of the arena. Like I had that had nothing to do with the penguin. I was just uh, a sick, sick kid. That's how these kids communicate nowadays. Seriously, huh? Uh, our pal Kevin Weeks had a big scoop about uh, Tampa goalie Andre Vasilevsky. He's going to uh, be out eight to ten weeks. He had back surgery uh, last Thursday. I guess he had an injection in August. Uh, the relief was only temporary. He felt something off in the first practice, so. You got that surgery done right now. Tampa has uh, Jonas Johansson and Matt Tompkins manning the crease. Now, I know there's lots of talk about the dynasty in Tampa, blah, blah, blah. We're going to do them next week. We're not going to talk about them right now because, you know, we're doing the Atlantic next week. But big story to get to. Also, uh, Calgary's Michael Backlund signed a two-year, $9 million extension. Uh, he was subsequently named the 21st captain in Flames history. Nice. Uh, the 34-year-old forward becomes the fifth new captain before the season starts, along with Maya Shand. Wait, Luke you're Shen. two for two now. Didn't you, you say Braden yeah. Shen, and, and you also mentioned Backlund? I know, but but those two are pretty obvious. Obvious? Those okay. two are pretty obvious. That, that's nothing special. Uh, Quinn Hughes, Adam Lowry, the other two. Right now, Anaheim, Arizona, Chicago, Philly, Seattle uh, remain sealess. Uh, Biz, is Lindholm up next? He's in the last year of a deal that pays him $4.85 million. It feels like the tide might be changing a little bit here for Calgary after, you know, the Gaudreau exit and the uh, Matty Kachuk and felt like the sky was falling on these guys. What do you think uh, the future is here, Biz? Well, well they, they definitely got to lock him in. He's an incredible first-line center. I don't know what his number is going to be because, you know, when these types of guys get the free agency, you can't rarely do guys of this caliber, especially center icemen, get the free agency. So, I don't know. I, I would imagine his number is going to be probably in that $10 million range for a long-term deal, especially if you see what Huberto got. Uh, but if they don't lock him, him in, then you're probably looking at, at some point, a full rebuild and not re-signing Tanev and, and Zadorov and all these other unrestricted free agents that they have coming up this offseason. Right? you got to start somewhere. If you're not going to have your first-line center, it's just like you, you might as well start from scratch. Uh, but, I, I, would, I would think they'd be trying to do that as quick as possible because he either lights it up and they do great and he probably doesn't come back because of how much money he'd get or they struggle and he doesn't play awesome and then he's like get me the fuck out of here but if you could get it done now so I don't know if the kid's saying uh, let me let me wait on this I'm not sure I think it, it seems to be that he just wants to see how the team does so hopefully as a Calgary Flames fan he starts off hot the team starts off hot and around American Thanksgiving you sign him to a long-term deal I, I would think yeah he it'd have to be eight years how old is he can you look that up quick Ari? is he 28 Lindholm uh I don't I'll look it up quick that's his job he'll, he'll, take, he'll take care of us yeah somebody <laughs> let me know on that but he yeah he's a hell of a player and I I do think that they're gonna bounce 28 back years old wait, you're correct 28 yeah so yeah I mean it, it, it just it just seems like it has to happen quick the longer it goes on the less likely it is to happen I would think uh talking about signings pretty cool video uh Ottawa Senators had a video with uh Jabril Torre they, he FaceTimed his mom as he signed his first contract Really refreshing video, uh, Merles. We'll go to you on this one. He was just a kid, very exuberant, but this kid's undrafted. He's six seven defenseman who played for OHL Sudbury last season. Uh, signed to an amateur tryout, a three A ELC. Merles, who did you call or who did you talk to first after you signed your first pro deal? Yeah, I was at home, and it, there's nothing like it when you get it, back then. It was a fax machine. The fax <laughs> came in, and uh, you have that NHL logo on the contract. You sign it. And the the best part was, I think, a week later when the check, you used to actually get a real check, came in the mail. Same thing, NHL logo on there, a few extra zeros for the signing bonus. That was fun. But I was always with my mom and dad when anything big happened like that. How soon do people try, try to hit you up for some dough after word get out? Yeah, well, I was actually on the books of my mom at that point because I was in college my senior year. I had run out of money, obviously, going to Turning Stone Casino too much and buying <laughs> beers at the bar and... My mom gave me her bank card, actually, my senior year, and I could just go take money out whenever I wanted. So she was the first person I had to pay back. And I had a couple buddies that I, I had to lend some money to. One guy I'm still chasing around for 100 bucks still, and uh, but nothing too bad. I always just took I care actually, of everybody. They didn't need to ask. I got a text when I signed because I was picked in 02, but I didn't sign until uh, it was 04, I think. And I got a text that said... Um, Hey, man, you don't know me, but 
Uh, my name's Paul Bissonette. I'm a Pittsburgh Penguins draft pick as well. And I was wondering if you could lend me five grand. And I was like, who Prank the fuck's off. this guy? Didn't even know him yet. He's already looking Shut for money. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> oh, shit. But I, I remember I was with my family. And it, it was a great feeling. Su super grateful. And then you're so emotional with them. Like, this is happening because of you. Because of what you've done for me my entire life. And and. and it's you're very appreciative for, for of your parents at the time, and then I got the check five hundred and ninety two thousand. I was like, holy shit! And I said, I'm gonna buy an Escalade. My dad goes, No, you're not. I was like, I can't even buy what I want to buy, so I had to <laughs> buy an, an Infinity Q45 that I got chirped for because it was like a sixty five year old guy's car yeah. I drove around. What Escalade? <laughs> the thing was trash. It was actually a nice smooth ride, but I I legit. I mean, I look 65 now, so say when I was 22, I looked 42. I, I guess it was, just, it was just not a great look for an NHL rookie. Wait, when you signed the big ticket there, did people like legit try to hit you off the door? Hey, what, congrats. I a little, some, little taste for the no. old buddy here or what? No. no? Nobody? No. Ah, good. What about you, Biz? No. Your first uh, deal. Who'd you call first? Who'd you talk to? Well, it was a lot different than Wits. I mean, what, what <laughs> round were you drafted, Merle's? Fourth? Second. Oh, you were a second, second rounder? Slap Holy in shit. The face, show, show some respect, Rank, rank first round, not a big um, deal. My drinking the night before the draft. Then he got drunk at the draft. Yeah, so my, my signing bonus was 175 grand. It was the, actually the, the year after the That's lockout. Pretty good. Not, not bad, but it was a year after the lockout where they no longer had those big bonuses. So all the big dogs from my draft ended up signing right before... So like Mark they knew Andre, it was going to get canceled because they knew. So Mark Andre Fleury got like one point one, maybe one point two million plus all these crazy bonuses in his contract. Where as soon as the lockout hit, that's where they started. Where I think the max a first rounder could get was like three hundred to three hundred fifty thousand dollars. So so pre pre lockout, like there was other guys in like the third and fourth round that were getting like three three fifty in that range. So hey. Still super pumped, and you know you're making fifty dollars a week in junior, and all of a sudden you're you're getting paid about one hundred and ten grand a year for your first three years of pro. Because I I think at that time our AHL salary was fifty five grand, which adjusted for inflation. I mean we were making over a, that's where that's where when a hundred grand actually got you somewhere back then in two thousand five. So, um, but I I think the first thing I bought was an F one fifty, and the thing lasted me six seven years. Loved it. Kind of like with though, my parents were like, ah, I really wouldn't buy a, a, a new car, but you get that bonus and you're just so horny to get something new and, and car seems to be the play. Yeah, but I no, I didn't have 50, any family 000, members. Yeah. What'd you get? Yeah, the $50,000 Denali. I, I, still I has up, it though. I, I, <laughs> it lasted Legit, 16 years, <laughs> but yeah, it's not the smartest purchase right away. But uh, if people listening, if they don't, if they're wondering why these uh, signing bonus keep dropping, I think Daigle had like 10 million and then it got down to a million. Now it's down to like 90,000. It's because the Players Association gets to, to bargain on this and the guys that are in charge of the players are not ever going to be rookies again. So the first thing to go is the rookie salary cap. So that's why the, the young guys get screwed. It's and crept up year over year. It's probably close to 400 grand now. Oh, it's back, going back the other it's, way. Well, now. It's like it's okay. in that 350 to 400 K mm -hmm. range. Whereas you said, so wit, you got half of your bonus right away. Yeah. Yeah. And then I think the next year I got the same check. Fuck. That's a, that's a nice, that's a nice deposit. Nice little oh, drop just there. investing the shit out of that. Sadly, summer has come to an end. But that doesn't mean the Labatt Blue Light should stop flowing. Whether you're on the golf course, at Beer League, or watching some football, you can't find a better beer than a fresh Labatt Blue Light. Lots of things are better together. Like we said, hockey, food, golf. But if you really want to take things to the next level, drink some Labatt Blue Lights with your friends and live life to the power of we. Mm. Outstanding. Everyone is excited for the Chicklets Cup this week. Me? Fight up to be in Buffalo, the home of the tasty Labatt Blue Lights. Nothing like a fresh Canadian Pilsner. Why you enjoy some downtime before hockey season's coming soon. And remember, take a page out of the Labatt Blue Light book and enjoy your beers together so you can live life to the power of we. You can find Labatt Blue Light at labattusa.com slash finder. Hopefully you find one like I do right here. Lots of beat, lots of Labatt Blues this weekend, R.A. at the Chicklets oh. Cup. 
Oh, lost count already, buddy. We haven't even got there yet. So the second you see those Labatt Blue silos, once you enter the city of Buffalo, you know it's going to be a good time. Mm. I can't wait to drink some Labatt Blue lights. Can't wait to do it with you, buddy. See you there, my man. Uh, the Sens also named out longtime NHL defenseman Steve Steos as president of Hockey Ops. Uh, again, we'll dive into this more next week when we cover the Atlantic Division, but congrats to Steve Steos, former Bruin back in the day. Uh, the Blue Jackets hired uh, Hockey Hall of Famer Mark Recchi as an assistant coach. And uh, one other note with Columbus, we want to uh, send our best wishes to Columbus beat writer Aaron Portsline. Uh, he said she had some personal news Monday about his kidney disease. It's gotten worse. Uh, and he's seeking a transplant and he wanted to raise awareness. And, you know, we'd like to amplify his message. It's very important about organ transplants, becoming a donor. Uh, he said that at least 100,000 people are waiting for one and about 90 percent of them are waiting on a kidney. He's had about nine people uh, looking for a match, but he's still searching. He mentions people be can become either a direct uh, living donor or declaring it on their license should they pass away. And uh, a good pal of mine did this a few years ago. He donated a kidney to his aunt. You know, extended her life. It's it's one of the I don't know, biggest things I think you could do for a person to actually uh, donate an organ. Uh, he listed a few sites as well. Uh, uh, Lifelineofohio.org, uh, DonateLife.net. And this is a, a tough, tough one. OSU, uh, Wex, Med, uh, LivingDonor.org. Uh, you can also go to his uh, Twitter handle at A Portsline, Aaron Portsline, a great beat writer for Columbus. So, Aaron, we wish you the best, man. We hope that match comes soon. And uh, nothing but good health for you going forward, my friend. So. Nice. Boys, I think we should uh, head over to the Central Division here. Let's About do time, it. Right? Let's dive in. All right, Chicago Blackhawks first up. I mean, I know there's a lot of big teams out west, but Connor Bedard, man, he's the story this year. Last year, the Blackhawks, they were 30th out of 32 teams. Uh, last in the Central, only 59 points. Haven't been in the playoffs since 2020. They're 200 to 1, Burles, uh, to win the Cup this year. They brought in, obviously, Bedard as a rookie. Uh, also signed Ryan Donato, uh, Nick Foligno, Taylor Hall, Corey Perry, uh, Jonathan Taves no longer there. He's not retired. He's kind of in limbo right now. Alex Stalock, Caleb Jones, uh, Juja Kyra, and uh, Anton Hudobin all moved on. Got a bunch of cap space, only $13 million. But again, the story's Bedard here. Uh, they're going to kick off the season ESPN uh, one week from tonight versus Pittsburgh. Sid, the kid, uh, Sid, oh, was it Sid versus the kid, they're calling it. Wit, what's going on with Chicago? How are they going to do this year? What's the focus <laughs> on this? Just every night Bedard or what? Yeah, they're going to be horrible, but they got this kid <laughs> I who it. I can't even get over some of these highlights already. I mean, that that rush the other night, the fake pass, and then he kind of goes between his legs. Uh, what defenseman on Detroit was that? Because he's probably immediately sent down if it wasn't. Chelios. <laughs> was it? Yeah, oh, yeah, no. he came back, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Babs actually called him. Down. <laughs> but I, I, his, his skill level and his shot, no matter how bad the Blackhawks are, it's very similar to Merles and I in Pittsburgh. We were must watch because of Sid, his rookie year. And same as the Capitals with Ovi. And you and you that goal if he'd scored that goal in a regular season game, that would have been similar to Ovi's rookie year goal in Arizona when he walked by everyone and scored from his back. It's that's what you expect to see. And that's what's so cool. As I mentioned, the kid that I saw um in Rome after dinner, he's just so excited. He knows the team's going to be bad. He's a huge Blackhawks fan, but he just gets to watch this guy. And I think, I said last week, he's going to get 40. I just He's going to play so much. He's going to be able to be out there most of the power play, and, and you're going to get to witness some very special things. So as a Blackhawks fan, you want the team to lose, and yeah. you want him to do well. That's actually the goal. Hopefully he gets 40 goals and 80 points and the team finishes dead last. That's actually your goal as a Blackhawks fan. I hate to break it to all you guys, but then you get Max Celebrini or Cole Eiserman, both going to BU. One's already there. Thank you very much, BU Hockey, Jay Pandolfo. So it's about rebuilding and it's about getting this franchise player accustomed to the NHL and learning how to play on the road and learning how to play this many games. And most importantly, probably learning how to deal with the media every single night. I was always so amazed by He's Sid. fucking unbelievable already. Yeah, he's uh, he's unbelievable, but he's already kind of disgusted. For a kid his age, for a kid dude, his age, he's, he's excellent. So There's guys who are 10-year vets who are worse than him. But he's shown to be a little annoyed already. And Sid never, Sid never. Yeah, but he, gave, but he kind of like uh, he he gives it back a little bit, like in in a in a in a calm, playful. cheerful way. It's playful way, exactly. O okay, but Biz, every single city you remember, Sid. It was twenty five reporters every morning, every practice, every post game, and 
if if you're not super mentally strong, I know people may think, what is this guy talking about? Like, who cares? It's media. It wears you down. I bet you Sid would say the same thing. So having to play the games and having to produce and having to learn the league and being on the road and then having to do these media obligations every day Spe- is Yeah, exhausting. especially when you're going to be losing most nights and the frustration is exactly. probably going to mount up. And if he's not scoring, then it becomes even more difficult, too, I, which I, was, I don't think I, will be an issue. I, I would assume if you polled maybe 99.9% of their fans would agree that they would rather see Connor Bedard score 40 goals and their team miss playoffs than him score 20 and their team make playoffs this year. Would you not agree with that? Yeah, I would because you know if you're getting in, it's like the eighth seed, you got no chance to win. That I mean, that's that's an interesting one. I I, I would assume it wouldn't be 99.9. Yeah, making the playoffs is a big deal. But, but they, they they surrounded him with some nice wily veterans. They got, uh, I mean, who, who's the guy on the fourth line? Uh, Felino. They got in there. Yep. They got Corey Perry. So a little bit of protection, guys who are going to teach him the way and deflect a little bit of that attention that you just mentioned, as far as the media is concerned. So we all know they're not making playoffs. They're going to be brutal. But all of a sudden, one player makes a must watch. And you just mentioned they kick off things on ESPN on Tuesday, and then Wednesday we got him in a back to back against the Boston Bruins. So he's he's starting off on prime time both nights so that's the way to do it the nhl's got it right and uh, also chicago they have 13 picks in the first two rounds of the next two drafts and eight pending ufas on this roster so they're going to be like chock full of picks uh, you know after this year i'm sure they're going to be trading some of those guys and just going back to the media stuff he kind of reminds me a little jack hughes biz as far as like you know kind of the the playful aspect like someone asked him you know when you were out there on the ice you you weren't looking at the bench did you want to stay out there he's like yeah i like hockey like you know kind of like not quite a wise ass but you know a little fucking chuckle there uh also to the mid-season he's gonna be like fuck you yeah suck on this fuck you you piece of shit with that question next Oh, also, too, did you see the, uh, the clip? He, they were talking to him, and you, and you could see him look over and kind of grit his teeth and, like, make a mad face because one of the reporters stepped on the logo uh, in the locker room. And that's, like, a huge point of contention so wi- on Twitter. So Wish has an ongoing battle oh, with the yeah. fact that they, some of it partly makes sense that they make, the, they make them so big in the middle of the room where when reporters come in, there is really nowhere to step. But it's the unwritten rule. They A lot of teams now, though, with the new locker rooms, they're putting them on the ceiling as opposed to the floor, which is probably the way to go, no? Yeah, I, just to avoid I'm in that. The, code, but. in the camp of put something around it if you don't want guys who cover the team and have never played hockey and could give two fucks from stepping on the logo. Put a little barrier around it, right? We, we had guard. a Mac go over it in Pittsburgh. Remember, they would pull the mat out when the media would come in. It was so the Mac can go over it, but you're four by can't. four. It just it, him getting mad at a reporter, like, dude, the guy, the guy is grinding away trying to write story after story about the worst team in the league. He's never played a sport in his life. He could give two fucks if his Nike stepped foot on the <laughs> corner of the Blackhawks logo. So players getting mad at that is ridiculous. If you don't want somebody to step on it, put something around it, which I think teams have done, haven't they? Yeah, they do typically in the playoffs. I know the Bruins have. They put, you know, those sort of movie theater ropes around it just so it doesn't happen. You know, as far as a guy who's been in a few of those locker rooms, it's to me, it's a workplace thing. You're, you're going to somebody else's workspace, and they basically have one rule. Don't step on that thing. I don't think it's it's a big deal to not do that. It's not a huge deal. I, I know it's a, a big debate. At the end of the day, it's not a big deal. Uh, Biz, I want to go back to one thing, too, uh, about uh, uh, well, his dietary habits. His mother had said he's never had fast food. He will at some point, but he has not, never eaten McDonald's or anything yet. I think we all know when we eat well, how you feel, and then we kind of go off the rails. I think he's just aware of that feeling. On game days, he'll eat chicken, rice, vegetables, shrimp, mashed jams, chicken, salmon, kind shrimp. of a rotation. Yeah, a little bit. Just shrimp's good for you. But just the fact that like Grinelli's I mean, diet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. The fast food pot, maybe. But it, it is unusual for a kid of that age to never have eaten fast food. Know what? I mean, like yeah, it's 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 pretty wild. It shows his dedication. I would imagine he's not boozing much either then. I, I smell a Ned Flanders coming. All of a sudden he's gonna be like the biggest <laughs> fucking booze bag in the league. Totally I mean, at a certain point, at a certain point, something's gotta give. And if you're playing in Chicago and the amount of L's they're going to be taking this year, I wouldn't be sh- surprised if he ends up at the Rhino drinking a few bottles of vodka. <laughs> yeah, Ned Flanders is sober. I, yeah, it's surprising <laughs> never having fast food. But yeah. when he wants it that bad, he's just looking at at one goal in life, being an NHL superstar. I would be surprised if he's never boozed, though. Like in junior with all the guys, world juniors, never. We'll find out. When he's Frank the Tank streaking through the United Center, crippled after the Blackhawks lose their 27th in a row. 
Merle's uh, gambling stuff right here. His call the odds uh, minus one forty. I know we talked about it over the summer. I had never seen uh, call the odds in a, in a fucking negative like that, a minus like that. A guy's that much of a favorite. He's not like a plus two hundred or three hundred. Obviously, he's the chalk here. Are you putting something on him, or are you going to go for a little uh, something off the board? Maybe no, your boy, I'm going uh, to put a little something on him just because I want to watch him. I actually watched that exhibition game the other night, and it it was amazing. I I felt like he. I know it's lesser competition, a lot of AHL guys, but it it looked like he was in a beer league. He's cutting across the middle. He's holding on to it. So I want to be able to root for him. But my other my dark horse, I don't know if it's really a dark horse, but I'm going to little hedge on Hughes in New Jersey. So uh, what's he seven to one? Seven to one, Luke yeah, Hughes. yeah. I yeah, think he can go. be. I think he can be next level, and he has all the weapons to get a ton of points. So he's in a perfect situation. Yeah, a thir- thirty and a half goals. I'm not sure if that's going up. Me and Posh have a little bet there. I was willing to go way higher than me and Posh. Posh is grand, going but- that Hugh uh, Bedard doesn't get thirty. Yeah, me and him made a, a bet. I I have over thirty and a half, or maybe thirty one and a half. He has under. And I, you know, he's Posh got way more money than I do. I was going to go 10 times the, the actual bet we made, but he was too scared. So what are you going to do? All right, boys, obviously we don't have to go through all of us. None of us have Chicago getting no. into the playoffs, right? No. Pretty, pretty obvious. Yeah. Uh, all right. Next up, the biz team coyotes uh, last season, 70 points, seventh in the central, uh, 27th out of 32 teams. Last time they were in the playoffs was 2020, 130 to, to one to win the cup. Lots of new faces down there this year. Logan Cooley, uh, unreal rookie we're going to see this year. Jason Zucker, Matt Dumba, Sean Dersey, Alex Kerfoot, uh, Nick Bugstad, Troy Stetcher, Travis Dermont, Zach Sanford. This is a team biz. I, I talked to you the other day, man. Like, guys are kind of gravitating to this team. Like, you know, we have fun when we goof on the, the stadium and all that shit. But there's something like it feels like they're building here, biz. Am I wrong here or what? The unbelievable young talent and probably the most excited I've been for a Coyote season in a long time. Like with all those young names you mentioned, like Michelli last year, like he was dancing everywhere. Great play playmaker, uh, great puck control. He like, he's a fucking unbelievable passer. You just mentioned Logan Cooley. Uh, when I was over with Nick Schmaltz the other night, he said like highest talent he's seen out of a young guy come up in this organization just like naturally in a, in a long time. So you got him in the mix. Obviously, he's going to have his growing pains and he's still got to grow into his body. Uh, Gunther, who spent a little bit of time up last year, just a crafty player, really good around the net, maybe a bit undersized, but I mean that that doesn't really matter if you in today's game. It's not as physical as it once was, and and they obviously are calling more and more penalties on guys you know who are who are protecting the puck and doing the right things with it. Uh, that top line, Barrett Hayton, really finally came out of his shell in the second half of the season, playing with uh, Schmaltzy and Kells. So as far as that top line is concerned, I'm excited to see what what they can produce. And it just seems to be the same MO over the last two, three years with them going out and signing these guys like Zucker. Uh, they had Bugstad last year, and then they flipped him at the deadline to Edmonton. I thought he looked great in Edmonton, uh, very well liked here. So they're basically just collecting those types of guys like Kerfoot as well, where I would imagine that they're going to be very competitive up into the deadline. And then they're going to flip those types of guys for, you know, maybe if you're lucky, a second rounder, the third and fourth round picks. Um, you know, maybe a little bit thin on the back end, but they got some some good young guys in the pipeline. Like I like that JJ Moser. He's he, he's yeah, a he's stud. Pretty solid. He, he's solid back there, but once again, plays for the Coyotes, so you don't hear a ton about him. He's a little uh, older too for his like second year. Right? Yeah, uh, a guy who I'm excited to see. Uh, a younger guy is Dursey, who maybe didn't get the ice time to to flourish in that offensive defenseman type role with LA because Dowdy was there. But, you know, he comes over here and now that Gosta Spare is not here and he's moved on, he's going to be able to get those types of reps. Uh, their goal, their goaltending is f- excellent. They have a great one, two punch in that Vimelka and, and Ingram. And I said last year, they kind of slap lipstick on a pig sometimes in a, in a non good way. And that's why we end up drafting, you know, fifth or, or sixth or seventh overall. We're never getting those high picks. So my, so f- from a Coyotes fan perspective, I hope they, are very relevant and they're playing good hockey and you see these guys these younger players kind of elevate their play as the year goes on but at the deadline get rid of these other guys for some picks and then they end up tanking and they hopefully get a first or second overall draft pick because i they can't it ain't gonna happen dude you can't keep staying in this limbo area 
You can't. You got to get you got to get some other players to complement these other guys that you have coming in and and hopefully it, it sucked though because these other guys that they drafted this year the two, the two Russian kids who were playing in the KHL because they're on KHL contracts they couldn't come over here and, and participate in training camp or even playing any exhibition games so you really don't know what you got until they're able to step foot on on North American soil and show their stuff but Bill Armstrong's known for his drafting and developing, and obviously from what we're seeing with these young prospects coming up, like the Gunthers and the Michellis and those types of players, he has a pretty good track record. So overall, I'm okay with the way that he's 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 going and, and the plan that he has, but we all know that they're not making playoffs. My biggest thing is making sure that they sell off at the deadline and they really do a good job of tanking and solidify a top two pick. I think they're way better than people realize, and I think they're not even close to a top three pick this year. I I will say, if you look at their amazing record at home last year, that may not be the same with team second season coming in and playing. It's like Vegas, right? Remember first year Vegas? I think they won every fucking home game. So the Vegas was a sorority flu. (laughs) I know, but the the team's pretty good. I mean, Clayton Keller's sick. I love watching him play. I think Logan Cooley is going to be right up there for rookie of the year. I, I just, it almost, it almost seems to be a little bit of a mistake in terms of like, they're not that bad at all. They're going to be competing and be hard to play against and they need these more talented picks. But the argument is that they've, they've done that for so long and been so bad. They have to have some, some relevancy and, and maybe like that gives them a better chance of sticking around in Arizona if they're a better team. So it's really hard to argue that like they should just be tanking because they they've been so bad for so long. But I don't they'll be a pain in the ass to play against. I mean, and Biz, the goaltending is what you say that's interesting. They they can make a ton of saves and this team can win a good amount of games. I wouldn't be surprised at all to see them start off and look like in a playoff spot around Thanksgiving. Well, the one thing they have going for them is I think we can all agree this is the weakest division this year. And there's a lot of teams in limbo. I have it's five three teams real the, good teams. I, I have five teams from the Pacific making it. I only have three teams, yeah, obviously, in this division making it. So I just th- th- these are all going to be cusp teams, and and uh, I, I think that they can definitely pick a lot of points off those bottom feeders like the Chicago Blackhawks. I don't really want to call St. Louis a bottom feeder because we're going to get to them, but you know the teams that are in limbo as well, like the Nashvilles, and, and they're the better than on. Winnipeg. Oh, I would definitely say they're better better than. I mean, Hellebuck and Shifley, and and obviously there's some guys with the guys they got from LA. But I look at Arizona, Winnipeg. Who would you rather be right now? Coyotes in a landslide. And I also don't think that they have a lot of picks in the in the next few years. uh, Winnipeg, outside of what they were already given. Yeah, we'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, Merles, what's your take on the, on the Yotes this year and uh, do they make the playoffs? No, I got them out of the playoffs. I got them so low just because I couldn't I couldn't put them above St. Louis. I couldn't put them out above the Jets until they proved me otherwise. As a gambler, a great little spot, though, to look for them is at home. Teams, A lot of teams go from Vegas or Colorado and then have to go there and play them. So that's a great spot to try to catch a team on a back-to-back. You always get fantastic odds on the Yotes at home. Yeah, 21, 15, and 5 at home last year. They love playing for the coach, too, Biz. I know it's Andre Turigny. Tur- 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 okay. Yeah. I mean, I think, though, it's it's going to be tough to make up to the 25-point difference there out of the playoffs last year. But Cooley and Keller are going to lead them. I know G had a little something on Logan Cooley for us. What do you got for us, G? Oh, here. He's going to be going yeah. Pittsburgh fan. Double wrister. No, I was just going to say I love Logan Cooley. I love this Arizona team. I like what they're building. I don't think they'll be in the playoffs, but I think they'll be in the mix at the end of the season. But I'm sprinkling a little bit on Logan Cooley to win the Calder. I love this kid, especially what we saw last year at Minnesota, what we saw in the uh, games over in Australia. I think 10 to 1 is good money. Wow. I mean, it should be a final. Okay. So we got oh, that goal, too. We got to talk about that goal, man. Like, is, I think, we, did you see it live? Did you see the, the gif on, on, on the internet? Where did you see well, that goal? Yeah, first? that night it was all over the internet, oh. right? And that was when they were doing their uh, their promotional game over in Australia, game one. And he can dance, man. That's why I said when I was talking to Schmaltzy, he said, as far as natural talent, like for, for a kid coming into his age, it's some of the best he's ever seen. So I don't, I don't disagree, G. And he's also playing in that second line role. So he'll have better, you know, uh, he'll have easier matchups than a guy, let's say, like Bedard, who's kind of going to be exposed to every first line center in the league, which we know, man, going against some of these first line center in the Western Conference, man, it's a fucking grind night in and night out. Yeah, that goes when you, you jump out of your seat. And I, I call my wife. She's like over hockey after my job for the last several years. But even she was like taken aback when she saw that thing. Just an unreal sick move. 
Uh, so, yeah, keep an eye on the Coyotes this year. Next up, the Nashville Predators, uh, fifth in the Central last year, uh, 18th out of 32 teams. Last time in the playoffs was uh, 2022, swept by Colorado in the first round. They're 75 to 1. Uh, to win the cup this year. They got some new faces in town. Head coach Andrew Burnett, uh, Ryan O'Reilly signed there, Gustav Nyquist, uh, Dennis Garianoff, and Luke Shen. Uh, they said bye to Matt Duchesne, Ryan Johansson, Zach Sanford, and Cal Foot. A couple of big names from the last few years of uh, the Preds are gone. Uh, a little under $8 million in cap space. But we were just talking about this, with sort of what we call the, the, the flyer zone. Uh, you're not good enough to win a cup. You're not bad enough to, to go for the lottery. You're kind of in that no man's land. So what's on tap for the Preds this year, Whit Dog? I think if they didn't have Saros and Yossi, they're like one of the worst teams in the league. And Biz calls out the Islanders for being boring. Yes, Yossi does some amazing things, and Saros is just always kicking. It seems like he's best top three goalie in the league, but ugh, I get nothing on a watch in Nashville play. I feel bad saying that. Unreal fans, great building to watch a game, but in terms of this year, I mean, there's not much to be excited about, is no, there? Imagine so if young Saros got injured. Knock on wood, one, two, three. I mean, this team, like... Ryan O'Reilly's an amazing leader, and and in terms of like younger players, he's perfect to to help them learn what it's like to be a pro and learn how to approach each game. But he had what do you have thirty points last year, and and then I know they 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 bought out Duchesne, right? I think he's going to be great in Dallas, but they lose a bunch of offense there. Um, it's just a team that's really stuck right now, and I don't know how they end up going about things. I don't know their draft pick setup. It's just kind of a time of like, they're not making playoffs. Would you guys agree? Do any of you have them in the playoffs? No. I don't. I don't even have them close. This is another team I'd rather be Arizona than. I'd rather be Arizona than Nashville because it's just, it seems like it's, it's long enough where you're just stuck in mediocrity. And I know it was a while ago they went to the Stanley Cup final and they've had some decent runs, but when was the last time Nashville got out of the first round? Was it 2018? 19 maybe they I think they missed the playoffs the last year for the first time in 14 years wasn't it maybe it was 11 maybe I'm over exaggerating here I know but, but, in but, race, but I agree but with you it's 24 2014 was the last time they missed the playoffs because yeah I, I, but even if you're making it it's the same thing it's you're, you're yeah it's the Flyers and and I, I love the hockey market I really do and Trotz comes back and and I think that um What's his name? The new coach. Uh, Brunette. 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 I, maybe they get some more offense out of him being the coach and, and letting guys play a little more free. But I, I don't see a ton going on. I really, no. I really don't. The one kid I loved last year, and I got to look up his name right now. He had a, he was almost a point per game. Um, what's his name? Is it Yuso Parsonen? Yes. No. Yeah. He Is came in and had the between the leg goal that went viral. They got some good young guys. You got to remember, they made a run at the end of the season last yeah, year. Yeah, but that's like the Edmonton Oilers used to do. No, no, everyone's everybody's Thomas playing loosey goosey. I, I, hey, so if you're if you're the Nashville Predators, you bring in these wily veterans. Like you know, you mentioned Ryan O'Reilly. You got Luke Shen in there as a little bit of protection. I think their top four defense are are very respectable. I think that their goaltending is respectable. And you just really need to hope some of these young guys they have in the lineup. Because you look up and down as far as their forward group, there's a shit ton of young guys. you got to hope about three or four of them pop and really set to, to become a good, good, solid NHLers. But other than that, boys, they're, they're not making playoffs and they're very, very thin up front. I guess you're right. If a couple young guys that a lot of people don't know a ton about, even including us, like if they pop off, who knows what happens? And I think an offensive coach could make a huge difference, but you can't rely on something like that. And and even some things I read, like the the Novak, he could take a step back because if you look at underlying numbers, they're not great. But it's just kind of one of those teams where you're just like, ah, yeah, I love Saros kicking and Yossi's a top defenseman. But other than that, it doesn't excite me when their games are on TV. I hate to say it. Merles, what do you got on in Nashville? Yeah, no, no playoffs for me. But again, look at the home games. We saw what Nashville did to us. It's very, <laughs> very easy to have that extra beer. Then all of a sudden you have an extra one. Yeah, so. going in there, taking them, taking them lightly. So okay, you know what we should mention? Cody, Cody Glass. Glass. Yeah, Cody he's awesome. Glass. He's going to get a chance to play possible first line minutes because if O'Reilly starts off as the first line center, maybe Glass just busts through, no pun intended, and 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 forces himself into first line minutes. High pick, I think sixth overall. Hopefully, that's a guy that could take a huge step. That's somebody who maybe he turns into a stud and could get this team much higher than we anticipate them being. 
But it's just a lot of question marks going in. Tommy Novak, uh, he's 14th in points per 60 minutes at five on five play. It's pretty good for a young kid like that. And, and Saros, he had 63 starts last year, led the NHL goalies in minutes, shots against, and saves. He's got two years left at five million per 130 starts the last two seasons. That's a lot. I don't know if Kevin Lankinen is going to get a few more starts this year. But honestly, man, the new coach, the low expectations, I think they're going to surprise people. And I do see Nashville. Getting one of the spots in this division. Wow, so I do you got to make them wow. fucking yeah. playoffs. I, I think you're out of your fucking mind. How much oh, you want to bet? That's, that's, that's nothing new shit. here, does, but yeah, wow. I, I don't know. I think I think people are kind of underestimating them. Uh, obviously, I'm a big Saros guy, but nobody else hasn't been correct. The Mundo. No, do we got a wager like there. Did I hear a wager? With, yeah, I'd like to make a side bet that the uh, the Coyotes finish with more points than them. Ooh. All right, have your guy call my guy. We'll get to okay. It a bit deal. Uh, I'll, but, have to, I'll have to think of the odds though. But one other thing, too, if they are out of the race early in, uh, say, 2024, new GM Barry Trotz, would he part with a guy like like Saros? I mean, like, uh, like I said, two years left. Yossi's got five years left at $9 million. I mean, if they're looking at this rebuild stage, will either one of these guys want to look to go elsewhere or what? Biz. So you're looking at them kind of like the Winnipeg Jets, right? You have these two huge – I don't think they're moving on from Yossi. I think he's staying there. He's you know he's the captain, the leadership. He's going to be able to – to help these young guys out. But yeah, I mean, if, if the goaltending market come deadline time is, is that hungry and I, and, and I don't know what his contract situation is, but I think he's got a pretty good AAV as well. He's probably, he's probably in that Gibson range. Sa so Saros, looks, two yeah, year, I'm sorry, two years left at 5 million per. Excuse yeah. Me. That's a, I mean, that's a good bargain for getting a, an elite goaltender. So between him, Hellebuck and, uh, and Gibson, yeah, there's some, there's some healthy goaltenders out there for teams who should look to part ways and, and, and build for the future. Well, they're not going to because they'll be in the playoff hunt. Uh, next up, <laughs> Colorado Avalanche, 109 points last year. They were first in the Central, seventh out of 32 teams, but they got bounced. Huge upset uh, the first round. Seattle beat them in seven great, seven games, hell of a series. Uh, Colorado is 10 to 1 this year to win the Cup. Uh, of course, they're not going to have Ryan, uh, I'm sorry, Gabriel Landeskog for the uh, regular season. He might be back for the playoffs, but they did bring in Ryan Johansson via trade, uh, Ross Colton via trade, Thomas Tata, uh, Jonathan Drouin, Miles Wood, and Chris Wagner. Uh, so long to JT Confa, Evan Rodriguez, Alex Newhook, Matt Nieto, Eric Johnson, Lazella, Dennis Morgan, Keith Kincaid. A lot of guys they said goodbye to. They are over the cap right now, but with Landis Scoggs' injury, that'll take them underneath like they need to be. Uh, but, Biz, let's go to you first on Colorado. Are they going to get back right in the playoffs? Is, was that last year just an aberration? They won the Cup the previous well, year before. Yeah, and, and they dealt with a, a few injuries. And then, of course, that Nachushkin thing. I don't think we ever got an answer what happened there. But you saw he what back? he... back? Yeah, he's yeah he's back. He was he was posting on Instagram with like an AK forty seven doing Russian shit as the Russians do, uh, but they got him back. Uh, at, going back to last playoffs, like they were a one trick pony up front, right? They kept leading with the ace of spades and that McKinnon line who were buzzing and keeping him in that series. But you know Seattle was just too deep and they took care of business. Uh, I think their goaltending solid. I think that we can all agree as far as the Western Conference is concerned, uh, maybe other than Vegas, they got the best top five defensemen. I mean, Gerard's a water bug out there. Wait, I could see that face you're making. You're not liking it with Devon Taves I think and Makar. I think their D their their D's the best D in the league. Really? Okay. Well, yeah. I guess if you if you consider Makar, I mean, I really like the depth of what of what Vegas has going, but they're I strong like in that position. And then and then as far as their their forward group, I mean, I think the second line center role is really what hurt them, right? They lost Kadri from the Stanley Cup year. I think that they felt that Newhook was going to be able to step in at the beginning of last year and make an impact. He never really got settled in that position, and they got exposed in in that spot. So um, I would imagine that McKinnon's got him on a diet and a good training routine because Johansson, I don't think, is really known for his off fights habits. But with the pressure coming in and their pressure to succeed and get back to their winning ways, I think that he's going to have a monster year in that role. And it's definitely an upgrade from what they had last year. So I like their depth up front. I think that they're more than likely going to win that division. And uh, they're going to be they're, they're they're a top five cup cup contender, in my opinion. I think they're going to be incredible this year. I think Johansson's going to light it up. Um, a lot to prove. A lot of a lot of naysayers. A lot of shit been talked about him. So if, if if he's like as proud as I think, and he's going somewhere where the leaders expect a lot, and McKinnon's expecting a lot of his teammates, I think he has a monster season. And I mean, they lose JT Confer. Like if you can go back to Johansson's twenty one twenty two season, and he can do that again, that's a lot more offensive production than Confer's ever had. Or could or could pull off, and and McCarr is 
he's a true game breaker. Like if you have this guy and he stays healthy, I mean, think of the injuries they had last year. They battled without McKinnon for a long yeah. time. I think McKinnon had 70 points in his last 40 games of the season. Yeah, he's coming the back last pissed off. I mean, dude, they, they they win the Stanley Cup and then lose first round, and we know how psychotic Nathan McKinnon is. You don't think he's going to be possessed this year? Yeah. And and so I, I think that they're going to light it up. I have them winning the division. I don't think it's going to be easy. I, I love Dallas, too. I mean, this, this division is... There's no other division where there's three teams that much better than everyone else, in, in my mind. So they're going to be right there. I think Johansson has a huge season. And what if somehow Jonathan Drewen finds some sort he of will. connection with his old Halifax Moosehead yep. teammate McKinnon? I mean, it's been a tough go, right? He's battled d- different kind of me- mental stuff. He's lost his game, his confidence. So it would be a pretty cool story, personally. I think if he went over and played with McKinnon and had a great year, looking back at his at when he was drafted and what people thought he could become and how it's gone since, I mean, a, it would be a great story around the league. I think if he went and lit it up. So I, I think the Avs are going to have a monster season, and I think McKinnon's going to be right there for MVP with McDavid. Jared Bednar has been very, very high on Jonathan Drouin this preseason. So I think that's something to know. He's been getting a lot of power play time as well. So wait, I'm right there with you. I think Jonathan Drouin might have a breakout year. Yeah, And we know what we're getting from Ronton. And this reeks of Landeskog coming back for playoffs, the old LTR oh, yeah. special. Like and they're just Sting dropping out of the sky. Oh, like yeah. The, the Kucherov. We time. know like, it's <laughs> happening. We know it's all happening. Yeah. Uh, uh, Bedsy, his eighth season uh, makes him the third longest tenured coach after Coop, then Sully. Uh, Merles, what do you got on uh, Avalanche? Probably in the playoffs, but uh, what do you have to add to the discussion here, my friend? The jersey, the original 29, is freshly <laughs> <Shocker>. washed, <laughs> ready for a big season. I, you guys stole all my notes. I think you guys are in and reading my blogs before I publish them. I love the Avs. They're back. Makar, McKinnon. Division champs, plus 150. I'm definitely taking that. I'll have that bet going all year. I, I love the Avs. You guys said it all. They got two of the top 10 D in the whole league. Maybe even top five in the whole league, so... They're great. Speaking of that, Taves, UFA after this season, he's making 4.1 mil. Will the Avs be able to re-sign him on Merrill's or what? Yeah, what I mean, Joe pay. Sackick's been a, a magician behind the, what would you call the GM? Behind the desk? He's behind the desk. He's pulled unreal moves. Behind I think he curtain. gets it done. I think Taves takes a little less to stay there and play, keep playing with that group. And he's made enough money, make a little less there, live in Denver, play on winning teams the rest of his career. I think he gets it done. All right, boys. Uh, I think we'll take a little break here. It might be time for the Terry Ryan comedy hour. What do you say we send it over to our buddy T.I. right about now? And uh, we'll see you right after. What's up, guys? This interview is brought to you by our great friends at Chevy. Chevy is working to make charging simple. With over 110,000 charging stations across the U.S. and Canada and growing, Chevy is the go-to electric car on the market. Looking for a co-pilot? Look no further than your smartphone. When using the My Chevrolet mobile app with Energy Assist, the app allows you to access vehicle information like battery status and charging settings from anywhere. The Energy Assist feature intelligently plans your routes, tells you where and how long to charge up, and gives you real-time data about charging station availability. There are three different home charging levels available. Chevy electric vehicles offer great options for charging, all of them as simple as plugging in your smartphone. Learn more at chevy.com slash electric. That's chevy.com slash electric. Now, to the interview we go. All right, it's great to welcome back one of our great pals. I believe he might have the record for appearances now, as this will be his fifth time on the pod. He's a street hockey world champion, a renowned thespian you know as Ted Hitchcock on Shorzy, one of the most colorful and inquisitive people in the hockey world. It's so great to bring back the Newfoundland legend himself. Newfoundland legends himself to the Spit and Chicklets podcast. Uncle T, Terry Ryan, how the F are you, pal? Terry! Thanks, boys. It's great to be back. It's been a while, but uh, we're all doing pretty well. You guys are doing awesome, and we're on the verge of another hockey season, and I just love it. September is signals the end of summer, so less relaxation in a way, but it's so exciting for so many reasons. Are you and Senior licking your chops for Chicklets Cup, or what? What's going on over there? Yeah, yeah, we're pretty pumped. And uh, <laughs> a, a few of the boys, we got uh, Bish, you know, I'm coming back. He, Bish oh. was on that team that we just won the world championship. Congrats, he's by the way. Mutant. Yeah, yeah, he's a beauty. He's really looking forward to it. All the guys I got are, are so excited. And, you know, it's 
it's we're going to see each other and everything, but it's nice to get the competitive juices flowing. There's only so many opportunities to do that. The the older we get, you know, so this is exciting. So do you worry about the same thing I do and the fact that if Nose Face beats you guys again, it's like, oh. I don't care how many world championships you have. That's just, <laughs> it's like, this friggin' guy has to go down. He has to go down. We can't, what's that movie? We, it's like Jesse Pinkman. We can't let him keep getting away with this. <laughs> yeah, I know. I hear you. And I, last time he kind of latched on to one of the teams that I helped create. What's going to happen this yeah, time? Yeah, he did. Who's he? What, what happened last time? Now, now look. I get it. Nose face is pretty good, and we got to do it. When push comes to shove, we lost. But that's what kind of irked me, because I called my buddy Chicky Mentos before it started last time, and I said, look, you guys put to, put together a team, too. We're going to use some of these guys off the Canadian national team, and either our team or you team will take your team will take them down. And home and behold, Nose face joins them before the final day. But he still did it. We lost. Yeah, he, he won. won. He won. So, he won. So By we the way, get back. that guy, Chicky, you, you and him, yeah. That was some nasty battling going on. Yeah, that you guys are going back team. and forth. You guys have been playing tummy sticks ever since, though. I saw that you posted a couple photos with him at the, the World Championships, <laughs> yeah. which actually took place in Buffalo at Riverworks. Was that already really? in the... Yeah, they like, had it there. Was no, that already was confirmed, or, or did they kind of see our tournament there and say, this is the perfect place to have it? I'm not sure, but I know that a lot of ball hockey USA goes through there, and they okay. got a big yeah right they they got a big following. So I think it might have been it might have helped a little bit. Someone be persuaded, maybe, but that's pretty much a nucleus of USA ball hockey. So so uh, tr, uh, I was reading and correct me if I'm wrong. You guys won in a shootout. You won the gold medal in a shootout, and in overtime, you actually took a penalty. I, uh, I, uh, and not only that, I hit Hauser, our, our buddy Bobby Hauser. Yeah. I, I had tendonitis in my wrist and I went, I was back checking on him. First of all, we were up three to one with three Quit minutes. tugging left. it off too much. Yeah, it could have been part of it. <laughs> part of it, definitely, <laughs> possibly. We were up three to one with, with, uh, they scored with two minutes and 35 seconds left with the goalie pulled, and then they scored again with 50 oh seconds my left. God. I thought it's over. And they took over the game in USA and they, and they just had, um, it was like Bill's Mafia Day, so like there was a lot of red, white, and blue, and people were around real. Oh, the USA are playing, and they came in, and there was a lot of fans, and um, it was uh, it was Bobby Hauser. So he was he had a great tournament, by the way, an all star. He played awesome, and I was back checking He's on sick. him. I went to raise my my stick, like transfer it from one side of my body to the other, and I kind of gave out halfway through. It chopped him over the head. I'm in the box. I went in hey, thinking, panicking, right? panicking right oh. and there's you know a lot of guys haven't won one you get a nice ring for it and everything there's a lot on the line here well i mean it's a world championship enough said i'm yeah. in the box going oh god like just if they score i'm gonna jump in the river and i'm never coming back <laughs> <laughs> and yeah it just so happened not only not only did they not score we ended up having a breakaway with about five seconds left in the in the uh, penalty and they took a penalty so now we're on the power play we don't get it done. And in ball hockey, guys, the only real big difference is that when you gain the blue line, you can bring it back to the red line. So a power play is much more lethal. You get a guy like Pender back there taking oh, a slap yeah, shot of a move. The right? and you get someone in front that's strong. It, you know, there's just it, the percentages are like 50% is a good power play, okay? A little bit different than ice hockey. So Pender is Matias Kind of like the Oilers. The, he's he's yeah, Ekholm. I, He's one of the best in the world for sure. Yeah, there's and, and yeah. that's been the case for a decade. Uh, he was at this tournament, had another great tournament. Um, but what we have that happened. So then after neither one of us scored, which was odd, they had a penalty shot in overtime. Missed, hit the post. Oh now we go God. into a shootout. And anyway, we won two to one for us, and they missed their very last shot. And uh, we raised the trophy, but it was awesome. And uh, Bobby Hauser and I picked up, I snagged Bobby Hauser's line mate for the last 15 years or more. They've got great chemistry. Danny Schlegel from Buffalo, Team USA. I've played against both of them for years. They've been my arch nemesis. And now we all get to play together. It's wicked. So the big deal selects are stacked going into this one. Do we have the same goalie as last time as well? No, we don't. Evan Mosher had to go to a wedding, so I got Aaron Keela. So what happens, guys, they pick these Team Canada's from the national championship. So about a month before I went to that, uh, we played the national championship here in Canada. And Aaron Keela was the goalie for Brampton Midnight Express, and they won it all. 
great young guy. I don't know him very well. I saw him play. And when we couldn't go with Mosier, I said, you know, I got to jump on something. And if we didn't jump on him, one of those other Ontario teams was going to. So I'm pretty confident in Aaron. And uh, if if need be, we've got a local from Buffalo if he goes down with an injury or anything. So we're set. We're deep. We're deep in goal. And as far as that final game in Buffalo, was it pretty was it packed? Like, was there a lot of fans? Like, what would you say? A thousand people show up for that? Oh, yeah, there was. The, the camera angle, you couldn't really... The, the end of the rink on one side was like outdoors facing the water, and the, there was some people there, but behind, all the way around, yeah. Yeah, that's probably a good bet around there. I'd say 800 to 1,000. It was a nice atmosphere for ball hockey, and, and it was televised, which was awesome, and we ended up being on NHL tonight. It was a nice treat. You know, it's real... It, most of us most of us played ice hockey, and uh, it's, it's an opportunity to really be... Compa- well, to win a world championship... But really, it's competitive out there, Biz. Like there, there's not so much fighting, but for many reasons. But there's hitting, and there's you got not as much gear on, and guys are going real, real hard. There's a lot of sticks, a lot of after the whistle stuff. It's real, real chippy. I got more bruises on my body after ball hockey than ice hockey. Put it that. Well, way. I mean, I think the last time you were on, we were talking about when was it was it Pender who ended up getting like, yeah. would he get suspended from the worlds because he went after the 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 Czech team. And even the referees were being donkeys. And uh, it was even uh, G who told me before we came on, you have a story about this latest world championship with a, with a referee from overseas. Well, uh, uh, it's funny this time. No, Pender, you can check it out. Uh, 2013 world championships. We're right here in St. John's. The only time we've ever hosted it. What are the odds? We had five Newfoundlanders on the team. And uh, anyway, the other team, without getting right into it, they pulled some real and sports night stuff. It was Slovakia. And at the end of the game, they made it 4-1 on an empty net, and a guy spit in my face, and I oh. saw Pender go up the right wing. But I went to tell the reps. They couldn't Usually speak. you like that t- kind of thing, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> gonna pay extra well, for I didn't it. say I didn't like it. Pender saw it, and, you know, I'm going to say, yeah. So, so I, went, I told the referee, I said, you know, there's seven seconds left. Don't, don't drop the ball. And he went, I'm going to put you in the box. He, he didn't speak English very well. He was lost in translation. So I said, fuck it. Drop the ball and see what happens. And he dropped it, and Pender absolutely – murdered this guy from red line right into the <laughs> right into the net and they took the ref out the ref had to go get surgery on his knee you can see it, it justin pender ball hockey 2013 um oh so this time guys were playing portugal now portugal and greece very similar in ball hockey and they're not bad because they're all dual citizenship guys from canada a lot of them played ice hockey some of them played pro very very good players so it's never a pushover against portugal they've won it before so it was two to one and we're on the power play. The guy comes to get it and he kind of trips over my, I, I, I spread my legs, uh, you know, wide and get low to protect the ball. And he kind of hits me and trips over my leg. I go in the box. I don't want to argue it, but I'm like, ah, that's a little cheesy. And anyway, as I'm in the box, one of the kids in there says, hey, you know that no space killer guy? That's his brother. And I went, do I know him? Do I ever? And after the game, I went out. I said, oh, you're carrying a little bit of fucking extra weight there, aren't you, buddy? And he says, he comes over. He says, Terry, I had to call it. I said, no, you didn't, but let's have a beer. Anyway, we got talking. (laughs) Brian is his name. Real, real nice guy. I had no idea. Is he as ugly as nose face? Um, you know, that's all subjective. I'll say that. Yeah. <laughs> DR, I love how, how none the of these eyebrow? penalties are never your fault. Oh, yeah. There's, exactly. there's no, always no, something. They're always bad calls, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had no, noticed that. How it's I like went Crosby. Right mode. Well, yeah, I'm not saying, you know, the, the one in overtime was accidental, but you didn't need to call it, but whatever. It's a penalty. It's a penalty. And we got a ring after it all. It's good. The life surges on in a positive direction win or lose but we happen to win that one and now we got some chicklets cup action and i'm excited who was the, who was the most banged up in the celebration besides senior wait at at the worlds oh yes. senior probably didn't go did he senior wasn't at the worlds oh, no. was the his wife only gives him the green light for chicklets cup <laughs> guys usually yeah. he's only allowed to drink on fridays it's it <laughs> only fridays and he came up here last friday i don't know if you guys saw i think i tag you once in a while and keep you i up saw it I so was we watching. were here watching, and she came up at 11 on the nose. Usually we go to his place, but it was fr- came up. No, he's not doing it, Terry. It's happened too many times. We've been burned. He came home, guys. He came home after being here one night, and he was hungry. So she had a note there or whatever, whatever it was for the next day because she was going to be gone to see her friend on Bell Island. So he said, put the red pot in the oven. The roast is in the fridge, okay? So he comes home drunk, and he takes, remember the wok? Like, the, the, yeah. The, oh, yeah. It's not as popular now, but there used to be. So he puts, the red The red wok is sitting there 
with plastic handles on it, though. You know, the walk you plug in. So the plug. So, the, so he takes it, puts it in that and shoves it in the oven. I go down. The, he it's cool in the house. Oh, oh he's down. God. Honestly, you think I'm kidding. he's downstairs. He loves Looney Tunes. He's this is a guy with four <laughs> degrees. Okay, He's watching. I was with my buddy. My buddy Dave Roper was with me. He's watching. Looney Tunes, Yosemite Sam, and he's cracking up, and there, there's smoke upstairs. You can't see. I don't know how he didn't pick it up. Anyway, a place would have burned down. So she's, uh, and for other reasons as well, she's like, only Fridays, and he's stopping drinking when I say so. Now, the odd time, guys, the odd time. George Street Festival were here. He loves Third Eye Blind. One of the guys sent me a note. Big fan of Chicklets. Big fan of Shorzy. Says you want to meet us afterwards. Perfect. That was on like a Thursday. He got the okay for that one. But the Chicklets Cup is generally the only time that he will drink multiple. It's his Super Bowl. Year. It's his for sure. That's a great way to put it. He loves it too. I can't wait to hear the same stories for the thousandth time. Like I've never been yeah, more excited. Yeah, but I love to hear hearing them. Busy. Oh, I love I, them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, tell me that one again. I have it memorized. I just need to hear it. Hear him. Give me a little more salt and pepper on that one. <laughs> it's amazing, guys. That's and it's constant. That's why, like, it's become a thing in Mount Pearl. It's like a rite of passage. If you're a hockey player and you get to a certain age, you go down and you have a beer with Senior in his basement. Uh, tonight being Friday, so I told you, every weekend I go Friday or Saturday. It's kind of a thing for me, too. Um, you know, kind of an exception, but that's what I usually pick. And tomorrow is supposed to be a great day, 20-odd degrees, one of the last nice days. So I'm going to pick tomorrow, go down early, go on a patio, meet some of the boys, and go out from there. But tonight... I'll just stay here with my daughter. We're watching a movie or whatever we're doing. And definitely some of the boys will drop in. It's Friday. People drop in to see Terry Ryan Sr. And uh, more often than not, it's, uh, it ends with a phone call from my mom. And it's time for, the, for your boys to go home now, Terry. What's the rule every year where on the last day of George Street Fest, if it's like sunny or something, they, they open up the regatta the next day. So then you guys get like another day off from work where it's like a, it's like an unwritten rule where all businesses in town are shut down, even though it's a work day. You, you got a great memory, by the way. So the George Street Festival is seven days, I suppose, eight counting regatta day. Right in a row, three bands a day, okay? So they start at like five o'clock and they go off at 11. So it might be, I don't know, a local band. Then um, someone, let's say the Arkells, Canadian band, pretty big. And that might finish with uh, Third Eye Blind like that. It's usually a buildup. And that's each night. So the last night being the Tuesday, um, I guess, yeah, Tuesday to Tuesday. So on the Wednesday, first Wednesday of every August is this Royal St. John's Regatta. It's the oldest sport, continuous sporting event in all of North America. So it's a bit of fun. You go down and surround a pond, Kitty Vitty Lake. I don't know how many people, guys, 50, 60,000 is a lot of tourists. It's a big day. But the weather has to be, if, if the weather's good and the regatta goes ahead, it's a, everybody's off. But if not, nobody's off. Oh. So you, the night before, as it go, you know, you're always in a bit of a good mood. This year, it's semi charm, or sorry, Third Eye Blinder playing. So, you know, there was a good vibe, and this year it did go ahead. But I'd say it's about 7 out of 10. It often doesn't go ahead, and it makes for a terrible work day for everybody else. Because la last year, Con Man was texting me about it, and it didn't go down, and everybody's like full-on depression mode because they've been partying for seven days, <laughs> I, hoping they get the eighth, and then when it doesn't go down, the the booze blues hits you like a sack of bricks, doesn't it? <laughs> I, left it? I left Connor. I said, don't worry, I got to work too. Don't worry, I got to work too. <laughs> I left him at 5 a.m., and then he looks over, he said, geez, I got to go to work in four hours. I'm like, yeah, I can do my podcast whenever. I'll probably do it in the evening. <laughs> Have a nice night. Oh, it's, it, it's it was like torture, little yeah. kids when you're hoping that it's going to snow the next day and you're just waiting for the snow to start and the school to get canceled. But it just so happens to be 50,000 drunks in, in Newfoundland. I can't say it correctly, but uh, <laughs> um, what was I going to say? I had a question about that whole festival. Oh, it'll um, come back to me. Sorry about that. Oh, I, I was... Uh, okay, so obviously with the fame of Shorzy and everything, uh, you've probably been getting to notice a little bit more around town. I'm sure there's more girls flying around in your Instagram DMs. you got to tell these boys about the whack sack. What one? The whack tent. Oh, God. <laughs> the tent. The tent. I call it the whack sack because you, you carry it around in your... In your uh, well, your nap knapsack? Yeah, I mean, it's been no. I mean, I've I've got a. I live my backyard is a is right on a trail, but it used to be the uh, 
the train track, you know, the cross Canada train track. We had it here. I mean, obviously, but we took it out and everywhere else I think still has some track down, but we don't. So it became a trail that goes all the way through Newfoundland. So I live in Mount Prom, about 15 minutes from downtown on the way. There's a couple of nice parks, little ponds, rivers, whatever. So, yeah, I mean, um, so I often go out on my bike and I take I have a tent that like works like a backpack. It's just a pop up tent. So you just take it out and you just you unzip and it just bursts up into a tent. So often if uh, you know, if I want to have a drink and maybe a maybe a meal, maybe sometimes, you know, you can invite a girl out for dinner, but sometimes maybe say, you know what, let's go down by the pond or the river or whatever it might be let's make our own we'll have a little bit of you know it's something different you get the charcuterie out (laughs) well whatever it might be you know whatever they're into i mean the lunchables tanya you can be my meal don't you worry let me unpack my tent (laughs) the boys call it my fuck tent but that's it's really not a (laughs) it's not a fuck tent it's gotten out there now this you know i've i've used it on occasion to be um cordial and uh to be cordial to have a, a a nice setting next to a river, usually, usually it's a nice young lady. Sometimes my buddies and I might go fishing, but because of the date aspect of it, it's been uh, my buddies now refer to it as the fuck tent. So I, I wouldn't go that far, but things might have happened. In You'll there. just be in like a local park in St. John's, just whacking away in this small tent. Well, I. <laughs> Uh, What's going yeah, on I in mean, there, Dad? Yeah. I don't know, son. I Could be a couple buffalo. There's no way that I can sugarcoat this. That it's not going it, it, to. It's it's um, people aren't going to be tent. shitting all over me for the fuck tent. But you know, whatever it might be, I haven't put it this way. A lot of people enjoy the fuck tent, okay? And my buddies, like I said, we use it for many occasions. It's not just a fuck tent. It has been a fuck tent a couple of times in the past. So I guess its legacy lives on as the fuck tent. You should you should um, brand that. You should be selling these at Canadian Tire all across Canada, where I it's just this easy work. pop up. Comes with a with a twelve pack of rubbers. Well, I know you don't use them, but maybe the the younger kids who are listening will. <laughs> he goes uh, to open the tent. It's all crusted together. He's like, shit, <laughs> this thing's supposed to pop right open. <laughs> <laughs> Well, See, I, Peter loves the idea. I love how your business mind works too, Biz, right away, because <laughs> it is a good idea. Oh, but. that's an easy that's an easy sell right there. Get you a discount code for some big deal brews as well. But hey, we, I, I know we mentioned it briefly before the fuck tent, but buddy, you got to be like loving life with how, how much shores he's popped off. And all right, I can hand it over to you. This is your co-star here. I know you guys rub elbows. You, you get your own trailer when you go, R.A.? Right? Uh, not a whole trailer, but yeah, they give you like basically a room in a trailer, right? He probably gets something much bigger than I do because he's a legit star. And by the way, it, uh, up in Canada on Crave, it drops this Friday, season two. Very excited about it. Uh, October, I'm sorry, yeah, October 27th on Hulu down here. T, you fight up about the season. You obviously saw much more of the scripts than I did. Uh, is it going to be as good as the first one, you think, or what? I see that this is the thing. I think so. Now, there's a couple of reasons. The first season we did, I didn't really have context in my mind. I like Letter Kenny, so I was even trying to do my lines like Letter Kenny. Jared kept saying, "Look, just be natural here." I, I would kind of, you know, because my lines get dissected into be Newfoundlandese at the end, right? So I, I always run them by him. He gives them to me. I run them back to him, like a Newfoundlander would say it. So he's like, "Just do that," and he was kind of coaching me through. But I don't think we all got the humor right away because we didn't see the direction after we saw the first episode, or sorry, the first season, and we shoot it out of order. Right. So the context yeah. is lost. After I saw the first season, I'm like, OK, this is what he wants. I get it. There's more of a there's more of a linear story. There's more of a heart to Shorzy than any character on Letterkenny. It's just a different show. So going back to do the second season was a lot different. And the guys look, I was the only one of the, the main hockey actors anyway that had ever. Re- I, I was in the acting union. I was already a, working on crew for six or seven years and I did the odd stunt. I mean, the other guys couldn't read a call sheet at the start. So they were real rookies. So now I could really tell, you know, there it, there'd been a year and a half go by and a lot of them had, had honed their craft. They'd done some, one thing or another, might be a commercial, might be a short movie, but they'd all acted to some degree and we knew what was coming. So this time was much harder for me anyway to get through the scenes without laughing because I, I it, there was way more context to the humor. Uh, do I think it's going to be good, R.A.? I really do. I really do. I can I can say that if, if you like the first season, I think people will uh, those who like the first season will definitely like the second. And it's really exciting. There's a lot of buzz coming from it. Um, the NHL alumni, for example, at the start, I'm sure they didn't really know what was happening, but I've done a lot of events since. So we did a, an event in Moncton. OK, 
and it's Hockey Heroes event. There was uh, Jeremy Roenick, God, Denny Savard, Andrew Shaw. I go down the list. There was like 20 of us. Uh, Tessa Bonham, a lot, a lot of uh, famous uh, female players that are, um, you know, legends for, for one reason or another. And so it was humbling just to be there. What they do is whoever raises the most money for the year, they get to pick first. So this group, you know, and it goes right down to there's 20 teams, 20 celebrities. For this is for like an ice hockey tournament? Yeah, it's for we're raising money for Heart and Stroke Foundation. Awesome. Right? So we do. I do a lot of those alumni things now. And before it wasn't really, you know, I had a book out, eight games. It was like, well, you know, first rounder. I was relevant, but I was right on the precipice. You know, I get it. You're kind of doing me a favor to have me around. But after Shorzy and Chicklets to some degree, I went first. JR couldn't believe it. He looked over. He said, who the fuck are you? And I, <laughs> I, went over, I gave him a book. I go, I don't know. I'm going to do It's much easier. It's, it's quicker if you read the book. <laughs> anyway, yeah, the way that you tell <laughs> stories. Yeah. <laughs> fucking I mean, choose your off. Up, all these guys, Brad, May, freaking, uh, I can go. There was, there was so many uh, uh, Ally Afraidy legends. So does that, he still have the skullet? Uh, no, but he's he still likes to party and he shuts it down, man. Like did that, you did you ever ask him about that quote after game about the the like uh, oh like why don't you score on the empty net goal and he's like because empty net goal are for f bombs. <laughs> did you ever yeah, see yeah, that he, quote? I <laughs> like, forgot about If you that, said it I, nowadays, you'd be canceled. But he did it in like the seventies. Well, he was probably smoking what, yeah, a yeah, cigarette yeah. in the room while he said it too. Yeah, it's, he's smoking darts. I yeah, that guy is wild. His stories are are uh, you know there's certain people that their stories like transcend the game. Like he's almost like the more you talk to him, he's like Davy Crockett. Yeah. Like I'm like, what? <laughs> like everything from, from the way he was played midget. He didn't really know. And then he went over, you know, it was, I think Detroit little Caesars or one of those teams. Then he moved to Toronto for a little bit and like just became a first round and ends up playing right away in the NHL. Uh, loved the skullet smoking darts the whole time. Um, just e everything. He's a real, he's, so he uh, still has the skullet. No, no, but he's oh, okay. He's still well. I'll tell you this: We were playing in Twillingate, Newfoundland, one of these alumni games. Um, just last, uh, it was Wendell Clark and Friends. This one, I, I'd go in like three or four iterations of these alumni tours, and uh, it was Wendell Clark and Friends. So, Ron Duguay, Darren Langdon. This is great. I drove across Newfoundland with Langer and Ron Duguay, hearing stories. I hadn't met Duguay before, but we get there, and this team from Twillingate was pretty fired up. I've been to Twillingate lots. I mean, it's a uh, it's a Newfoundland community that's steeped in tradition when it comes to hockey. And anyway, but we played locally, and this place was sold out, and they're there to see the local guys who are pretty good. Like a few of them had left and, and played in the queue and stuff. Like they were enough that, you know, and a lot of these guys are older. Rick Vive was on our team. Guys who can snipe but are in their 60s. So I'm convinced a lot of the time, you know, it's why I get invited to so many because I can still kind of carry the mail. I mean, I'm in my 40s. I'm in good shape. And a lot of them, like the absolute legends that go on these things, like I said, are in their 60s. So guys coming across and he scores this goal. And like there's guys playing with no helmets, half the team. So to take a slapper from in close, like up high to glove side, the, it's really kind of frowned upon. It's kind of stupid. I don't even know why you would do it. But anyway, this guy did it. And then he scored a little bit later and like celebrated. So later in the game, he's coming across the middle, and Al Iafrady sees him <laughs> around the bench, and Duguay, hit, Duguay grabs me, and he's like, he's going to hit him. He's going to hit him. <laughs> Boom! He wallpapered him. I couldn't believe it. It was like Scott Stevens in the in the 90s. He did exactly that. And we're like, no fucking way. Like, Al, Al made business. And he went over, and he just he shook his hand at the guy, and he said, you know, you know. And then we went out after, man. We had beers with him, but I'm like, this is a charity alumni game. <laughs> and Al doesn't give a shit. But what I love about him and Wendell and Ron and generally the people Wendell invites, these guys go in. They make their money, right? You can tell. You go to some of these events, I don't know, in Toronto, there's lots of them. And, you know, some people are there. They, they're there to get their check, say hi, sign a few autographs and leave. Those guys shut her down. We went the th three places and three nights on that particular tour. And each time, Wendell, Al, they really know that the locals want to hear the stories. That's why they're there. And they shut it down. The people always put off. We, we, we went down to the local legion in Twillingate after that. And a lot of people bring out their food that they might have made. A couple for of us, right? eggs, hot puri, yeah, booze. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, all the divorced women in town, and some of the not divorced, whatever it would be. <laughs> the old fuck uh, tent. It, it's a big. Uh, yeah, you're not going to quit on that, and I'm going to get shit forever. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so Al is that guy. Like he's he's he'll call you out, 
And and he often does with me if I, if I start telling stories and he sees one fragment of exaggeration, uh, he'll call me out on it. We have a little bit of fun with it, but we'll always get up and sing a song or whatever. But Ally Afraid, he's one of those, like he's not just in it for the money or the, the glory or any of that. He just enjoys meeting people. And like myself, he's happy to be, he's proud of, to, to be part of the hockey community. And he's still like a fan, if you can believe that. But Listen to him. For, I don't know if you've um, had him the, These oh, old guys are a different breed. Uh, so we had Rick Vive on, and I don't know I how many that. people noticed if they watched the YouTube version, but this guy, in the midst of the interview, pulls his hammer out and pisses in a water bottle. We're all <laughs> we're all like texting each other, like, is he hosing right now? Did we, <laughs> keep that, did we keep that in there? He was telling a story as he was doing it, too. <laughs> he whips his hog out, oh. puts it down the Gatorade nozzle, and just fucking hoses in the midst of telling a story. Like, Rick, we could have taken... Taking a quick pee break, <laughs> Frank Drebin style. What a <laughs> legend! He's. I say Matthews is the gloat, the greatest leaf of all time. He re, he got the title back after he whipped his hose out and fucking went, went on our pod. You know what's funny? Just side note: like he he had the most goals until Matthews, right? Yeah. And, but he's. I don't think he's like honored, and he's is he on that leaps? I don't think he is. I don't think he's honored like by the league. Well, he had like kind of a tough like exit from there and stuff, but he was a great guy. And then he talked about what things he did wrong. He basically was like, I shouldn't have been given the captaincy when he when I was. I wasn't, you know, mature enough and things like that. And I wasn't necessarily approaching off ice the way I should have. But I think they've made amends in, in a sense. He was talking about, you know, he, he gets to sit in the alumni box for playoff games. I think there was like a lottery for that stuff. So I definitely didn't know how successful of a leaf he was until I looked into research for him before the interview. I was kind of surprised that he had some monster seasons. Oh, and then yeah. was, was kind of out of the league pr- pretty quickly after some. Oh, know, some back then, if like seasons. ownership or, or a coach held a grudge, you were done. Oh. Especially you get, you valid. get Babcocked in like fucking three seconds. Um, <laughs> hey, he, he he also told this story, Terry, uh, where apparently, like when he, when Brendan Shanahan was younger, he tried to get an autograph from him. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And and I, yeah. he he says he's like, I would never treat someone like that or, or pigeon toss a kid. But Brendan Shanahan remembered and fucking first shift against him, he went after him and dummied him. <laughs> That's yeah, just really, how spiteful Shanahan is. In now. Yeah, yeah. I remember, I listened to that. It was just. Uh, yeah, it was about seven or eight months ago, right? Um, yeah. an, another thing too is is uh, you obviously with the acting stuff you were doing beforehand, and you were mm. also doing uh, stuntman work. Yeah, it, that so, opened up so the you're doors. still you're still doing that because I texted you the other day mm. and you said you'd got a last minute gig and you couldn't do a phone call about Chicklets Cup. Like what what's what's it like being a stuntman? Well, I just got the opportunity to be honest. Like I said, Jason Momoa got me in there, but it was more to do with once you're in the union, you're in it though, right? But my my there's no expertise, but my experience would be in fighting. For example, if I'm going to throw a punch like the camera, you, there's a place you can p- place the camera behind you and with the lighting that you know, you can miss me by a foot, but if you time it right, you know, you can you can sell it. So it's that. It's it's like going down how to sell a fall, all those things. Like that's kind of how I learned. But once you're in there, you're in there. The one the other day was unique. So I'm around here. There's a lot of things going on. A couple of regular shows that are huge in Canada, Hudson and Rex and Son of a Critch. And then there's there's people that like there's a lot of students here doing short movies. There's a, there's um, a lot of independent people come here. We give uh, a great tax credit to anybody that comes and shoots. I mean, we realize it's part of our economy. We lost our fishery years ago and that's bouncing back. But but film is through the roof. So I happen to be decent timing with all this. I got lucky with something that's really relevant in the place I live. So being in the union, having some experience, I'll often get called. So the other day, uh, it was like the day before. I don't know what happened if someone couldn't, if, if, the, if the original guy couldn't get in to do the stunt or it fell through or he backed out. But I had to get, get like, ex- I had to, there was an explosion. I got like it literally blown out of a building. So, I mean, they put a harness on me attached to a crane, right? So I got to time it right. And you get really only one shot for the big one, right? We did it a few times. I practiced it, but the timing has to be great. And you really got to know how to do this. And you got to have the balls to do it without flinching, right? That That's often the hard part because, you know, I and again, I'm doing the stunt for somebody else. I had to wear, you know, I'd look like them, wear what they were wearing, put on a wig, all that stuff. There's often like stunts, they might need a role and it requires a stunt. And I'm, you know, just like Shorzy or whatever, right? But this place, uh, you know, there's opportunity now, 
for me to do those kind of things, like stunt double, I guess, for lack of a better way to put it. So, yeah, I never know what's going to happen. I might get the call two days before. It might be an explosion. It might be a fall. It might be a fight. It might be a body check. I mean, I've done some hockey stuff, but I'm still really adding to my resume. And, guys, at this point, you know, what am I going to be when I grow up? I think it's I'm going to be in the film industry for good one way or the other. So I'm doing a lot more writing, and I'm trying to do as many stunts as I can because someday Shorzy will be over, right? And um, I'm still going to have to have a, a paycheck, so that's why I'm building up my podcast. I got some merch coming out, Tales with Tiara merch. Just a couple of years behind you guys. And your bag hey, licking the your bag like, licking the Oilers, just like Wit Dog over here. Oh, hey. the, Oilers, the Oilers are a wagon. I could see you though, like right in your agent. Like, if there's any uh, chance that they need a stunt double to have intercourse near a river in a tent, <laughs> I am your guy, dude. I, even I could, have, yeah, I could do Man. it. Imagine a movie comes up, Terry. We think we got a role for you. I see the script, the fuck tent. Wow, <laughs> unbelievable timing. Like, this was written for me. Senior will play himself. And you're like, uh, uh, Dad, you can watch. Just don't make any eye contact with me. <laughs> <laughs> guys, guys, I swear. Yeah, right. Uh, I can tell you something. I, I'll tell you a story when we get down to check, uh, down to Buffalo. Uh, I, I, it's literally so crazy that I couldn't tell it on the air. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'll get you pickled enough so we could, get, we could get the story after. I have a book out. And the hardest part of telling the stories was trying to articulate it in a way that wouldn't be offensive or over the top. And the, some of those stories are about, yeah, getting a blow job from a tran, transgender. Gender, yeah. yeah, that's a, it's a two page uh, book. book. Yeah. There's, there's, you know, the story anything. with Milbury. There's knocking my teeth out with a hammer. Um, there's the, earlier in the book, you know, I went my first game in Detroit. I didn't really play, but I went out after the boys, boys tell me, meet, meet us at BT's, this strip club. I go to BT's. It's, Devil's Night, October 30th in Detroit, oh, where, wow. where Devil's Night started. I don't know any of this. I go out. I'm at BT's. Where's Reesh? Reesh told me to go. There. Where's Reesh? Can't see him. Can't see the boys. I stay. At, I'm at the wrong BT's, the other side of town. I go back. Girl comes down. It's Halloween. She goes, hi, I'm Barbie. She was dressed like Barbie. I said, what a coincidence. I'm Ken. She goes, yeah, you're dressed up, young guy. I said, I play for the Habs. We just played against the Red Wings. She goes, I fucking love the Red Wings. You want to get out of here? We go to her trailer park. I, again, I'm <laughs> not even in the fucking lineup. We're going to San Jose the next day. She breaks out. She goes, here, takes a little, a little uh, bottle. Pours it in the cap, takes a shot. You want some? I go, what's that? She goes, GHB. I don't know. I never heard of it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Never heard of it. I take a shot. The next thing she goes, go in my room. I go in the room. All around the walls, whips, chains. Oh, like, no. All kinds of crazy shit. Oh, no, the shit. good stuff. Then I hear there's, there's speakers in the fucking walls. Then I hear Metallica goes on. It's like, um, oh, God. Uh, uh, Rust, it, no, not Rust Never Sleeps, that's Megadeth. Anyway, I can't remember now, I'm on the spot. It's an early Metallica album, and it comes on, boom, right, the last thing. She walks in and goes, <laughs> bend over. She's got oh. fucking, oh yeah. yeah. I mean, I talk Will about she this throw in a my tongue book. Dart down your ass? What she do? This, this. Well, yeah, she, she, <laughs> she fucked me like a pig, is what she did. <laughs> and I didn't know what to do. She I'm wasn't guys, a flight guys, attendant, was she? Guys, I went from fucking St. John's, from Mount Pearl, Newfoundland, to Quinell, BC, to Tri-Cities. Very raw. I wasn't even in Red Deer yet. Red Deer, at least you could drink in junior. Tri-Cities is like middle of nowhere. 20, I had a lot of fun there. 21 to drink. We weren't even in the bars. Like, this was really, really new. I'm just on the Habs, and now I'm getting fucked in a in a trailer by some girl that calls herself Barbie. She's a stripper. It's devil's night. There's fire everywhere. It's fucking crazy, man. I call a cab. It takes like an hour. I get back. It's like five in the morning. And as I walk in, uh, fuck Mario Chambles. Like they're there, like it, having breakfast. Now we had like three days off. I didn't know what to do, man. And I, I know, I know I get a reputation for partying and having fun, but I really did when I play, I took it serious. Like, we were all going out. I figured it was all good. I, I just was honest. I told the boys exactly what happened, and they laughed, and they made me tell the story on the bus going to the airport. <laughs> oh, that reminds me. We just had Ashram on, and he told the uh, story at the strip club when you ended up uh, busting out the window and down the fire escape, boy, you pussy. You hey, fucking yeah, pussy. <laughs> fucking black aces in the playoffs. We go over to Super Sex. What, uh, just, it was a bad <laughs> idea from, from the very minute it started. Me, him, Jose Theodore, I believe Alan Nazardine and Matt Higgins. And uh, yeah, that's yeah. What he, said. That's the crew. he fucking Theo, punched Theo Kyle, probably man. didn't even have to pay for lap dances. He, 
Oh no, we didn't. No, they exactly paid him right. to give him one. His yeah, dad, yeah. yeah, you know, his dad had hookups there. I mean, I don't know what went down, but that's how we knew those people. So we, well, not the HA, the people at Super Sex. So we were probably all the same. I don't know. We just went in. So anyway, fuck yeah. I mean, I'm telling the story again, but this, I, I haven't heard that episode yet. I listened to most chicklets. I just haven't got caught up yet. Well, we haven't, we haven't, no, we haven't dropped him yeah. yet. He's coming well, out. Guys, you, like he, you could retell it. Out a biker and the guy had I don't know if Ash said the guy had no shirt on just a leather vest and he went like this and he flashed I go Ash that's a fucking gun and Ash goes, right. I don't care Noof just keeps drinking on his beer I go what we go sit down we go sit down the bouncer comes over and he says boys these guys want to have their way with you and I told them who you are and they don't care so I said well thanks a lot for telling who I, and I looked at the boys. I said, you know, I love you guys. I've proven enough un, enough over the last three years. I'll fight for you. I'll do. I'll go to the coach. I'll take rap for you. I won't be a rat. I'm a good teammate. But I'm also going to go in and take a piss. And there's a fire escape. And I'm jumping out the fucking fire escape. And I'm running back to the fucking Shadow Champlain. I love you guys. You all have an option. I have an option. Adios. Sure enough, he fucking shows up at like two thirty, eating like a Burger King burger. No big deal. I go, what happened? He goes, well, I called my brother who's in jail in Winnipeg, right? That has connections with, I don't know, the rock machine or one of these gangs. And uh, he made a phone call and we're all good. Boys, I don't know if Ash told you the last part. We fucking go to the rink the next day. I don't know what Ash has said to them, but he cut a deal. So the boys show up. I guess he promised them that they could come into the room or whatever. It looks so bad. We're walking in, you know, all the autograph seekers are there. So everybody like got to slow down. And it's like three people in a row, like Jocelyn Thibault, Stefan Quintal, Vincent Tamfus. I'm going, oh, Jesus. And then Reggie Hool. And we're with these HA guys that won't take <laughs> no for an answer. Uh, it was just like just bad news. But that was Ash. I remember, guys, when I got hurt and I had to come home and stop playing pro, I remember one of my first thoughts, if you can believe it, is how's Ash going to get through? Because I, I was his roommate in Red Deer, Fredericton, then Montreal. We spent a lot of time together. And not that he needed me to get through, but I was just like, I've been out with him so many times. There's another time, guys, we, we, he got a knife pulled on him. It was to his throat. And you know what he did? He cracked the bottle and put it to the guy's throat. He says, you think I'm scared of that? You're a fucking runner. I know how gangs work. If you take me out, everybody will be pissed off and you will be an asshole. I'm like, holy shit. He had no fear. Tougher on, off the ice. I don't know if he got into that, but way tougher off the ice. And one of the most incredible things, I'm like, he's going to go through. Each time he goes out, shit might hit the fan. And he ended up with like a 10-year career. It was just wild. But I one think, of my best I think every story he told, he was fighting someone in public, whether it was at 7-Eleven, whether it was at a bar. Yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I thought when you texted me, I thought it was his pet tarantula. You had a pet tarantula in Red Deer? I didn't know what to do, man. The, 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 like, this is what I say how it's different. This year in Red Deer, right? Then the next year, I'm in Fredericton with Michelle Therrien, and none of that shit went down. I would get, like, benched for doing any of this. That's why it was such a dichotomy of, of the mind, like, within a year going from that, that situation. But in Red Deer, it was like, it was, you know, I wasn't the kind of leader that would go in and, like, hold everybody accountable, and you better fucking shape up. Or, you know, there are people to do that, and you need them. But I was, if you can't tell, more of a loosey-goosey guy, and, you know, Guys, I know this is a crazy situation, but we got to breathe. There's going to be a, an, an end to this. It might as well be us. You know, I was that guy. They tell some jokes. So anyway, the coach is like, we need something. He's like, I don't know. Do we need a new mascot or, or something? We had to do something for the playoffs. Rick Carrier, and, uh, who actually coached with Rick Vive in St. John just a few years later. And um, anyway, I was like, I don't know, man. And I, was, I stopped in for some reason to the mall. I go to the rink really early in pro and junior. I go like one o'clock in the afternoon, like get a coffee, go through maybe stretch. And I'd always read books or whatever. It just made me more nervous to be at home. So I got there. I, I, I was on the way, maybe even a pregame meal. I said, you know, what am I going to do? I was going by a pet store. And then I said, I, I don't know why, guys. I don't even know what it mattered. But I was like, I'm just going to buy a tarantula and bring it to the rink. And like, you know, made it kind of her unofficial mascot. I, I, I named him Keith and we put him in the middle of the table and we used to like, you know, do chants. And like before we went out, <laughs> do our big thing. And then like everybody tapped the, tapped the cage. Yeah, it was why. And you guys, you know what happened to Keith? Ash doesn't know this. I didn't know what to do. It's a spider. But at the end of the fucking year, I flew my buddy out. I used to love driving home from out west. Just, you know, chance to see the country, both countries. Oh, I love driving. I loved it. I loved it. Still do. So I flew my buddy out, Mike Smith, and we drove across Canada together with 
with Keith. Okay. So I get home. Oh God, this is great. So my mom and dad were terrified, but I'm like, it's, it's a fucking spider. Now it, it, I didn't get it. At, I, I didn't remove the venom. So if it had, if it had bitten you, it would oh. still have venom in it. So yeah, I mean, I should have, but I kept putting it off and I'm like, at this point, you know, I'm not really, I didn't pick them up a lot and go, walk all over me or anything. So I'm like, I don't need to be worried. So we go downtown right in the peak of it. I guess this was like, yeah, I was in junior. So senior would have been like my age now, or even a little younger. Like he was, he was coming downtown with us wheeling and dealing kind of thing. Right. <laughs> so we're out and we're, we get her back. All the boys, we all come back to my place after my dad's place, the basement that you were in RA uh, biz. And we, and we drink some beers. And this is like four or five in the morning, man. And uh, so everybody leaves and seniors really hungry. So I remember ordering them a pizza and I went to bed. Okay. So I get up in the morning and what happened was on the drive back, the top of the, the very little, the little opening in the top that you reach in and get the tarantula, Keith, that was broken. So it wasn't there. So I had a book on top holding the, the the tarantula in senior decides to read it loaded eating pizza i'm everybody's in bed it's like four or five in the morning and when i get up i'm like what happened here jesus you knew like what happened you picked it up it was like the guinness world book of records i'm like what are you, what are you doing <laughs> and he's like i don't know i said well the fucking tarantula is gone no way mom freaks out this was in the mount pearl papers mount pearl post at the time um she went out on the lawn this is in the summer she slept in a tent <laughs> not a fuck tent, not hopefully. Fuck tent. <laughs> not a fuck oh, tent, no, here we go. It's she, coming for a full circle. She, I don't know. I hope no one was banging mom on the lawn. Um, yeah. <laughs> she mom slept in a tent for two months. So we go in, and it's like a week into it. And like me and the boys go in, and we're like, come on, senior. Like, we got to do something about this. Let's find it. Or like, Gail, we got to figure it out. Like, get her in here. Like, we, And he's like, I'm not worried about it. And he's eating chips. And he goes outside. He's like, Gail, it's only a spider. Anyway, this went on and on. We had her convinced, guys, convinced that the spider was gone. I'm like, what? where's it going to go? As soon as the winter comes, Mom. So, like, it was well in. It was like a month after this she came in the house. It was too cold to be out there anymore. Anyway, we wait. It's gone. I convinced her it's gone. It was at least five years later, if not eight. Way, like, this is late 2000s. We're downstairs on a Friday, as you, as luck would have it. We're looking over. And all the boys are there. and it's like five or six of us were sitting around and it's just one of those things. We're talking to each other in a circle. Usually we're looking at the TV because it's videos or hockey fights. We're talking in a circle and wouldn't you know it, Keith comes fucking running out from, from under the yeah. fucking couch and runs right across and goes in behind dad's records. I was like, <laughs> his albums. I'm like, holy fuck. So Keith lived at least a decade. I don't know what happened to him. But what, do, what do spiders eat? What did tarantulas eat? No, for, just for like bugs. They ate one of T.R. Senior's yeah. fingers. Yeah, yeah. just like, yeah. no see Keith. I'm like, we, we live Your like... Your old mom's bin. <laughs> you, 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 oh, fuck. See, that's where you'll go, right? And that's uh, why you don't have any uh, fucking credibility when good things happen, <laughs> right? Because we're talking about my mom's mitt and my mom's fuck tent. Yeah, oh, she was right? taking uh, the yeah. fucking Babcock in the tent. Uh, well, oh, God. Oh, God. Anyway, I, you know what? <laughs> Given that Senior was in his 40s, and I know how... Um, wound up the guy is when he drinks it probably was a fuck tent at that yeah. time uh, oh my god Christ. that is hey so one th one story that i don't think he put enough salt and pepper on or at least maybe didn't end it properly was the um the Terrian getting beat up when you was your head coach in fredgerton in the american hockey league like what happened like at, at, the, Guys, at the bar oh god that was such a nightmare i told you that was the year like after all that fun stuff in red deer and by the way by the way red deer we had success we ended up losing to Lethbridge in seven, and they went on to uh, do the Memorial Cup. I don't think they won it. They lost 6-5 that year, I think. But I had, I had <clears throat> not a big deal here, led the playoffs in scoring with 18, which is still a record for three rounds in the Western League. So <clears throat> not that you asked, but to go from that to Tarion, <laughs> to go from that to Tarion, trust me, I was, I thought I'm, I'm in. Like, I, I, I made the Canadians at the beginning of this year. I came back, set a record in the playoffs, had 32 goals in 33 games, man. I was like, and then I went in and fucking met M Michelle Terry in one of the first interviews. I told you, he just had a dart. He just lit up a dart, smoked it, and told me to get the fuck out of the room without even saying, I mean, it was like, what the fuck is this? You know, there's like growing up and then there's like, what, where am I? Who is this guy? I mean, am I in a fucking psych ward? Anyway, he, um, 
there was so much guys and for me but there was an incident okay there was an incident this was big news it was the playoffs the end of my yeah ash and i had played together all year with a guy scott king scott could really snipe dave king was on the Dave King was the assistant coach of the Canadians. This was his son. Three of us were from the Western League. I remembered him from Prince Albert, our division. We had good years together. I think in like around 50 games, we all had around 50 points um, around there. Like we, we did well. And we went in to play St. John's. Now, this is St. John's Maple Leafs, Fredericton Canadians playoffs. So neither team, both teams either were already knocked out of the playoffs or didn't make it, whatever. This was either the first or second round. I can't remember, but there was no Canadian teams left in the playoffs. So all eyes were on us and we wore like, it was really Habs Leafs because it was St. John's Maple Leafs with the Toronto jerseys. And you know, there's something to be said. It wasn't the Hamilton Bulldogs. It was the Fredericton Canadians. So it was Leafs Habs, like classic matchup Memorial stadium in St. John's that old school rank. So they come over first two games. Um, First two games in St. John's, we beat them. It's a three out of five. Must have been the first round. Three out of five. We fucking beat them. Me and Ash, rip it. Rip it. I remember it was our, our best, like, games in, like, three months. Me, him, and Kinger were reunited again. There was injuries. There was a, we're doing awesome. So the game ends. We win again. We go back to Fredericton. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard the story about Mark DL, big scorer that lost his eye. It would, so this happens. Game three, we're up two games of nothing in a three out of five. We go back to play in Fredericton. Weirdest thing I've ever seen. We're facing off in our own end, okay? Scott King's our centerman. He goes to take the face off. They kick him out. Ash goes to take the face off. They kick him out. Now I'm the last forward. I go to take it. I go early. They kick me out. One of our defensemen had to take the face off. Milo Slav Guerin. Milo never take a face off in his life. Goes to lift Mark Diel's stick, hits him in the eye. Di- 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 Mark Diesel is a buddy of mine too, man. Was, we were on the All Star team in junior together. He's drafted the, 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 the Leafs. He's really turned it on. He had like 150 points his last year out there. And we would talk off the ice like you would. I would play him hard. But is, there's like his eye is out. Like, and, and there's pus, there's yellow, there's, there's blood. Oh, there, no. it, it's the craziest thing I've ever seen. Okay, the like game he, ends, he took his eye out, or like it's just cut in and still in his head. I think both. Like it oh, was the God. worst puddle of gook that I've ever seen. Oh. It was parts of eye, parts of oh. it was it was brutal. So that Miloslav is fucking scarred for life from this. Like, well, I mean, I don't know, but at the time, so he's crying. We're in the house and he's shaking. He, can't, he, he you know, it, it, we knew right away. Dale's career is over. And he was their oh. leading scorer. Like he definitely would have got some time in Toronto. So we go to the hospital to visit Mark. Okay. I take Milo in. I'm crying. I'm shaking. I'm sweating. I'm looking at my good buddy, Mark Dayel, big, tough hockey player in his prime. Gone. His eyes out. He's got no eye anymore. Oh. We're talking about what he's going to do after hockey. He's shaking. I love you, T-Bone. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. <clears throat> I go to the rink. We go to practice, right? This is the morning, next morning. We go to practice. We come off. Mike Terrian holds a fucking meeting. And he says, guys, we have a traitor. We have traitors on our team. And I'm going, I'm just <laughs> chewing gum, undoing my skates. I got a game tonight. I'm one of our leading scorers. I think I got our most fights on our team. I got rookie of the year the year before. I'm a first round fucking pick. You're not talking to me, are you? He fucking comes right down, gets in my face. Boys, we have a traitor. And now I'm going, he's talking about me. I'm going, okay, I'm listening. He said, guys, it's the playoff. And we have members of our team that visit the other team, friends. I said, this not friends. I looked around at my buddies. I'm like, are you guys fucking serious? They didn't know it was coming either. And he says, well, I'm going to sit you out tonight. This is the beginning of it. I, I didn't want to be there anyway. I'm like, you fucking cunt. Sorry. I, I, I really, I was like, you f- fuck you. Fuck you. Everything I've given you. I'm a good teammate. I, you know, I, I, I fought with fucking blood, fucking spit, tears, sweat. And you're going to sit there because I visited a guy who just lost his fucking eye. Who's my friend and sit me out. Now at the game later that night, more said, I know Theodore, a bunch of them went in and said, are you serious here? We're not playing if, if Terry doesn't. It, really, I'm serious. 
So he comes back in. He said, well, you're in the lineup. Okay. So he played me. They win. It's two games to two. I don't remember what happened in the game. It was two games to two, though. Now we're going back to St. John's for game five. Deciding game. We go to St. John's. Yash, a bunch of us, we go out earlier. But I mean, but this is nuts, guys. Like St. John's had a drinker's team. It was a drinker's league, like as far as hockey goes, like, you know, at that time. But there's going out and then there's going out. These guys were tying one on and they were just hard nose. Like Thority was there. Uh, fuck, DJ Smith was there. I'm not saying that, you know, I'm just saying. Uh, Kitten Kaboot, Bird Dog was there. Uh, Todd Gillingham, a lot of old Nathan Dempsey, a lot of old school guys. Lonnie Bohanas, okay? Oh, yeah. So. We're out. We don't. Mike thinks we're going to go out. I mean, he really thought I think he thought that me and Ash were way crazier than we really were. Like if if we were out for a night, you'd probably see me on stage dancing or singing or something. But that's tying one on. I'd have a beer or two really trying to meet women or other hockey players or whatever. I'm killing time. There's no social media. There's no video games. Not that I want to be doing it. It's a bar. It's a pub culture at the time. But we didn't. We did not go out and shake it down till five in the morning the night before games. I kid you not. So. Or whenever, till bar close. But he apparently, so we go in the next day, the morning of game five, and he has another meeting. Guys, guys, I'm scared for my life. He says, I'm scared for my life. And his, his eyes, he's like red and he's crying. And we're going, what, what the fuck's going on? And then he takes us aside and says, I know you guys know. I'm like, what? And he says to me and Ash, he says something, you know, those players on that team don't have many th- good things to say about you. I don't know. He's trying to light my fire, but I don't need that anymore, Mike. I'm not junior. Like I, I'm not, you know, I'm not 10 years old. What are you telling me here? What happened? I know you guys were. No, we weren't. What happened? So what happened was he went down to what's now TJ's Turkey Joe's on George Street. He says to watch the game. Now, there was one little TV and it was like he didn't go into T- TJ's as a dance club. The young, the average age is 23. It's still like that. It's, it's, you don't go there to watch any games, especially at the time. But Lonnie was in there. Thority was in there. Uh, Jason Sessa, a few more. I don't know what level of drunk. But Lonnie was in there drinking because his best buddy was Mark DL, who's from Winnipeg like Lonnie. And Lonnie was pissed off. And Lonnie was in there, I guess, having a shooter, whatever he was doing. I don't really know what they were doing out. It's not up to me to say. They were great players. And fucking, I guess he goes over it. Now, this is from my buddy Bruno, who was bartending that night okay and I, I i don't know what lonnie would say but i know that it was <clears throat> virtually it was something like this so he goes over and says you know you guys are out tonight and you know it's it's too bad what happened to mark it's too bad what happened to mark and lonnie goes yeah man i'm really down about it or whatever but you know keep your distance and everything they're kind of and he says well you know what on second thought he's a punk who cares now it was some iteration of those words i'm paraphrasing but i'm telling you there was people there that heard it lonnie punched him in the fucking face now there's a mini brawl going on he mike's in there with i think roly melanson i could be wrong i don't know if the boys want me to tell this but fuck it it's years later and it's public this happened um so now we're kind of filling in the blanks and what ended up happening was it spilled outside they all i think they went down the road wherever they went and it you know, it, it, it was nearly a bar. It was nearly a fight outside the cab. So when we get to the rink in the morning, we're hearing all this and we're hearing our names involved. And I mean, we were home like that night, the night before we might not have been. But that particular night we were home. So we don't even really know what's happening, but he's kind of lumping it all together. Now we play the game. Fucking Ash has at least a goal and assist. I can't remember. We do all right. And. The ser- Lonnie scores, though. First shift, Lonnie takes a slapper. It goes upstairs. The whole rink knows what happened. Everybody in town knows what happened, and they're freaking out. They stood up, gave him an extra standing ovation. They're up one nothing, And, I mean, it was classic Lonnie Bahanas. Over the line, up under the bar on Theodore. Great goal. We come back, though. We win. I remember we won by a goal. It was tight. Now we go to shake hands. Oh, no. Tyrion, Tyrion pulls everybody off the ice. You're not shaking. And I go... This is my fucking hometown. Are you you're going to start getting in my face about shaking hands? You fuck really. This, and this isn't me thinking. This is me talking. And the, I remember a lot of the English guys, Asham, not that it was an English French, but I think some of the French guys were, well, they couldn't communicate. And a lot of them were intimidated by him. And it was me. It was almost to a person. The, the English guys, I remember, and a, a few of the French. Anyway, maybe maybe half the team, not even stayed out there and shook hands. 
right after Lonnie's got his skates on the Zamboni door and the doors open. They're on their way to the room and they put cuffs on him and he gets in the cop car with his fucking gear on. <laughs> I'm serious. This happened. Um, oh. Well, I mean, of course it is. Of course I'm serious. What a waste of time if I wasn't. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, so this happens and he ends up suing him. So Lonnie gets called up for the playoffs. Look this up. Toronto's leading scorer. Beat Sundin, leading scorer, 98, 99, I guess it would have been, in the playoffs. Nine games in the playoffs, nine points, three goals, six assists. Never plays in the NHL again, ever. Come on. That was his Look last games. Look Holy it up. Holy fuck, How what does, a legend. We were all going, fuck, does Tarion have fucking ties to the mob? I'm not saying he does, boys, but I'm going, and I'm, I'm really not trying to imply that, but it was like so weird. We're going, he never got back up. He went up for the playoffs of all times to get nine points in nine games. That'd be good in exhibition. The playoffs in that era. Holy fuck, man. I just couldn't wow. believe that he never got back. Now, what we heard, I know that Lonnie hired Danny Williams, who was a lawyer at the time, who ended up being our premier just a couple of years later and, and did a pretty good job, um, all things considered. But he was a lawyer. And I know I, I, I forget. And it's it, it's it's not really at my liberty to say. But I, I believe he said, well, he was going to he was going, OK, so if this is going to come out, we know where you were, Michelle, and we've got this, this, this and this. And that'll all come out, too. I don't know what it was, but I can only speculate. But then rather than just say no, I think Michelle, like whatever he did, he like called the hockey news and said, you know, I'm going to let bygones be bygones. We're all good. But I think he was threatened by something. But anyway, now. Guys, that happened. I don't know if that's the story he told you, and I don't. Well, want to hear you, yours was extent uh, a little bit uh, of the longer version. Well, but that's what happened, and I'm trying to create some imagery for you guys. You're yeah, oh, you did a hell of a job. That was crazy shit. Now, look, I again, I don't want this to shitstorm. I know it will to a degree, but I forgive Michelle Terry, and it was a different era, and he was really. I know what he was trying to do. He was trying to make us into soldiers. His his frame of mind was that of Babcock or Mike Keenan or Bob Hartley, a lot of people at the time. I forgive the guy. If I saw him now, I'd shake his hand. It's fucking over 20 years ago, right? So I'm not saying it complaining or anything, whatever. That All that shit happened. And there was times during the year that I had like blue hair and a mohawk coming back from a Metallica concert looking like I was on ecstasy. I wasn't. I didn't do drugs then. But I'm just saying I can to really, I should have communicated better with the guy. Okay? So all of that is hearsay. It's just that's what happened. And wow. Yeah, it was a pretty wild story. And to this day, I can't believe that Lonnie Bahanas didn't play again. That is just fucking wild. I mean, these stories are unbelievable. Before The night before games, the night after games, it leads me into the Achilles heel of the big deal selects if we're going to talk Chicklets Cup. The mm. Friday night, something happens. The team goes wild. You're usually 3-0. Yeah. and oh, and then Saturday morning, the we boys gotta, are in gotta rough shape. We got to establish a curfew this year. Okay, the good That's news what I'm is, at. is 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 because a hey, Chicklets Cup is growing, so we actually got the Buffalo Sabers who uh, got us tickets to the the Buffalo Sabers Pittsburgh Penguins. It's okay. the last preseason game before the season starts, so we'll go to the game, and then we got to do bed checks. Tr, let me tell we gotta you do, something. If you think, if you don't have a girl in there, well, you better get one soon. If you think <laughs> those guys aren't going out. TR <laughs> Penguin Sabres game. TR, you're come on. fucking crazy. Hey, here, this is what we got to do. You I think Con Man's gonna go tuck himself into bed and watch a movie? Yeah, she's <laughs> she's big <laughs> senior. Should we get a Hender, couple hook fish. daddies in the in the hotel room? Think, a little pay for play. Troll is gonna stay in and pass up some free fucking booze and Pink Whitney. We'll do electrolytes and hookers. <laughs> well, this is what I think. <laughs> I think rather than I mean, of course we need to figure that out, but. I, I think more importantly, we got to make sure that the members of the team we're playing stay the fuck out rather than rather than all of us, you know, r rather than what? Try to outdo each other by getting more sleep than the other team. Let's just take nose face killer by the fucking arm. Let's put G in their G in their water bottles. Hand. Put hey, let's put on us. Let's put G in their water bottles and bring Barbie back. Well, I mean, of course, <laughs> they'll have their fuck legs. for a week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, be a no, idea. you can't do them till after we win the ship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like. I like. You could get probably married. get the whole trophy up her pussy. That's how much she's been filled in, eh? Uh no comment. <laughs>
T, I'm glad Whit brought up the con man. We, we forgot to mention him earlier. You were out with him the, this summer. Was it Montreal or Toronto? Uh, when he, he actually got his album signed by Noel Gallagher in the middle uh, of the concert. I've never seen anything like that before dude, in hundreds of concerts. Dude, this was fucked. I had to go up to Toronto just for a stag party for one night on a Friday. My so daughter I had was, to. I had to, he says. Oh, yeah. <laughs> had to. Um, my daughter was in Montreal for her or a soccer trip the next Friday. So there's a week in between. I'm like, rather than go home, and go through all that. I can just drive over. I got a free place to stay. So, uh, and then con man was coming up. It was fluke. He just texted me. He goes, you're in Toronto. Like if you're staying, Noel Gallagher's playing. So I'm like, yeah, and we really like Oasis. Oh, Noel Gallagher, obviously uh, he's a huge fan. I mean, I, I like, he can tell you every song. I'm sure bio of Gallagher, like he's big time. So we went, we went out earlier that day guys to get a bite to eat. Um, up in Liberty Village. I can't remember the name of the place, but it's a wicked place in Montreal, in uh, Toronto, Budweiser Stage. They revamped it. There's a concert there almost every day of the summer. This was wild. But what I didn't know was that Weezer and uh, Alan Doyle and, oh God, Noel Gallagher, there was a bunch of other bands playing. So I ended up going on a bender for a few days. But anyway, Noel Gallagher. So we go out and he's got the album. And I'm like, what do you bring in your album? Like, just come on. We're going to we're going to be drinking. We're going to be out. You're going to have to bring that big fucking vinyl record around wherever you go. And, you know, he's not going to sign it. He doesn't do that shit. You know it. And I know it. He goes, well, there's a chance. And then he goes, look at my ticket. So we were like, we had good tickets. I was like, I don't know, 20 seats back. Come and buy him and his brother. He bought to Cody, who plays overseas now in Cardiff. Um, They you know, they got tickets right up front, like front row, front center. It was like, I don't know, six, seven hundred bucks a ticket. Comment loves him. So they did it. He goes, look, well, I go, well, I guess technically there's a chance, but still he doesn't do that stuff. And sure enough, the concert went by. I, I knew it wasn't going to happen. I wasn't even thinking about it. We could see him down there, but I'm looking at this huge IMAX like screen right next to where we were. I'm with uh, my friend Derica came down from Sudbury. And so we're back. I'm having a good time. And the boys are kind of scattered, but they're up there now. We look, I only turned the camera on. I only turned it on because Senior was going to come and he couldn't get there. And one of his favorite songs of all time is Don't Look Back in Anger by Oasis, Noel Gallagher. So we, we tur- I turned the thing on. And as soon as I turn it on, I see him. He, he takes the, I go, no way. And then I see Connor up. Connor's going at it and says, hey, man, I love you. You're the man. And he takes, just like he did it, Lionel Richie, takes it, signs it, throws it back to him. The best part was that he flung it like a Frisbee. And calm man just went and caught it. (laughs) If he didn't, didn't, he might have looked like a fool, but he did. And he turned around and the camera was behind Connor. And he just did this one, looking out at the thousands, 20,000 people strong, looking down. It was such a great night. And uh, afterwards, we we certainly had a lot of fun with that. But it was one of the best nights I've had. Got to give it to Connor, man. He wants that full experience. If he's going to a concert... It's all possibilities on the table, and uh, he's a Unreal. huge music fan. Hey, he can say that now twice. It happened with Lionel Richie and Noel Gallagher. I, we give him shit, but hey, you know, it's a, if you're a fan, what better fan experience than that? Oh, unreal. Can't wait to quaff a few with him up in oh, Buffalo. He's the with man. T. TR, we got... Uh, this has been incredible. Thir- Once again. I, well, we're, we're recording on Friday. We got about 13 days, buddy, and we're going to be hanging out in Buffalo. I can't wait. I can't wait to get a chance to coach that squad again. Op- basically, just a door opener, try to fire you guys up, but you do such a phenomenal job of that yourself, so looking forward to it. Can't wait to see you, and it's nice catching up. Boys, I'll tell you this. We got a little bit of young. I got, uh, it's mostly the same guys back. I got a couple of younger players that are involved in the Newfoundland program, the national program. But more than anything, I picked guys who I think are going to gel with the big deal selects with the spit and chicklets. That's all that matters, buddy. What are you doing? Like I said, you want to win with your buddies, right? And these are real, real, real good friends of mine. Uh, Bobby's real, real, real good buddy, Denny Schlegel. And I said, why not? Let's go. I mean, we nearly did it last time, boys. We lost by one goal to a team minus no space that ended up winning the world championship as members of Team Canada just a month after that. And uh, so we were almost there. Now, I'm confident. I know I've got a group, good group coming of players. I know I got a good group of partiers. And I think uh, and their team first. Great people that I trust. Right. I trust you guys. I trust them. That's a big attribute to have. I think the biggest is trust. And uh, these guys, you're going to like them. So on uh, Shorzy, you're 10 Hitchcock, and I've been seeing a couple of messages. People are wondering, have you found love on the show? Now, who is the girl 
who is in the show that you are always going back and forth with. She is a missile. Oh, yes. Well, you're going to, I can't give too much away, but no, I, I know you can't spill the beans, but who's the girl? <clears throat> well, I'm Googling girl yeah. in Shorzy. <laughs> no, well, but there are just so who's the girl? Tasa Tellis. Yeah. Well, wait, there, she's yeah. in it. She's famous from the show um, The Hundred, right? So oh Tasia came in. She was the only one of us that she had a million followers going in, right? So they they went out of their way to kind of build it around her. If you could, she's she's a great actress, as you can tell. Uh, I don't need to say that, but yeah. So I mean, of all of us, I mean, I had some acting experience. Ryan McDonald had a little bit, but Tasia was by far, I mean, the most well known on that show. But that's not my love interest. No, I, I, the reason I can't say it, Biz, is because okay. Um, it doesn't re- in the first it's it's kind of foggy. So if I if I say that, I'm going to give away a plot point. But there is a girl that I'm interested in and uh, she is very pretty. And Ted Hitchcock is enamored by her. Well, I look forward to seeing the fuck Ted in season three. And uh, <laughs> you guys and uh, you guys have done an incredible job. Kiso, we try to get him on the show, but he he flies yeah, under yeah. the radar. So we'll stick with you for now. We just had Marasti on and uh, we'll get to. Uh, We'll get a few other guys down the road as well. But TR, we, it's always a pleasure. Tons of laughs, a lot of great stories. And Wit said it, 13 days, and we'll be slamming a few cocktails, a couple big deal brews with the selects, baby. Boys, I can't wait to see you. Congrats on all the recent success. And despite everything, Biz, like I said, uh, I love what happened last week. I don't want to get into the gist of it, but uh, the subject matter. But you're, you're, you were proven to be credible when a lot of people doubted you. And... Uh, you know, like I said, these guys entertain. There's the odd sound bite, but they're boots on the ground. They're they're buddies with players. They played the game. They're in and around the game. So there's uh, more credibility there than I think a lot of people realize. Uh, because I guess comments like the fuck tent and my mom's mitt out on the lawn. And, uh, <laughs> Mel Pro. Good Keith. old Keith. Need a cigarette after this one. Holy shit, buddy. Yeah. You crushed it as yeah. always. Oh, well, buddy. Don't we'll fuck see- with the players, right? Don't fuck with the players. Don't fuck with the players, man. And that's going to be our motto, too. Don't fuck with the big deal selects or Justin Pender and company are coming at you. By the way. Crank the Metallica. Picture of the year in Sports Illustrated. The last one that Terry Milby took with with Pender with no space up against the glass. I thought that was just great. The one with you and Bobby was great, too. You're, you're just only in a towel holding roses. That that was classic after you <laughs> yeah. won the world. So. I tell you, it was great to see him, and he nearly did it, man. He was their driving force. That guy, I've played against him for so long, 15 years or more now. And uh, it, it uh, we talk about all this spitting chiclets, but it really is like an honor for me to play with him. You know, like there's there's storylines with all of us coming in as well that you guys are getting to know the more and more you, you know us. But I always thought Bobby was the best player around. For years, I thought he was the best player on the planet, and I'm, it's an honor to play with him. Love All right, it. buddy. We'll see you, see you soon, you. Terry. This Friday see season you, two, we love you, T. Take care, buddy. Love you guys. Catch you on the rebound. Man, I mean, Terry's been on, what, I think five times? I think that was his best appearance, Biz, like, those stories all, all time is like, come on. Was that the funniest or what? Oh, he so is far? such a funny bastard. I'm so happy. I forget who ended up putting us in touch with him to begin with. It might have been Teddy Purcell telling me that this guy is just off his rocker. And me and G went out there. What was it? A few years ago to do. Yeah, I to think do 2018 something. we went to Newfoundland. Oh, my God. And that's when I finally met Senior for the first time and oh. got my first trip to the basement. And it's everything as described. So thanks to Terry. And man, he's been on a heater, too. He's doing all this stuff where he's doing stand up. He obviously got introduced to the show uh, Shorzy. And that's yep. kind of uh, spearheaded his career even further as far as the, the, the acting's concerned. So we thank him every time, and I'm looking forward to compete with him at Chicklets Cup. So a perfect time to bring him on. And, uh, and G, I'll send it over to you for more information on Chicklets Cup. Yeah, because like a lot of people think you know you have to be participating in the Chicklets Cup to come hang out, come drink, come to the free Dirty Honey concert. Not true at all. Anyone can come. It's open to the public. I'll run through the schedule real quick, and people can decide if they want to come or not. But Thursday night, we have a 5 o'clock party. It's for participants only at the Labatt Brew House. But then Friday... We start the games at 9 p- nine a.m. And then the Big Deal Selects play at 10.30 a.m. They play at 12.45. And then they play at 2.15. This is all on Friday. Big, and then That's why you're training so hard. Yeah, it's yeah. a lot of games. Three in three one day. Three, th- three in like five hours. 
And then the entire Chicklets Cup is heading to the Buffalo Sabres game that night. Sabres versus Penguins. We got everyone a ticket. It's going to be an absolute blast. And then same thing Saturday. Games get going at 9 9 a.m. The award ceremony will happen at 6 p.m. And then we have a free Dirty Honey concert at Riverworks starting at 8 p.m. So it's going to be an absolute blast. Like I said, we're going to have merchandise. I got a video of the RA free throw contest that's going to be set up in one of the in one of the corners today. It looks incredible. We'll have a golf simulator. So there's so many different things and there's so many different reasons for you to come to this if you're not participating. And one is hanging out with Terry Ryan and Terry Ryan Sr. because they're buzzing around the whole time. And one one of the complaints last year was the fact that they're like the food was a little bit slow. So we have more food trucks showing up and there's going to be more easily f- food available for people who are just there to as not participants. So it's anybody can come on Friday and Saturday. It's open to the public, as G mentioned, and that concert's going to be a good time. So we hope to get a, a, at least a few thousand who roll up and enjoy the festivities with us. And uh, it's all brought to you by Labatt, Big Deal Brewing, Labatt Blue Light, Pink Whitney. And then is it Body Arm? Armor is Body armor sponsor? as well, too. Okay. Well, thank you very and the much. the Bills play at 9 a.m. the next day, Mur? Oh, Sunday, yeah. 9.30 a.m. versus Jacksonville. <laughs> but I'm gonna, I want everybody to come down to Buffalo, but just be careful if you see a tent on Chippewa Street. Don't go knocking. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't be going anywhere near the fuck tent. <laughs> <laughs> the old stabbing oh, yeah. cabin. You might get but again, hey, by real a tarantula. Quick too, what, one more thing. Like I mentioned at the beginning of the show, uh, myself, uh, Merle's Army, we will be get, getting auctioned off to play on a team in the Chicklets Cup. So that'll happen Thursday night. Merle's is a great, great D partner. I couldn't suggest paying for him more. And uh, it's all going to go to charity. So that'll happen Thursday night. A lot That's of awesome. long sauce up to the forwards from my own end. And then I can just glide up. Play it in a play that position in a rocking chair, Mer. I <laughs> uh, just mentioned Shorzy. It dropped up in Canada last week on Crave. So if you're up in Canada, Shorzy season two is out there. And down here in the States, October 27th, it'll be here on Hulu. So can't wait to check myself out in season two. And of course, Terry, who does a terrific job, as does everybody on the show. And shout out Jared Kiso, the mastermind behind all of it. Uh, a great guy, and he, t- he takes care of a lot of people. So I want to give him a little shout out as well. Terry just mentioned uh, Michelle Terry and Witt's favorite coach. And, you know, talking about guys' methods and, you know, coaches kind of being under the microscope. Well, uh, last week in the WHL, uh, Wenatchee Wild coach Kevin Constantine, who coached in the NHL. I think, Merles, you had him for a coach over in Korea, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was suspended on uh, Sunday, September 24th. Uh, the league's independent report and channel received a complaint about his behavior. Uh, it's all under investigation right now. It's been more than a week. Personally, guys, I thought it would have been done by now. I mean, it's, you know, you got to interview guys, make a decision. I don't think this is fair to the players there who, who's no, I don't think there's an assistant coach to them now, the staff there. It just, you know, I think it should have been wrapped up by now. Uh, what do you think it, this is too long a week, a week plus? Well, to, should to we determine? explain like what the rumors are or what, what is being said From that's coming out? Hearing, I think like 20 minutes probably would have been too long. Yeah, exactly. And, and I, I, I guess uh, are we going to say what we're being told because all you and Biz are hearing it. So I might as well share the fact that apparently, and this is allegedly, the guy is dropping the end bomb all over the locker room. So if that's actually true, I don't really understand how it's been a week. So I, I, I the guy. It's actually been- wit. It's pretty much identical to the Bill Peter story, where he, in the locker room rap music was being played, and he comes in and says, "What's up with the n n bomb music?" And then it's kind of like a er, like everybody's like, "Uh, yeah, you can't say that kind of thing." And then he's like, and and then everybody's kind of just paused there and he's like what i can't say the n bomb n bomb n bomb n bomb and i don't know how many times he apparently dropped it but enough to where from what i'm hearing it was the 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 other coaches and and other people like the grown-ups around who filed the complaint not even the players so and i, I think that there's also a black kid on the team as well so I is don't this know how guy long. Challenged is he? Well, like listen, legit and, and once again, this is all allegedly. I, I I would imagine it's it's probably not the case where if this didn't happen, that all of a sudden the story is just coming out. Like I've been getting texts about it, so uh, pretty pretty wild story, especially at the fact that Bill Peters, who ended up getting canned for this, and that whole crazy Akeem Alou story ended up coming out, where he was actually just reinstated to start coaching again in the WHL. I don't know if this. I don't know what sparked this guy to to do that, given the fact that he had a prime example of what happens if you do act like that uh, in Bill Peters being reinstated. So we're going to let allow this to play out. But 
pretty crazy behavior if it did happen. And I would imagine he's not coaching in a few weeks if it did. Yeah, yeah. I, I played for KC two years and I loved him. Like When I heard this, it was shocking to me because I didn't see anything like this from him. He's been in the game coaching for longer than all of us have been alive, I think. He was phenomenal coach, nice guy, so calm crazy about making us watch this video we would watch the game three different times but it's i I don't understand it the only thing i could come up with in my head because i i know the guy i like the guy was that that peters or the whl paid him off to do this to take the the glow off of peters getting rehired back which is just bananas deep space nine so bill peters came back with all that russian money gave it to kc to go (laughs) retire (laughs) Oh, yeah, because it's going to take the focus off them because everybody's relating both stories. Yeah, good job. And, and, and just to uh, bring this up to uh, is Ryan Kennedy, the hockey news from and this is his tweet from the 26th of September. From what I'm hearing, the allegation and right now it is still an allegation while they investigate against Kevin Constantine involves the use of a racial slur. So it's not, you know, us starting a rumor. It's been it's been out there in different channels. And I mean, if it is in fact true, I don't know if it's it's if it's stupider or uglier, the fact that. Uh, 2023 again after they brought Peters back and then a couple months later they hired this guy and, and if he were to do this like what the fuck man like what the fuck I, I think that's all, all you could say and to back to Peters when Akeem Alou come out with his tweets about what Peters had said to him Peters resigned within 48 hours like it was like he he copped to it he he, he resigned and he was gone so the idea that this is eight days later I don't well know, that man. makes just, me think that we don't have the entire story yeah okay yeah there's obviously this if the story that we've been told is correct he's gone though so the it's eight days now and and it doesn't really make any sense so maybe we did maybe we were we were fed uh some incorrect info or something i don't know but we'll see what happens yeah we'll keep tabs on it uh but much more of uh, pleasant coaching news last week a uh, huge shout out and congratulations to uh, Corey chevry and jessica campbell uh becoming the first two women to coach behind the nhl bench uh, Chevry is the head coach of Montreal of the PWHL. She joined the Penguins development and training camps as a guest instructor. She was behind the bench with assistant coach uh, Mike Vellucci versus Columbus last Sunday, the 24th. And uh, Campbell was with Dan Bilesma. She coached one of the Kraken's split squad units uh, Monday versus Calgary. Bilesma is, a, uh, is the coach of AHL Coachella Valley. Campbell is the assistant there. Uh, she's the first woman also to become a full-time coach in the AHL, as we reported back when it happened. Just a, a good stop is, I mean, this is a lot of progress. I mean, we started the uh, NBA with, with San Antonio and Becky Hammond. I mean, all you got to do is tip your cap to these ladies. It's probably a lot tougher for them than it is for a guy to, to get to this point, Biz. Oh, it's awesome to see. It's, it shows the game's evolving as well. So uh, congratulations to all of them. And then also recently they had the uh, the Women's Hockey League. They had their draft live and Billie Jean King uh, ended up going up there and kind of teeing it all off. So just a lot of positive movement for, for women in the hockey world right now. Yeah, PWHL, uh, it starts its 24-game regular season schedule in January. Uh, the six inaugural franchises, three in the U.S., three in Canada, uh, Boston, uh, Minneapolis-St. Paul, uh, the New York City region, Montreal, Toronto, and Ottawa. Uh, a couple of notable uh, women's hockey legends had signed prior to the draft. Sarah Nurse up in Toronto, uh, Hillary Knight here in Boston. Uh, and in the draft, University of Minnesota's Taylor, I, I think it's Heiss, uh, taken first by the Twin Cities franchise. And there's no more competing franchise, uh, competing leagues rather. That, that was kind of a big yeah. hindrance to the women's game that, you know, you can't have two leagues fight like that. So they're all on the it one umbrella put, right now. It put the women in a bad spot too, because yep. it feels like it was all beefing and it was a little bit counterproductive, but it's nice that they got everything organized and things moving in the right direction. Absolutely. You know, teams and also are- these women are seem to be getting compensated fairly for what they're doing and how they're putting their bodies on the line. Like it's, you know, that's, that's also getting up there as well too. As they should. Uh, the teams are owned and operated by the league, which is uh, fully funded by L.A. Dodgers Cohen and Mark Walter and his wife, Kimber. So hats off to them for, you know, for, for financing this, for taking care of it. And uh, hopefully the women's game keeps growing out there. So uh, before we get to the final four teams of the division, that time, that time of the episode, grind my gears, Biz. What do you got? Uh, what do you got nothing, for us? Nothing too crazy this week. All right. Uh, this better be fucking good. Let me tell uh, you. Yeah, it's not as good as last week. I was fired up last week, but Grinds My Gears brought to you by Big Deal Bruin. Go to bigdealbruin.com slash find it to see where you can find it near you. One of these things that pops up drives me crazy. Not what you guys. We have the big chicklets text thread, the uh, regular chicklets te- text thread. 
I can't stand, man, when you get a group text with 25 fucking people in it and you know two of them and you have all these four numbers and they keep going, going back and forth. I try to put, pause it or delete it or whatever. Leave I don't the know fucking the group chat, it. all right? I uh, try but to But then do, you're I, getting chirped by the group chat when you... Who yeah. gives a fuck? He oh, says he doesn't how, know half of them. How, how many he doesn't times even have, know them. He said. How, how, how well, often I know have you them, left I just don't the group have them chat. my phone. How well, often sorry, have I? Yeah. Many times that I don't want to be in them, I get texts, hey, night before Thanksgiving, everyone shoot on back. See ya, Ryan Whitney's left chat. <laughs> <laughs> if I don't like a group chat and it grinds my You're gears enough, I leave the goddamn chat. Yeah, okay. Like, I clicked the high notices. I thought, like, that kept them from, like, disturbing you every two seconds when someone's chiming in if someone asks a I, question, but that didn't I work I can't for stand me. group chats either. Yeah, I mean, like, get, again, get the one, to the point. Some of them stop. are great, though. Some of them are great. Well, you got buddies, group chats, there's stuff going on. The, and, and you catch up with it. You like it. But some of them are no, brutal. Though, like, those are the exceptions. Like, us with Big Chicklets, as, as you call it. With all, all the boys there and our, our group chat for the show. Those are fun. They're kind of like, we've all agreed to be on them. But when you get one, like, hey, we're having a reunion this thing uh, this weekend. And there's 75 dudes on there. And you don't know who they are. It's just, oh, my God. Kills my fucking OCD. So, not a huge deal this week. You just go up and mute it in the corner. You get zero notifications. And while they all build up, your phone doesn't vibrate once. All Thank right. you, man. My millennial come hooking me up again with the techno shit. So, again, grinds my gears. That's what's grinding my gears this week. Brought to you by Group Big text. Deal Brewing. Go to bigdealbrewing.com slash find it. I'll find it near you. Oh, look what I have right here. Ooh. Uh -huh. Oh, great. Here we go. Oh, back. Yeah, oh, second yeah. half. Say, well, you're the <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> No, I had to do an ad earlier. That's been sitting oh, there for funny, a while. funny, all right. Uh, thank you, buddy. All right, next up, the Dallas Stars last season, 108 points, second in the Central, eighth out of 32 teams. They lost in the Western Conference Finals to Vegas, four games to two. Great series. They're 14-1 to one to win the Cup this year. Some new faces, uh, Matt Duchesne, Sam Steele, Craig Smith, uh, Gavin Bayrutha. Uh, they said bye to Luke Glendening, Colin Miller, uh, Riley Tufty, Max Domi, Will Butcher. Uh, they're a little bit over the cap, but we got a ways to go. It's, uh, the season hasn't started quite yet. They really didn't lose any major contributors. I think bringing in Duchesne and uh, Smith, the big contributions, they Huge. can add to that depth scoring. They haven't gotten any worse. I think last year, uh, Ottinger, as oh, great as he better, is. better, R.A. They've gotten he's, better. No no argument here, but he, he I thought Ottinger slipped a little in the, in the postseason. Great regular season numbers. I don't know if he was overworked in the regular season, but what, what, what's, uh, what you got on Dallas this year? I, I think this team is right there. And I know I said I think Colorado is going to win the division. Maybe I got a little ahead of myself. One of these two is obviously going to win. That's that's not saying anything too special. But I, I can't believe that they were able to bring in Duchesne. And then Ottinger, what you said is exactly right. He played too many games. He played too many games. That was not the Jake Ottinger in the playoffs that we all know. The guy has been so good. This core of Robertson, Heskin, and Ottinger is just something else. I guess why I lean towards Colorado just by a little bit is the fact that it's McCarr and Taves. Heskin is playing with Ryan Suter. Ryan Suter is playing too much. At least last year he did. So I think that's why this year you may see, and this is after the playoffs got going, that this Thomas Harley could have a big time impact for this team and start playing more minutes. Suter's almost, what is it? I think Suter's 39. 39 in January. Yeah, he's not the same player anymore. He can't move his feet like he used to. You saw he's getting caught on the wrong side of the puck, things like that. They still have him listed on the top unit when you look at the line matchups. So I think that Harley's going to make a big step. I think Duchesne's going to be sick. Robertson. Coming off the 108 points, I could see him getting 50. I don't know the last time a wild player, I mean, a, a Stars player got 50, probably Madonna. 94, yep, first year, Dallas, Madonna. All right, now, Pavelski, I don't know how he continues to do this. Yeah. He's mastered the way of playing and producing without being a great skater, which is why you think it can continue. At some point, father time, father time grabs a hold of you and you got no chance. But with his hand eye in front of the net on the power play, and his lack of, I mean, his knack for just being in the empty space. I don't really see him slowing down. Like, if Pavelski goes out and gets 28 goals and 72 points, like, nobody will be surprised. I don't know how he continues to do it, but he does. So I, I think this team is going to be something special. Rupe hints the way he moves. There's times he looks like fucking McDavid skating down the ice with his jersey flapping in the wind. 
I think DeBoer has proven to be one of the top coaches in the yeah. league for a long time. Everything about this team screams a, a, a true cup contender. So I, I guess the D is a little bit of a question mark. Yeah. Like, certainly compared to Colorado, Colorado's got a better defense, but I think Dallas has the better goalie. So it's going to be a battle back and forth. I wouldn't be surprised to see it a one-point difference just like last year for who takes down the division. What a breakdown, Witty. Give him a round I of like applause here, a lot, folks. Dude. I know. Holy I shit. I like this team sort. a lot. Didn't leave us yeah. anything. No, no, no. No, I'm sorry. The... I, I mean, I, I just, I, this team. Yeah, I won't team. be long after after reiterating pretty much everything you said. Like, their, their ability to draft has saved them from those contracts, right? Like, Wyatt Johnston. Yep. Like, he was a fucking beast last year. And keep in mind, this is a guy who was drafted after the COVID year. I think he might have played 10 games. So they took a flyer on this kid. Why, why are you making that face, all right? Uh, no. I'm, oh, okay. I was a you're try, you you trying know. to squint to read. Yeah, uh, yeah but exactly. Yeah. <laughs> forward group, top to bottom, one of the best in the league. Agree with you, Wit. A little bit thin on the back end. They're going to need this Harley kid to step up. And, and, and the fact that yeah, overall, from their top six, eh. Haskinen's going to have to carry a lot of that weight. And then if Ottinger's Ottinger, they're easily making playoffs. If not, they have a, a chance to win that division if they get firing on all cylinders. Agreed on that Craig Smith pickup too. I feel like, what, things just really weren't working for him in, in Boston? Yeah. And then he ended up finally getting moved. But I feel like he's going to find a nice home here, and he's going to be an awesome contributor on a fourth line. So they have, they have big bodies up front. They're physical. They're built for the playoffs as well. Could be the year that they finally get over the hump and make a run. And they have these uh, the, t the two names I'll throw out. I think Dallas Stars fans are well aware of them. But this Logan Stankhoven and this Maverick Bork. Bork played in the AHL last year at a good season. Stankhoven lit up the World Juniors, lit up the WHL. Maybe one of them makes the team out of camp. Maybe with injuries, they're both on the team at some point. But they got young guns continuing to come. Jamie Benn having the same type season would be enormous. I don't know if it can happen. Sagan, can we all agree it's... And it's injuries, and it's it's it, you feel bad in a sense. He he's not the same anymore. I think you're looking at unfortunately four four years. I think this year and three more, he's making that much dough. He's probably a third line player now. I don't see him having the explosiveness. I don't see him being the game breaker. But because, as Biz said, they've drafted so well, they can survive it. But imagine when they get his deal and Ben's deal off the books. Then you're looking at like, holy shit, this they team fill up the a, holes on the back end. Yeah. So uh, a very bright future for the stars and the stars fans should be fired up for this season. Merle's big D. What do you got? Yeah. Same as Witt. It was tough to pick the abs over them, but I didn't have an avalanche or uh, a stars jersey. So I had to go with the avalanche. But I, I want to bring the note um, last spring when we were covering the playoffs on Game Notes Daily. Everybody was talking about the Ottinger numbers after a loss. He was yep. something like 19-3-1 or something. Yeah. So let's all remember that stat this this season and remind me, please, that if they lose, hammer them the next game. Hammer them. Yeah, 61 starts last year. I know he's still young, but you might want to scale that back a little considering how the playoffs went for him. And as far as Ben's numbers, I mean, I do not see him going down with those numbers at all. I think he'll probably stay steady. There, Biz, sorry, I can never resist the Jamie Ben going down joke. It's just too yeah. easy to set. But no, I think everybody okay. has him okay, going to the playoffs. <laughs> Come on, guy. Right? Correct, Amundo? Everyone in the playoffs? I know yes. G oh, does. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. Uh, moving right along. The Minnesota Wild, uh, 103 points last year. Third in the Central, uh, 11th out of 32 teams. They lost in the first round to Dallas, uh, four games to two. 30 to one to win the Cup this year. I think last year was sort of the... the basically best shot to, to kind of win the cup and, you know, validate with the plan that Bill Garrett's had as far as buying those guys out, uh, Parise and Suda. Uh, they only brought in Pat Maroon uh, via trade. He's got one year left at $1 million. Cap space, uh, $43,000, but they got all that dead cap. Again, with Parise and Suda, 14.7 mil. They're in cap jail right now. Uh, Biz, did they kind of, I would say, like, blow it last year, but I think they expected to have much more of a run, and now they're kind of like back. I don't well, know, I mean, that's been their MO forever, just getting to the first round and fizzling out. Let's not forget Erickson Eck went down with injury, and he had a monster regular season, especially with a few of the injuries they had up front. But, I mean, I like their forward group here, and I think that their defense core is extremely underrated. And I think overall, with Gustafson taking the net, probably primarily this year, I could see him playing about 70 to 75% of the games, and you got a great backup in, in Flurry, a guy who's going to be supportive. I really like this team top to bottom. I think that this the 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 X factor, 
if I'm going to go back to playoff times, like the big question mark with this team is, is Marco Rossi going to finally show up and, and, and solidify himself as an NHL player? And that's going to help that third line and hopefully bolster the offense of Marcus Foligno, who two years ago, he had 21 goals. And last year he had seven. It was an off year offensively for him. So they're... They're one of those teams that, like you saw when they lost Kaprizov, sometimes the offense can go away, although I, I want to say it actually improved last year when they lost him, but they're a team that has a hard time scoring goals. So if they could start getting that production from the bottom six and getting those guys going along with that top six that they have, like – once again, going back to two years ago, Hartman had, what, 38 goals, close to 40. So if they can get that offense humming along with this very underrated uh, decor and and that 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 great goaltending that they've had over the past couple of years, I, I think that they're going to make playoffs, and they're the third and last team that I have making it in this central division. So um, that's what I got for them. Um, overall, like I said, a, a very good job by Billy G to get uh, – Zuccarello re-signed at that number because we know the chemistry that he has with Kaprizov and still the fact that they have those two buyouts that are kicking them in the dick uh, they have done a good job to continue to be relevant to have 14 and a half million dollars that you can't spend yeah. for this year and next I feel like fans have to be a little understand uh, what's the word um, understanding understanding for like Billy Garen made this tough decision, but it's only going to help them in the long run. It just sucks for these two years. And the team they have is still pretty impressive for, for what they're dealing with. And I mean, I, I, I like the signings. The Felino signing was a little, little surprising. In terms you thought of it was a high number. I didn't think it was a high number. I thought the term was long because it's this year he's already signed and then he's got four more. But the way that uh, Billy Garen explained it was like he called, you know, his nickname's Moose. He said, I just I just can't imagine him not a part of this team, right. whether it's a big goal. He's become a top penalty killer in the league, whether yeah. it's a fight. He can change games and guys love him that much. Hartman needs to have a bounce back year, but he was injured last year, too. So that's something that was a huge loss. They got to get him re-signed as well. I think this is the last year of his deal. But Gustafson, guys, after Thanksgiving, second in the league in goals against, second in the league in in, in uh, save percentage. I mean, he truly turned into an unbelievable netminder and, and kind of took that number one spot from Flurry. Flurry's what forty years old, almost forty years old. So you kind of you'll see where that plays out. But they got a great tandem there with Gustafson in my mind probably being the number one now. Um, we saw what Brock Faber did. Right, he came in. He was phenomenal in the playoffs. Remember that game-saving play he made against Dallas in that first round. So if he he's able to partner up, I, I saw him and Brodeen are playing together right now. Uh, it's a good team. I think as a Wild fan, you're looking towards these next two years if you can make the playoffs. That, that's obviously the goal, and you'd be you'd be upset if they don't. But you're trying to really win a Stanley Cup when this cap jail ends after next season so it sucks it's two years but it's what they had to do it's still an exciting team um and Caprisa is one of the top players in the league so you get to watch him every night the way he's dancing around I think that Zuccarello said he celebrated his new contract he just had taco night with Kirill so that's kind of those two seem to be boys um I'm a big fan of the team obviously we, we've been open about how, how big a fans of Billy Garen we are so I'm rooting for them to do well I think they're third after Colorado and Dallas but I think they get in as well and one guy we didn't mention was Boldy, and he had a breakout year last year. So if he continues to roll offensively, like they're gonna they're, they're gonna be a solid team. Merles, what do you got for us, buddy? Took the words right out of my mouth. Boldy had thirty goals when Kaprizov was hurt there. That's who did all the scoring, but he disappeared in the playoffs. He had no goals in the playoffs. But um, if you're if you're a new hockey fan listening to the podcast, you're looking for like a vibes team. This is the team. Billy Garen's the best. Like he's just he ultimate team guy. Good like camaraderie. Is that a real word? And yeah. uh they're just awesome. They go no tarps on their interviews. They get they lose Reeves, but they bring in another character with Maroon. So they're just a fun team to be around. And and don't sleep on uh Eric Sinect. He's a he's a tremendous two way centerman for them. So it just sucks that they're in in that that division because they'll hear they're playing Colorado or Dallas if they do get in the playoffs. Yeah. And Marcus, is it Marcus Johansson? He was the yeah. big move that, that last year. That's what got Boldy going. They had that crazy connection. So Minnesota's in. Should be a fun year. And I, I love watching Kaprizov. That kid is, he is disgusting. Yeah, it definitely makes that team worth watching. But Biz, I want to bring up the goalie rotation. I mean, last year, like Gustafson was playing his ass off. Creed took him out and 
you know, put in uh, Mark Andre Fleury. This, I think he has to commit to like a number one for yes. the playoffs and stick well, with him. Well, it's fucked him up the last couple of years, right? Yep. Because like they brought in Talbot when, when, uh, or sorry, they brought in uh, Fleury when Talbot was having that monster year. And then they juggled that situation two years ago in playoffs. Same with last year where Gustafson lost the game, but he played out of his mind. And I don't know from an energy perspective or it was because that's how they were juggling the net miners all season long. They went back to that method, but Come playoff time this year, you would have hoped that they would have creed, would have learned his lesson where whoever's playing the hottest going in, stick with them. And I would imagine, like Witt said, Gustafson's going to take over as that number one, and you have a great support system in Flower. And, boys, you guys think this will be the last dance for Flower? I do. I think I do. this will yeah. be his last he's year. He's accomplished so much. You know, he's, he's he looks young as hell, but his kids are aging a little bit. He... Like what else does he have left to do? Who know who knows how it goes down this year? Maybe if he doesn't end up playing that much, he wants to try to do it again. But I would think this is it. This is the last kick at the can. I, I do not have them in the playoffs. I think that's who Nashville's gonna replace. Nashville was only eleven points behind them last year. And Minnesota's offense, the, the output has dropped uh, the last four years, it keeps going down and down, and they're gonna need a lot from w- within. Uh, I just think Nashville's going to overtake them. Like I said, Nashville's got the new coach. I think they got a little shot in the arm. And, yeah, I think they're, uh, they're going to nose out uh, Minnesota for that last spot. So we'll see what happens, obviously. Oh, Next up. One oh, one thing sorry, to look for. Sorry, no. uh, Fleury's going to move into second all-time on goalie wins if he gets seven this year. So I remember last time he had a big like thing like that. He did it in Montreal. So keep an eye out for when that is coming due, if he does it in Montreal, or I don't know if they play in Pittsburgh this year, but Flurry, you know him. He's got the sense for the dramatic, and yeah. we'll be hammering that game when it happens. All right, the Winnipeg Jets, 95 points last year, fourth in the Central, uh, 14th out of 32 teams. They lost in the first round to Vegas, four games to one. Uh, odds to win the Cup this year, 50 to one. A lot of changes for Winnipeg this year. Obviously, they did a sign and trade with uh, Pierre-Luc Dubois. They got back Alex Ayafalo, Gabe Velati, Rasmus Kupari. Uh, also brought back Laurent Brossois as their backup goalie. Uh, they also lost Blake Wheeler, Sam Gandhi, and David Riddick. Got about two and a half million in cap space right now. This is another team we keep talking about. The Flyers zone, not good enough to be a contender, uh, not bad enough to, to bottom out. But this is a team, they don't have a lot of draft picks, like extra draft picks looking down the line a little bit. Uh, what go to you first on Winnipeg? What do you see them doing this year? What do you see them doing in the future even? I mean, they got... I feel bad, is- but this team just is so like... Blah. Uh, I love their goalie. He's a, he's a hell of a goalie. If I'm Winnipeg, I'm looking to trade him and Shifley as soon as possible, get some serious returns for them, try to get a little younger. And I understand, right? Like they got Cole Perfetti. That's an exciting young player. They got Ehlers, who's a water bug out there. The guy could score. But you lose Pierre-Luc Dubois. You lose all the points from the guys you lost. And then Josh Morrissey, who's a sick defenseman. It was kind of a crazy year. I, I, I don't see him getting that many points again. Right? He could, have, he could have just as good of a season if he gets 50 points. He's that good of a player. But you got to think he's dropping down from that number last year. What was it, 75 or something in the 70s in terms of his offensive production? I think that'll change, just kind of regression to the mean. I don't know. It's, it's a weird time. We've talked a lot about certain cities where you can't really get free agents. Winnipeg's one of them. I, I, I like it. Biz talks about very, very beautiful women. Very beautiful women. Very underrated. It, very underrated. Very underrated. Bad weather. Ha- great fans. Don't want the fans to hate me. But your team right now is in a weird spot because it's pretty evident that Shifley doesn't want to be there. Uh, Hellebuck doesn't want to be there. The coach was absolutely carving the leadership in the locker room when they lost in the playoffs last year. Now, granted, Wheeler's gone, Dubois has gone. There's been a lot of changes that have probably kind of addressed what made him so upset in Rick Bonus. But I, I don't see them in the playoffs. You're going to have to hope some young bucks step up. And, and I just I, I got no desire to kind of flip on their game when they're playing. Like, I just put it that way. I was probably originally a little too hard on them because I don't mind the return that they got in the Dubois trade it with v- v- Velarde and, and Aya Fallo. So they have some crafty players in that lineup. And I think that, you know, they could surprise a lot of people. I just think that they're too thin on the back end. Like you said, I feel like it's just a ticking 
ticking time bomb in a sense of when Hellebuck and and uh, Shifley are going to end up moving on. I think it's a no brainer for them to do that because you do have some pieces to build around like Kyle Connor, like you mentioned Ehlers, like they got some good young players like Cole Perfetti, like can he take that next step? But I, I think that he would easily be exposed as a first line center right now if they ended up moving on from Shifley too soon. So I don't have them making playoffs. I just think that they're one of those teams in limbo and the sooner they can realize that it's time to rebuild and, and and move on from those two guys, the better for the overall organization moving forward. So and I want to make it clear, Biz. I don't I don't I'm not saying lottery team or anything. I'm just saying so middle of the pack. They'll have some runs where they're good because you're right. I didn't mention Kyle Connor, elite goal scorer. It's just I don't I don't see I see them, you know, competing and being kind of maybe tenth in the West. It's just not much in terms of wanting to get excited as a Jets fan. Merles, what do you have from the Jets for us, buddy? I agree. I have them 10th in the West, 22nd overall. Um, my Game Notes partner, Army, I've, I've been tracking all the guys' rankings of people listening, and Army thinks Winnipeg is going to win the division, which is just bizarre. What? Right? Yeah, he has oh. them ranked one. Is it's he crazy. smoking the wacky tobacco that RA's handing out, or what's going on? He thinks they're going to uh, win I, the division? I, I've, seen a, I've seen a few tweets from, from like Winnipeg Jets uh, jock sniffers that are saying, look out, this team's going to surprise you. Hey, maybe so, but de- winning the division? No, I definitely think you're hitting up RA's bag of treats if you're thinking that yeah i got a miss in the playoffs and you can get that at your local sports book at minus 115 ra uh, merles what if they're still in the hunt late like you know february march i mean do you think they're still going to trade hellebuck shifley what if you know they're in the playoff spot or close to it M- my whole thinking is hellebuck's gone before that i think they make a deal around the holidays get get better return maybe for them and uh it, it, you can't have guys that don't want to be there. We've we've heard that before in these other cities, and it seems like a, a lot of guys don't want to be in Winnipeg. Get rid of them and and get the like we talked about in Minnesota. It's got to be vibes. Got to get is, vibe guys. Is there a team more desperate for a first line center than the Boston Bruins mm-hmm. right now? Like how long b- before that that team's knocking on their door asking? I mean, you look at me like I'm crazy already. Like they no, don't. They, oh, okay. No. No, like I'm they got to get you. a guy in there to play with Pasta and Marshaw. Oh, like who's going to? Mark Shifley would look fantastic in the black and gold biz. I was going to say the same thing. I think they're out of it by November. I think they go sell, 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 sell. I I don't think it's crazy to say that Mark Shifley is a Boston can't be Bruin out of it January by November, 1st. dude. I just uh, are you going to be out of it by November? By I, Thanksgiving, I, they could definitely be out of it. The only issue with the bees right now is they they leveraged a lot last year for that run, and I would imagine they don't have a ton of prospects in the pipeline, nor do they have a lot of high end picks to be able to give up for Shifley. Which, man, if you're going for a, if you're going for a sign and trade for, from a, from another team, it's going to be hard to match what another team would be prepared to offer for that. And the fact that he's coming in this year at un, what is he making under six million or he's so at just six over. six point one six point one two five, dude. For, every for a guy who's a point of game player, that, every ten games that go by, the return is less. So, I I know it sounds crazy, but like you gotta deal him if he, if you go to him and he's saying I'm not resigning here, deal him. Try to, you gotta get something back here. And it's going to get less and less as the season gets longer. What, what do you think he gets on the open market? It depends on the season, obviously. But how old is he? He is, uh, Shafley got it right here. Uh, Shafley's 30? 30, 30, no, 30, yeah, 30. Is he getting that old already? Wow. That's oh, gonna my be- God. We're acting like these fucking guys are in, in, in uh, wheelchairs. Hey, buddy. <laughs> so wait, old, 30, 30 years old? old 30 years old? old. You're on the you're on the fucking last seven holes, bro. Uh, Thirty years. But the way that these guys take care of themselves now, I mean, we look it, at Pavelski. It, it, I mean, some some guys are a little different. You know, Shifley ain't uh, ain't boozing every night. And you know, he's. A I ain't giving nerd. a thirty year old an eight year deal. Okay, I'm not right. doing it. Now uh, there will be teams reasonable. to do it, and I imagine he is the type of player, especially with a big season, that could get a max contract, maybe. Eight million, sixty-four million for eight years. I don't know. It's hard to imagine like paying somebody that's going to turn thirty-one this year and thirty-two the first year of his new deal that much dough and that many years. Yeah, not an unreasonable take, but I don't think anybody here has him going to the playoffs. Correct, Abundo? No, no, I don't. Just Army. Just, just Army. <laughs> it's a fucking division. What's the odds on that? All right. 
Uh, last team here, the St. Louis Blues. Oh, man, this has uh, gone sideways for them. 81 points last year, sixth in the Central, 23rd out of 32 teams. Uh, last time in the playoffs was 2022. They lost in the second round to eventual champion Colorado, four games to two. Merle's 80 to one to win the cup this year. Holy smokes. Uh, they brought in our pal Kevin Hayes and Oscar Sundquist. Uh, so long to Tyler Pitlick, Josh Lievo, Logan Brown, Thomas Grice. Uh, very little cap space, but this team, it just seemed to all fall apart so quick. They won the cup back in 2019. Uh, last year, uh, GM Doug Armstrong stood by Craig Berube, said, no, we're going to tough it out, and it didn't happen. So they started selling off, but uh, what's the future for this team, Biz, uh, St. Louis? Are they going to bottom out? Are they going to, like, kind of, like, I don't know, tread water? What's the deal here? Well, I, I always go back to them not re-signing Alex Petrangelo and and them trying to maybe spread out that that defense squad when they ended up picking up Falk and, and Krug, right? That's where they snapped the money around the back end, and I just don't think it's worked out. Krug's had a hard time staying healthy. I believe he's injured. He injured himself in the offseason again. Um, I think that with the playoff run Perenko had, they felt that they could move on from Petrangelo, and I don't think he's ever really stepped up to be that number one defenseman. I think that on a team where he can hide a little bit, he could be a three on on most teams. But I just don't think that the produ production and the quality of play they're getting from their back end matches the names that are there, right? You look down the list. I mean, you got Letty, you got Falk, uh, you got Bertuzzo. Like some of these guys were there when they won the cup. And I just don't think that they're they're good enough to, to help this team make playoffs. Bennington's regular seasons have been awful. You, you go back to the, the the hardest series that Colorado played when they ended up going on that cup run was against St. Louis. And when I feel like the chips are on the table and it's a big money game, Bennington's able to get up, but he hasn't been able to find his regular season game ever since signing that six times six. So it's going to heavily depend on how his play is this upcoming year, if he can get his mind in the right place. Um, as far as their, their forwards are concerned, um, what are you going to get from Cairo and Robert Thomas? We, we keep talking about sometimes these younger guys getting hand these contracts and, you know, where, you know, the, the skill level is there. The commitment to playing on the defensive side of the puck is not where Barubi wants it. He called him out in the media so much last year in that regard where I don't know what the connection is between Barube and their two-star players where we know that these guys are locked in and they ain't going anywhere. So how is that relationship going to proceed? Um, they do have the leadership in place up front, though, with a guy like Braden Chen and some of these older guys like Kevin Hayes that they brought in. But they're really going to have to gel as a group, as a forward group, because they have a lot of these older guys there that seem to be on their back nine, where it's going to be to be hard to compete in the Western Conference. Like, I don't know what you're getting from Brand Saad. The guy's already won his two cups. I mean, yeah, he gets you 20 goals every year, but as far as a compete level, what are you getting from from a second line player in him? So overall, I don't have them making playoffs. I do think that they have enough weapons, and if a lot of these older guys ha can rejuvenate and have career years, they could be a team. That would be my one sleeper team in that division who could maybe sneak in. Aside from the other teams that I said are in limbo, they are they are definitely a team in limbo, and I don't know what direction they're heading. This could be a team halfway through the season who has a new coach, as Merle said, because these young guys aren't responding well to him, but very well could be a team that surprises you because of some of the names and the championship pedigree they do have in the lineup. What? I, I think that they could. Yeah, it depends on goaltending. It depends on those two forwards. But if, if they get some serious play out of Bennington and then Thomas and Cairo light it up, like Braden Shen, I love him as a captain. Hazy's going in there, say he's penciled in his third line center. I don't know. I don't think it's necessarily dead yet. I would I would like to get the news on Krug's injury. I know he hurt his foot. I don't know how long he's supposed to be out for. It is definitely the biggest question mark team for me. I guess I'll add I'll add Winnipeg a little bit in like terms like I don't know what to expect. I think they could be right there. They could be kind of brutal. Um but Bennington is the one thing like is he going to fuck is he going to stop trying to fight other goalies constantly? Like, is he going to kind of leave the shenanigans to the side and just focus solely on winning games and playing playing goaltender and just focusing on his game? Or is he going to always kind of be that 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 sideshow is not the right word, but kind of a sideshow, like always entertainment. That's kind of how he looks at it. But I don't think they're necessarily done yet. I think they love playing for Barubi. I mean, 
Buchnevitz, that's another question mark. Buchnevitz, what if he lights it up? You've seen that guy have some serious runs of 10 game spans where he's playing high level hockey and then it's just smell you later for five games. And then he picks it up again and then it's smell you later. So very inconsistent, but I I, I like their D. I, I do, depending on Krug's health, but. It's a question mark team for me. I don't have them getting in the playoffs. But if they start off hot and they get some mojo, I, I could t- certainly change my tune, which I've been Wait, known to uh, do. Tory Krug is expected to play in Monday night's preseason game. He is back from his uh, nice. fractured oh, foot shit. injury. He's back good already? Him. Holy back, fuck. Yeah. He be good the injections. Him. Okay, here we go. Merle's- what about Verana, too? Jacob Verana, last year, he had 14 points in 20 games for them. He's got the he's got the, the you know the first round pick ten years ago. What if he finds something there? Contract so a year bunch two of question marks. What do you got for us, Burles? Yeah, I, a lot of my stuff was Bennington and like Barubi got sick of the antics last year. I remember him calling him out. Uh, yeah, he called, did. Yeah, they called up that goalie last year, Hofer Joel Hofer at the end of the year. He looked pretty good. Maybe he ends up getting some more games if Bennington keeps this act up. I just, out of respect for Hazy, I put him above the Yotes, but after hearing Biz talk about the Yotes, I wish I moved them below. I I don't see good things happening in the St. Louis this this spring or at all. I don't see him in the playoffs at all in the spring. And uh, four of those defensemen, Falk, Krug, Pareko, and Letty, they all have at least three years left on those deals, and they're, you know, they're all 30 or older, so keep an eye on that uh, as far as trades. Let me go back to you, Witt. Uh, do you think if they're out of it late, this, is Craig Bruby's job in danger at all this year if they shit the bed? I mean, I know they stood by him last year, but if it happens yes. again, okay. Yes. okay. And I, I don't necessarily think that it, it would be on him, but if you struggle like this, like they did last year, and then it continues after making different moves like they did, and they're still they're still not even near the playoffs and not having a good season, you got to think the coach could be gone. That's how yeah, it works. I, I think I said it last year. He won't ever get fired because you can't have a meeting with that guy. Imagine trying to have a meeting with him, you. tell him he's gassed. <laughs> Kill you. Yeah, it feels a little bit like a franchise franchise at a crossroads. Bennington had his career worst numbers last year, 3-3-1 three, three, goals against 8-9-4 save percentage. But he turns it on. Looks like he did back in 2019. Then, yeah, they could be in the hunt. So, Before we continue, guys, the NHL season returns October 10th with an opening night triple header on ESPN and ESPN+. The fun starts when the Nashville Predators head to Tampa to face the Lightning at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. Then Connor Bedard makes his NHL debut with the Chicago Blackhawks as they meet Sidney Crosby and the Pittsburgh Penguins at 8 p.m. And then the Vegas Golden Knights will raise their first ever Stanley Cup banner to close out the night against the Seattle Kraken. All right, that's it for our preview. Uh, got a few other hockey notes here. Uh, dude, how about Vegas fans, man? Hopefully this is the new future, Biz. I know I've bellyached about, not bellyached, I've rightfully complained about all the blackouts in the league and fans not being able to watch their teams. Well, Vegas already had it so their teams could watch, uh, I'm sorry, their fans could watch the team over the air. Well, now they have a new service. It's called uh, Nighttime Plus. And for $69.99, fans can watch 69 regular season games. Nice. In the first round of the playoffs, you can also watch uh, single games for six ninety nine. dollars it's a, a new service, and basically, it's for fans in the territory. And, you know, every, t- every team has their TV territory. Obviously, we're not in that territory. We could watch those games ESPN Plus or TNT or whatever they are. But basically, this means fans can watch every game if they live in that area. Hopefully, this is the new thing going forward. What, what, I mean, would you like to see every team get rid of these, like, what are they, regional service things, or whatever they're called? Just Would you be willing to pay 70 bucks to watch well, all your teams' and, games? And, and quickly, they've been having issues with the Bally's thing. So it's it's been a big shit show to begin with. I like the approach that the Phoenix Suns took in the NBA where they they telecast all their games for free and they've invested in in growing in that way where you're going to get to watch the telecast locally and in those areas you're talking about and they're not blacked out where why wouldn't you ju- just do it that way? Because overall, you're going to see the growth. And then even people who might not have tuned into hockey to begin with, if your team's relevant enough, all of a sudden they're watching games and then they become more hooked to it, especially in non-traditional markets. Now, Vegas got the huge push because they were relevant in their first season. And then last year, they end up going on to win the cup. So for them, of course, they're going to have people who are even willing to pay for it. But I think more teams should take the reins and take the approach to investing in their broadcast and making it easier easily available for all the fans in their in their area 
yeah, I, I don't see. I mean, it, it, the Phoenix Suns are doing it for free. They do it for free. I mean, keep in mind it's NBA, and the owner yeah, that they I, have is is loaded out the wazoo. So, at, at, at to start, I don't even. It, I think it's even a situation where with the ads that they're able to sell even though they're broadcasting it for free, they're close to breaking even. But even if you're taking a loss in a few few couple of years, the amount of exposure and the brand awareness you're getting is paying for itself. And with these franchise values, the way they're going, if you're losing $5 million on a broadcast in year one, is that really that big of a fucking deal? Like how much depends are the- on like, the o- It depends on the owner. Well, I mean, fucking- they're, they're spending up, like, for instance, the Coyotes, they went out and signed Zucker and they signed some guys where they're, they actually spent some money to be more above the bottom of the cap where it's like, if I'm them, I would rather be worse and then make sure you're broadcasting your games and dra- draft it. I mean, that would be my approach. And I'm just using the Coyotes as an example. But with all this Bally's nonsense happening, get ahead of it. And, and if you're smart enough, you can even find a way to stream these games and create an app to where that, that's where the fans can watch it as well. So, R.A., say the Bruins who are on Nesson, mm-hmm. like, would they be, a, would Nesson allow them to do this? Because because then they would say, well, people are just going to drop Nesson and pay this. I, I also to- don't think in this situation the Bruins would have to do it because they already have a well-oiled machine. Yeah, they have Nesson, and you could already uh, pay for Nesson. I don't know what the price is per year. That's already an option. And just to reiterate, it's, this is for streaming, going back to, to the Knights here. It's like for fans, you know, you can watch cable, satellite. Or a lot of people still use an antenna, believe it or not. This is for people who just want to stream everything. And you can watch, you know, Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire, for people in that territory. So basically, uh, for people who don't pay for cable, satellite, or use an antenna, this is the option for them, the All streaming right. option. Yeah. Do you know... For my flight home tomorrow, I can download a movie and then yeah. play it on the flight home. No, but what happens yeah. if like it go? Yeah. What happens if it leaves that service at the end of the month? Can you can you keep it forever? <laughs> no, only no, in, no. Then it goes. Is off. that only in Crazy. first class though? Wit? I didn't know I could do that in my coach. You flights. fucking guys. <laughs> Why don't you come? You have no class. I, I don't know about all that streaming. Like I go home when I go home, I stay at my brother's. He's got the ESPN Plus, and and Bingo. we've had we've had no problems with it. I love watching them the games that way, and. Um, can't get that over here. You got to buy a Swedish package over here. But why? I, last year, what do they get? One game a month, uh, one game a night, or something like that for the Swedish package? You get a game uh, a night on the fr- on like the free TV. But I pay an extra package so I can watch them in the morning. So I don't have okay. to be up till five in the morning yeah. every night. But last year, they had ESPN Plus had some SHL games on, and that leads me into a Pink Whitney. I'm gonna go with a play of the month pick from the SHL. It will be Shit. Saturday morning, 9 15 a.m. So we'll all be together. We'll be shaking off the big deal brew hangover. Go into Biz's game, 9 15 a.m. Timra three way, minus 122. They're the hottest team in the league right now. I just saw the boys at lunch. They might have they might have confirmed they're gonna win Saturday. So Ooh, Timra Saturday. Yeah. Insider yeah. trading. Mm. All right. I, I like what I love, Merle, is about ESPN Plus. You could get either feed. So, like, you know, if you if you, you say you got action on a game, you want to hear the announcers who are rooting for the same side as you are. You know, yeah. down here in the states, we don't always get those Canadian feeds. I love it. You know, something like BX or our, our pal doing hockey night in Canada. You could get that feed. Check him out. Plus the college hockey. You can also watch. And of course, ESPN is going to have uh, Bedad open tonight. So. Good stuff. I know there's you know people complained last year, but I don't know. I love it. I love the fact you can get all the feeds. And I don't. Know, I'm just psyched for the new season to start. So. Moving right along, uh, a couple guys have hung up the skates. Uh, local guy, goalie Corey Schneider, uh, 410 games over 13 seasons with Vancouver, New Jersey, and one game for the Isles all done. He was taken uh, 26th overall back in 2004. He went pro after three record-setting seasons at BC. Finished with uh, 171 wins, uh, two four three goals against, 918 save percentage, 26 shutouts. Wait, uh, you know Corey a little bit, don't you? You met him being a local guy? Yeah, great guy. And, and man, when he was... When he was a younger goalie at BC, and uh, and obviously the timing of his career, which he mentioned, was tough being behind a couple of legends. But he was so good and beloved by by his teammates. I mean, I wasn't at BC with them, obviously, but guys, you know, they said such great things about him. He was so dominant at that level. And then seriously had a great run in the NHL. It's funny, like I think his quote was, you can't choose your path and how it works out. You know, behind Marty, behind Roberto, it's just something that just worked out definitely not in his favor. But you still saw times that he was a true number one amazing goalie. And after, you know, where he was picked, it made sense. But an awesome guy, worked his bag off. Great run. Congrats to him. 
And I'll, I'll tell you, back in 04, uh, oh, so 2011, I was kind of glad Vancouver didn't go to him because, I mean, Luongo struggled here in Boston. And I was like, I don't want to see that kid out there, man. He was playing good. I mean, he only had nine playoff starts. He was two and six, but uh, two, three, five goals against nine, three, one playoff save percentage. Pretty good stuff. So uh, congrats on the retirement. Uh, also, longtime Montreal forward, Paul Byron. Uh, no relation to Tom Byron. He missed last season with a hip injury. Officially retired after 12 NHL seasons. Uh, played 559 regular season and playoff games with uh, the Habs, Flames, and Sabres. And he's going to stay with Montreal as a player development consultant. That any of you guys play with him, know him at all? Biz Merles? Uh, no, Paul great Byron, career, though. Water yeah, bug buzzed. out there. He scored some big goals. I think he had a, a, a couple big ones in playoffs when they were in the bubble and ended up beating the Leafs. Yeah. Yeah, back that nice little run to the cup they made. And uh, this one just came out a little while ago, a couple hours ago. Uh, Brandon Sutter retired after 13 NHL seasons, played 820 regular season playoff games with uh, wow. Carolina, Pittsburgh, and Vancouver. He missed last year. I knew he had some COVID-related things, but he was a P he was on a PTO uh, this this year, sorry. And uh, But all done, hung him up. So congrats to uh, Brandon, Paul, and Corey. Great careers and uh, enjoy retirement. So uh, we're going to move along here. Okay, gang, it's uh, it's been a rough stretch for the NHL and uh, hockey community since we last met. Uh, uh, former NHL uh, Nick Cordelis uh, died at just 29 years old in a motorcycle accident in Nashville. Uh, he was the first Orange County resident to be drafted by and to play for the Ducks. And just terribly sad news. And uh, we want to extend our deepest sympathies to Nick's family, uh, friends in the extended Ducks family as well. Uh, and uh, on Saturday, uh, Calgary Assistant General Manager Chris Snow uh, passed away at just 42 years old from ALS-related complications. Uh, Snowy had been diagnosed with ALS four years ago, uh, and he and his wife Kelsey and their family bravely made uh, their battle public uh, so they could raise awareness and, and funds for research. Uh, Kelsey had posted a medical update on Wednesday that Chris had gone into cardiac arrest, resulting in a brain injury from the lack of oxygen. Uh, then on Thursday, said, you know, he's not going to wake up and he would remain on life support while organ donation was arranged. Uh, she wrote, uh, in life, Chris offered his body to a clinical trial to help others. In death, he will do the same. We are so proud of him. Uh, a GoFundMe page has been set up. Well, we've shared it on our social media uh, to help out Kelsey and the two children. Uh, Brad Tree Living, his former boss, flew to Calgary uh, to be with the family when word broke. Uh, just uh, terribly sad stuff. Uh, Whit, uh, we're going to go to you first on this. For Just a, a tough story for everybody. Yeah, truly heartbreaking. And and what a special man to go through this this fight publicly and, and do it because he knew how much awareness he could raise. It's it's similar to Pete Freitas and what he did. And, and anyone out there, it doesn't matter if you have kids or not. You see pictures of him with his wife and his two young kids and how hard he fought and how positive he remained the entire time. You know, when he loses his speech and he loses his ability to communicate and he just always stayed as a true fighter, true co uh, uh, courage to the max, right? And, you know, him and his wife, they, they met when they were both sports writers at the Boston Globe and then he was hired by the Minnesota Wild. Pretty cool story, right? You look at how he became who he was and it, it definitely wasn't common to reach where he reached in the NHL and he ends up becoming an assistant GM and he gets diagnosed with the worst fucking goddamn disease in the world at, at an age that somebody should never be diagnosed with that. And you just feel so horrible for his kids. And then you feel so horrible for his wife. And then you're so impressed by what he did, how hard he fought, what his wife did, how hard she fought with him. And, and, and you just, you just pray for the family. There's nothing else you could do. You, you, you look at the hockey world and how, sympathetic and how, how outspokenly people were about their love for him and what he meant to them and imagine all these people who don't have the platform who are battling ALS and getting to see somebody get out there in the open and show people how horrible it is and, and raise money and awareness and and God just you pray someday there'll be a cure nobody nobody in the world deserves to to go out like that and the guy did it with class and honor and um I'll never forget him. I mean, I got to chat to him, chat with the chat with him just briefly, and I'm like, this guy, like, I I complain about daily bullshit. And this guy's out there doing this. It makes you feel so grateful for what you have in life, and it makes you feel bad for 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 not thinking about how bad you truly could have it. So I I I, I pray to God his his wife and kids find peace, and and at some point they're able to move on, but they never will, right? His, his memory will, will stay alive with them forever as it should. So Calgary Flames lose a great man. The hockey world loses a great man, and 
two kids, you know, lose an amazing father and, and Kelsey loses an amazing husband. So it's just, just, it's so sad. And as you're going into this episode where we had a lot of fun, you know, also at the same time, Tim Wakefield passed away. If people didn't know, longtime Boston Red Sox pitcher, pitched for the Pittsburgh Pirates. Um, and, and, and what an, another warrior. I mean, if you remember the, the actor um, who passed away, uh, the Chadwick Boseman, nobody knew he was sick at all. Right. And all of a sudden he passed away and he decided to keep his battle private, which you can you, you respect to the umpteenth degree. You don't want people talking to you about it all the time. And and I, 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 I cannot believe how much of a piece of shit scumbag this Kurt Schilling is. I'll tell you, like, this guy is something else. This guy, go fuck yourself, because I had the chance to, to, to know Tim Wakefield a little bit, and he was doing the same thing. Nobody had an idea. This guy's battling a brain tumor, and he's got a, 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 a death sentence, right? And he decided, I don't want to deal with all that. I don't want to deal with people talking to me and, and trying to say goodbye. He was going to go out on his own terms. And this motherfucker decides to go out and tell everyone. He started off saying, I don't think he'd want me to say this. If you start off a fucking sentence by saying, I don't think so-and-so would want me to say this, and then you say it, you're a dirtbag. But enough of him. It, it was a, it was you know revealed that he was going through this and boom all of a sudden like days later Tim Wakefield passed away I played golf with him uh, in the first round of a local golf tournament at Plymouth Country Club it was one of the best days I've ever had on the golf course my, Tim Wakefield is my dad's favorite Boston Red Sox ever my dad's a huge Red Sox fan and he loved them he loved how much of a team first guy he was he was left off the playoff roster one year I remember my dad just being so bullshit and and then he ended up given up one of the, the most painful home runs of all time um, to Aaron Boone. And what do they do? They come back, and he's a part of the World Series championship. He goes on to, to be an announcer with the team. An amazing career. The guy's throwing a knuckleball nobody could hit. They had a catcher that could catch his knuckleball, Doug Mirabelli. They ended up trading him, and they had to bring him back because the guy that they were having to, to catch for him couldn't catch the knuckler. This thing's just wheezing and whizzing. It was unbelievable to watch. You just couldn't imagine somebody was able to throw like that. And God damn, could this guy play golf? He was an absolute stick. I know he played in a long time in that American Century Celebrity Tournament. He was telling me about that. The day we got to play, he's telling me Red Sox stories. He's telling me stories of him growing up playing baseball, how he got into golf. And then he talked a lot about his two kids. He has a son and a daughter, how proud he was of them. And it was one of my favorite days. It was a real blast. He played lights out, too. He was a hell of a golfer. But an amazing career, a great guy, and... Um, and 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 rest in peace tim wakefield rest in pe pe peace chris snow it's just horrible news it's the worst part of, uh, about this show is having to talk about these guys but at least we get to talk about them and what they meant to so many other people so as we've said before when all this stuff comes out and you have to you have to talk about these tough things it's like appreciate every moment wake up and everyone has their bad days try to remind yourself how much worse it could get and just hug your loved ones. You never know when it's going to end. So I, I ap appreciate everyone listening to R.A. and myself kind of talk about this. But it's, um, well, it's, well a, said, it's a sad day. Well said, yeah. Uh, just to reiterate on the, on the Chris Snow subject with Kelsey as well, just like how brave to share and go through the entire experience. And like Kelsey, to, to, to document it all for other people who might be dealing with this and their families as well. Like... I couldn't imagine being that vulnerable and, and sharing the entire experience as it went along. And uh, it's uh, it's a it's a maybe, man. Hey, gonna... Biz, maybe hopefully it helped him. Right. Maybe hearing the feedback and how much people loved him. Maybe that helped him a little bit. Hopefully it did. No, absolutely. And uh, and it's just hearing all the comments about him just tells you how how much of a special man that he was and, and, and what he did uh and how he gave back to whether it was community, his family, whatever, wherever he worked, and uh, just a very tragic loss. And uh, and he'll be forever remembered in the hockey community. And and do what you can as well to help the family. Ra, you, did you have the GoFundMe up? Our social media has posted it, Biz. We've posted okay. it on our Instagram. We've posted it on our Twitter as well. But when this podcast comes out on Tuesday morning, we will repost the link as well so people can find it. Okay, thanks. And uh, also, I'm much of those up. Uh concert i think it was in hawaii and eddie vetta come out and dedicated a song to, to chris as well it was, uh, it was a pretty pretty nice moment and it, it kind of weird thing too i think snowy actually covered wakefield when he was with the globe before he got involved with the hockey front offices oh, kind of really? yeah kind of kind of 
I don't know, weird cosmic thing that they actually, yeah, he get covered in back in the day. But like you said, with condolences to uh, the Wakefield family, Snow family, and uh, Cordelia's family as well. Just a, a tough week. So I uh, hope everyone out there is doing okay. And uh, next time we talk to you folks, uh, we'll be from Buffalo for the Chicklets Cup. We're going to be heading out soon. Can't wait to yeah, see next everybody. Next podcast, we'll all, be, we'll all be together. We'll record after Chicklets Cup with the final preview of of the Atlantic Division. So can't I can't wait to see all you guys. All right. Take care, everybody. Be good to each other. Peace.